Chapter 11 On the Quest for Ultimate Freedom For the supported there is instability, for the unsupported there is no instability. When there is no instability, there is serenity. When there is serenity, there is no inclination. When there is no inclination, there is no coming and going. When there is no coming and going, there is no decease and uprising. When there is no decease and uprising, there is neither here nor beyond, nor in between the two. Just this is the end of suffering. Udana 8.4 Parinibbana I have covered the process of dependent origination, the engine of suffering, and contact, which is at its core. Let me delve further into the application of understanding that gave the Buddha insight into how to forever free oneself from this process. The vast majority of meditators, including many Buddhists, tend to assume that the Buddha practiced some concentration practice to delve deeper and unravel awakening. However, mindfulness and full awareness by remaining in present are central to the Buddha's teachings. This should clarify that he found the process of awakening here and now, in the present moment. He discerned that there was something fundamentally flawed in the prevailing practice of delving deeper and deeper into layers of mind constructs, such as the experience of nothingness. I was invited to give a Dhamma talk to the Samatha Vipassana Trust in India on Sunday, September 3, 2023, led by Venerable Dhamma Gavesi and many practitioners of the Twem 6R method. It was a great opportunity for me to present in this context. With profound gratitude, I accepted the invitation to share my understanding of Majima Nikaya 26, Arya Pariyasana Sutta, or the Noble Search, one of the most profound suttas. I initially thought it would be brief, but it turned out to be 24 pages long when I printed it. Given that most of the audience was familiar with this practice and the teachings of the Buddha, I took the liberty to skip some sections and diverge a bit from the Dhamma. I incorporated elements from my personal experiences and insights to offer a blended perspective on understanding the teachings better. This sutta provides a revealing account of the Buddha's awakening. It is so profound that even the Buddha hesitated, questioning whether he should actually teach it. He realized the enormity of imparting such a teaching to people. Even in the Buddha's time, the idea that suffering could completely cease, Niroda, was unimaginable, a dimension where one can be entirely free from being dragged into pain, misery, and all the aspects of suffering. This state is called Arya, meaning beyond humans, something superhuman. Pariyasana means quest, a drive to seek an experience beyond human imagination. Perhaps even celestial beings like devas find it challenging to conceive that such states exist. Therefore, I saw this as a valuable opportunity to share my insights. Initially, I had reservations about whether I could articulate my explanation clearly or if there were any shortcomings in my presentation. However, it turned out to be a productive session, albeit a bit longer than some might have preferred, given how much I had to share. The reason I chose that sutta is because it has a special connection with me. In 2017, I went to Nepal to be with my mother in her final days. She was a great inspiration for my Dhamma practice, and I wanted to offer her words of consolation based on the practical aspects of the Buddha's teachings. While searching for a suitable sutta, I decided on this one to share with her, hoping it would uplift her mind. I don't know for sure, but I felt it was a fitting sutta for that occasion. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savath in Jeta's Grove, Anathapindika's Park. Then, when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed, and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Savatha for alms. Then a number of bhikkhus went to the Venerable Ananda and said to him, Friend Ananda, it is long since we heard a talk on the Dhamma from the Blessed One's own lips. It would be good if we could get to hear such a talk, friend Ananda. Then let the Venerable Ones go to the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage. Perhaps you will get to hear a talk on the Dhamma from the Blessed One's own lips. Yes, friend, they replied. Then, when the Blessed One had wandered for alms in Savath and had returned from his alms round, after his meal he addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, let us go to the Eastern Park, to the palace of Megara's mother, for the day's abiding. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied. Then the Blessed One went with the Venerable Ananda to the Eastern Park, the palace of Megara's mother, for the day's abiding. 
Then, when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and addressed the venerable Ananda. Ananda, let us go to the eastern bathing place to bathe. Yes, venerable sir, the venerable Ananda replied. Then the Blessed One went with the venerable Ananda to the eastern bathing place to bathe. When he was finished, he came up out of the water and stood in one robe drying his limbs. Then the venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage is nearby. That hermitage is agreeable and delightful. Venerable Sir, it would be good if the Blessed One went there out of compassion. The Blessed One consented in silence. So Ananda was trying to facilitate a productive Dhamma session, hoping that it would benefit many. This shows that the Buddha didn't always go out to teach, and sometimes people missed his live sermons in person. Perhaps the Buddha was observing the world. He used to spend quite some time in seclusion, reflecting on his own experiences and exploring what help beings might need. If it's all right, I might skip some points. Then the Buddha went to Ramaka's hermitage, and one thing that the Buddha profoundly respected was the reverence for the Dhamma, which was the one thing he held in highest regard throughout the universe. Even when the Buddha, the originator and expounder of the Dhamma, was present, he didn't interrupt people when they were discussing the Dhamma. Instead, he gave them the opportunity to explore the Dhamma for themselves and didn't intervene. He patiently waited for the entire hour or two, whatever time was needed, for that discussion to finish, even with his aching back, because the Dhamma is so important and profound. The Buddha had immense respect for the Dhamma. Then, when the discussion was finished, the Buddha entered, after knocking the door, and asked them, Bhikkhus, for what discussion are you sitting together here now? And what was your discussion that was interrupted? Venerable Sir, our discussion on the Dhamma that was interrupted was about the Blessed One Himself. Then the Blessed One arrived. Good Bhikkhus, it is fitting for you clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness to sit together to discuss the Dhamma. When you gather together Bhikkhus, you should do either of two things. Hold discussion on the Dhamma or maintain noble silence. And so this is something that I believe applies not only to monastics, but also to us as householders. Whenever the topic of Dhamma is being discussed, we should ensure that we listen attentively and try to minimize interruptions. We can use that time to reflect on our own experiences. I have experimented extensively with the nature of Dhamma, and what I have found is that even if I know very little about Dhamma, simply speaking or hearing a few words, can suddenly deepen my understanding and reveal the profound meanings of Dharma itself. Objects like mountains have many dimensions. When we observe them from different angles, we perceive various images. Similarly, Dharma is multifaceted. Exploring Dharma from one perspective gives us good insights, and approaching it from another angle can provide a different perspective. These insights can click and unlock some very deep points. The Buddha has mentioned this in some suttas as well. The more we contemplate and discuss Dhamma, the more we become imbued with its essence. This point is quite significant, which is why I emphasized it. Then the Buddha discusses the two types of quests. It's not an ordinary search, is it? This is a quest. As human beings, we may have an ultimate quest to fulfill. The quest for enlightenment is not uncommon among humans. People with otherworldly aspirations may have goals like exploring and settling on other planets, discovering exoplanets, or building an interstellar civilization. These are all quests that humans pursue. The question is, how far are we willing to go? Are we content with the quest for our daily sustenance, even just a noonday meal? That might be the quest for those struggling with it. However, many are not satisfied with what they have. In the case of the Buddha, he was not content with all the achievements of the world. He was seeking something truly fundamental, something radically transformative. This is what the Buddha's quest is all about, finding the perpetual solution to the suffering of sentient beings. The Buddha explains that there are two types of quests, the noble quest and the ignoble quest. What is the noble quest? Here, someone who is subject to birth seeks what is also subject to birth. Someone who is subject to aging seeks what is also subject to aging. Someone who is subject to sickness seeks what is also subject to sickness. Someone who is subject to death seeks what is subject to death. Someone who is subject to sorrow seeks what is also subject to sorrow. Someone who is subject to defilement seeks what is subject to defilement. 
So basically, people are not moving beyond or outside the loop of these never-ending mini or micro quests that will never satisfy them permanently. It's like reaching for something that we can never truly grasp. We inevitably return to the starting point. Whatever we do, we end up back at square one. He saw the futility of worldly pursuits and the entanglements we create for ourselves in them. For example, we seek happiness through acquiring possessions or pursuing pleasures such as a satisfying meal. However, in the end, all these achievements lead to sorrow and lamentation because they do not transcend the realm of conditioned existence. They are overshadowed by an overarching dimension where all these quests ultimately fail. So no matter what we pursue in terms of material acquisitions or aspirations, we have not moved beyond mere accumulation and conceptualizations. We fail to address the root cause. We seek happiness in things that are also sources of suffering. The Buddha says, And what may be said to be subject to birth? Wife and children are subject to birth, men and women slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses and mares, gold and silver are subject to birth. These acquisitions are subject to birth, and one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them, and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to birth, seeks what it also subject to birth. So the key term here is acquisition. In Pali, this is called upadi, and it's a fundamental term directly linked to the noble quest. What constitutes an acquisition? There is a wide range. In its most basic form, it could be acquiring property, people, a family, or physical beauty. We might enhance our body's appearance or achieve mental calmness, enjoying these states for a while. All of these are acquisitions. Some acquisitions are obvious and material, while others are more subtle. However, they are all impermanent and subject to destruction. The Buddha cautioned that there is a danger in holding on to acquisitions that seem enduring, as we can become ensnared by them. It is wiser to relinquish all acquisitions. For instance, some of his teachers like Alara Kalama had attained states such as the base of nothingness, or neither perception nor non-perception, which they held on to as acquisitions. These were some of the subtlest acquisitions they could not release. Letting go was considered impossible at that time. This is why the term upadi holds fundamental importance in the suttas. It is not merely an academic concept, it is meant for direct experience. Through practice, we directly see how various experiences clutter our minds. They all constitute forms of acquisitions. Being free from them creates space, freedom, and the bliss of renunciation. Beyond material possessions, the mind accumulates influences through the stages of jhanas and arupas. These are progressively refined acquisitions that we need to utilize and then transcend. This is the essence of the Noble Eightfold Path. Not to discard them outright, but to skillfully utilize them without becoming identified or attached to them. Be independent, be free from them, and use them as tools for liberation. This is the path that Buddha elucidated. Then, the goal is understanding how one can be liberated from the dangers of birth, aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement. I'll skip some parts of the sutta that delve into these aspects. As mentioned earlier, I'll briefly touch upon some notes I've prepared. The Buddha advises abandoning all acquisitions, but a simple question arises. After letting go of these acquisitions that lead to suffering and lamentation, what comes next? What ensures our liberation from suffering? Naturally, questions like these arose, prompting the Buddha to provide answers. So the practice of the Dhamma is not only about identifying the problem, it's also about showing the way to reach the solution. This is encapsulated in the template of the Four Noble Truths. What is suffering? What is its cause? What does the end of suffering look like? It gives a framework and then directs. Okay, here's the path to follow, a new approach to get there. This framework addresses questions from skeptics, as anyone naturally can ask such questions. We may all recognize the problem, but then what? Next, the Buddha proceeds to present the solution. Yes, the Buddha then explains, and what is the noble search? Here, someone being himself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeks the unborn supreme security from bondage, nibbana. Being himself subject to aging, having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, he seeks the unaging supreme security from bondage, nibbana. Being himself subject to sickness, 
Having understood the danger in what is subject to sickness, he seeks the unailing supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, being himself subject to death. Having understood the danger in what is subject to death, he seeks the deathless supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, being himself subject to sorrow. Having understood the danger in what is subject to sorrow, he seeks the sorrowless supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, being himself subject to defilement. Having understood the danger in what is subject to defilement, he seeks the undefiled supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. This is the noble search. Just one term, Nibbana, an experience encompassing many qualities. It is unaging, unailing, free from death, free from defilement, and free from sorrow and lamentation, all the experiences we naturally seek to transcend. That's what Nibbana represents. What people may not realize is that our existence, our experiences, are inherently limited. We live our lives believing we are free in terms of our will and choices, thinking we can do anything. But such assumptions might be presumptuous. It would be unwise to assume complete freedom because we are bound by the constituents of our experience, the five aggregates. These aggregates encompass our experiences and are naturally prone to defilement. In reality, we have no control over these aggregates. So if we cannot find assurance from these five aggregates, how can we claim to be truly free? This is the Buddha's message. Whatever we are, we inherit these conditions, and they do not obey us. We cannot stop aging, halt the body's decay, or control thoughts and feelings according to our will. These experiences bind us inherently because we lack control over them, unable to make them occur as we wish. Thus, what the Buddha teaches is that while we live our lives, we are not truly free from these experiences. We lack the freedom to be liberated from them. They lead us in various directions, but we cannot exert our will toward any of these outcomes. The Buddha introduces the existence of a dimension, an experience, where we can be liberated from these constraints, where we can find happiness without being subject to their influence. Experiencing this state is what Nibbana signifies, although it has not yet been fully explained. I will attempt to elaborate on this further. Next, I will explore some of the experiences the Buddha underwent in his early days after renouncing household life, when he attained profound insights from the most esteemed teachers of his time. Then he says, Bhikkhus, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I too, being myself subject to birth, sought what was also subject to birth. Being myself subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, I sought what was also subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement. Then I considered thus, why, being myself subject to birth, do I seek what is also subject to birth? Why, being myself subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, do I seek what is also subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement? So this is the fundamental question he asked. People often do not go beyond this realm of bondage. Whatever they seek ultimately leads to that bondage. So he sought what is beyond that. Then he says, suppose that being myself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, I seek the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Suppose that being myself subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement, Having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement, I seek the unaging, unailing, deathless, sorrowless and undefiled supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. So what is Nibbana? It might sound like something we can never have enough of, all those happily ever after things. People often believe that acquiring things will bring them happiness, but that encompasses all the experiences in the world, doesn't it? Therefore, Nibbana is something we need to go beyond the universe without needing to escape from wherever we are. But we must let go of all those constructs of the mind. What is that experience where there is no form, and there are no other worldly experiences either? We let go of any concept of them. So, what we are left with is nothing to depend on or take refuge in. Some people fear this emptiness. Others might be apprehensive, thinking, do we really want to lose all experiences? Maybe I can let go of houses or friends, but there's something I must keep. However, the Buddha advises, don't hold on to anything. Let everything go. 
That is the essence, the dimension of there being nothing, its complete emptiness. This concept may seem unfamiliar, but experiencing it firsthand is crucial because reading the suttas without practical experience can be confusing. Not needing to rely on anything, that's the state. If I hadn't had practical experiences of what the Buddha was teaching, it might have been quite confusing, and I might have struggled to digest his teachings. Hence, we need assurance that letting go of even joy, the supreme happiness of jhanas, the refined happiness of infinite space, infinite consciousness and so on, even though they are blissful, is essential. But why let them go? What puzzles people is what remains after abandoning all that. That state is called the unconditioned, where beyond all these states lies an experience of voidness, emptiness, a state devoid of contact with all mental objects. We are temporarily freed from all experiences in a state of disassociation called cessation of perception, sensations, feelings, all experiences cease. If we can remain in that state a bit longer, become familiar with it, we may find the greatest relief ever in that brief gap when awareness itself also disappears. I cannot predict how long that state will last, but one might feel a deep, profound sleep or the deepest sleep ever experienced a pristine happiness free from all fear and anxiety, surpassing even the bliss of Janus or Arupas. However, I must emphasize that I am only someone who has had brief glimpses of these experiences. Some experiences remain unconfirmed. I haven't fully completed the path. All I can say is that these moments felt incredibly peaceful and calm, where having no experience itself became a bliss. The Buddha teaches that diving directly into the dimension of Nibbana brings the highest bliss, supreme security from all bondages. From my limited experiences, it truly felt profound. The experiences of cessation are worth pursuing, even in a transient capacity. This is the noble quest the Buddha encourages us to follow. Be at ease, let go of all experiences we have encountered and utilized. Rest assured, there is an even greater happiness beyond. That's all I wish to convey. Experiencing the relief of losing all experiences brings a fearless, blissless experience, assuming we are also disenchanted with all forms of bliss. Whether this experience exists or not, it surpasses all jhanas in that it offers the greatest relief. That's all I can say. Sorry for veering off into these unconventional thoughts. I hope it's useful as a reference. I'll revisit the sutta again. Later, while still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth, in the prime of life, though my mother and father wished otherwise and wept with tearful faces, I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and went forth from the home life into homelessness. So this actually contradicts some of the stories in India and Nepal that the Buddha escaped home, left his young son and his wife in the middle of the night, not letting anybody know. This sutta says he told everybody, I am done with this life, I'm abandoning it. Look, my father and mother, everybody, I've had enough with this life here. But good stories like above are prevalent in Nepal and India, and such story-making do happen a lot. Having gone forth, bhikkhus, in search of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Alara Kalama and said to him, Friend Kalama, I want to lead the holy life in this dhamma and discipline. Alara Kalama replied, The Venerable One may stay here. This Dharma is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it, realizing for himself, through direct knowledge, his own teacher's doctrine. I soon quickly learned that Dhamma, as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teaching went, I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed, I know and see. And there were others who did likewise. So this is talking about traditional way of being trained in a teacher's teaching through all these sorts of rituals or what is called sanskara in Sanskrit, or we can call it in some traditions. But he was after a direct experience. I considered, it is not through mere faith alone that Alara Kalama declares, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I enter upon and abide in this Dhamma. Certainly, Alara Kalama abides knowing and seeing this Dhamma. Then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, in what way do you declare that by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge, you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma? In reply, he declared the base of nothingness. So this is fundamentally different. 
direct experience is completely distinct from reading just the suttas. Experiencing them is like comparing apples and oranges. If we have a meditative experience, we find it deeply satisfying. When we revisit the suttas afterward, they provide us with rich insights, allowing us to delve deeper. Now, the focus is on direct experience. One can grow weary of all these kinds of studies and mere recitations. The desire is to understand the core, to know that experience. Thus, the emphasis is on experiencing it firsthand. I considered, not only Alara Kalama has faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. Suppose I endeavor to realize the Dhamma that Alara Kalama declares he enters upon and abides in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. So faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom, these are the fundamental qualities essential for succeeding in meditation and deepening one's experiences. I believe the element that are missing here are relinquishment and relaxation. Yes, these are key Dhamma principles that the Buddha has imparted to us, which were never tried before his time. It involves those additional elements of letting go and allowing things to be, cultivating fearlessness. It's about stilling the formations, relaxing, allowing things to arise and settle naturally, without interference or intervention in the process, letting them unfold on their own. Attention is crucial here. At the peak of perceptions, the last bit of attention is released. During our meditation practice, we observe many such phenomena, I would distinguish between Dhamma and Dhamma. Dhamma refers to the teachings, while Dhamma denotes a mind object or phenomenon. Thus, what the Buddha is emphasizing is to let those phenomena be, to refrain from interference and participation, to simply observe and step back. This was the element lacking in Alara Kalama's teaching. Alara Kalama remained attached to the base of nothingness, considering it an achievement, upadi, and dwelling in it, without realizing the need to step back, to let things be, and to look beyond. This aspect is highlighted by the Buddha later on. I'm unsure of the exact method Alara Kalama used to attain the base of nothingness, but somehow he managed to achieve it. Some teachers like Teach Nhat Han speculated that Janas were not teachings of the Buddha, dismissing even the base of nothingness as unhelpful on the path to Nibbana. There is an assumption by such teachers focusing solely on mindfulness aspects, that the Buddha also discarded jhanas. On the other hand, teachers like Bodhipaksa argue that the immaterial realms, such as the base of nothingness, can be entered without experiencing jhanas, suggesting that jhanas are a unique practice introduced by the Buddha. I believe Bodhipaksa is correct, as it is clearly stated in Anguttara Nikaya 1042 that the Buddha attained awakening through jhana. Later, Vedic teachings influenced texts like the Visuddhimagga, which presented one-pointed versions of jhanas through practices like kasina. It's possible that the Buddha experimented with some one-pointed methods to swiftly attain the base of nothingness, similar to those practiced by Alara Kalama. A scholarly text detailing how the Buddha adapted a conventional practice leading to the experience of the base of nothingness without rejecting it completely is detailed by Alexander Wynne in Win 2009. Let me read further. I soon quickly entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, is it in this way that you declare that you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge? That is the way, friend. It is in this way, friend, that I also enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. So he entered and abided there, yes, he stayed in that experience, that's it. That's where Alara Kalama stopped. He did not see what is beyond that, perhaps utterly absorbed. He believed that was the ultimate experience, saying, I have gone as far as I can, this is where I stop. Anything beyond, he thought, it might disrupt my perceptions, my beliefs at that time. Maybe he clung to some belief that there is an ultimate experience, something like unification with Brahman. Such beliefs might have prevented him from going further, but he halted and remained in nothingness, declaring, I will stay here permanently, that's it. 
So this is what Alara Kalama said. It is a gain for us, friend. It is a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. So the Dhamma that I declare I enter upon and abide in, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, is the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in, by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in, by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge, is the Dhamma that I declare I enter upon and abide in, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. So you know the Dhamma that I know, and I know the Dhamma that you know. As I am, so are you. As you are, so am I. Come, friend, let us now lead this community together. So that's it. The Buddha managed to replicate his experience very quickly, and then was offered to co-teach with him. Then the Buddha says, Thus Alara Kalama, my teacher, placed me, his pupil, on an equal footing with himself, and awarded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana, but only to reappearance in the base of nothingness. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, I left. So this is a very subtle point that many people miss. Disenchantment, dispassion, cessation experienced after seeing all jhanas. These are very specific experiences that many practitioners fail to understand. Even some of the Buddhist teachers think that Buddha did not teach jhana. I was reading some talks or books by Thich Nhat Han. He believes that pure mindfulness is what Buddha taught, and that all his jhanas and arupas were smuggled from other traditions and inserted into Buddha's teachings. However, there are fundamental misunderstandings that he couldn't abandon. The Buddha did teach jhanas and arupas, but not as end experiences themselves, rather as tools, as means to elevate our minds, to free ourselves from coarser mental acquisitions. By entering the realm of nothingness, we let go of the perception of form, of infinite space and infinite consciousness. This is a step towards freedom from acquisitions. The Buddha acknowledged this element, but what is missing is our tendency to become attached to these experiences and potentially get absorbed in them. The Buddha taught that there is something beyond these experiences, which is why his quest did not end at the base of nothingness. The next step in the Buddhist quest is, I'm not satisfied with being stuck at the base of nothingness. There is something beyond this experience, and that element is disenchantment. Disenchantment means losing interest, which manifests in our behavior as we progress on our path. We may lose interest in going out for drinks, engaging in idle chatter, or socializing. This change involves distancing ourselves and becoming more independent, detached from the usual sensual experiences that used to entice us. We begin to see patterns of repetition and ask ourselves, what's the point of indulging in this? We've had enough. This maturing experience leads to the arising of the next stage, dispassion, and ultimately to cessation. While other teachers were inclined towards accumulating, acquiring, gaining, the Buddha emphasized giving up, relinquishing. This leads to a lightness and freedom that result in peace and direct knowledge. Furthermore, the Buddha set a high standard. He said, I'm not seeking bliss. I'm not seeking tranquility. I'm not seeking these arupas, these supreme kinds of experiences because experiencing them still involves a condition. I. Experiencing these indicates that there is something beyond them. This is what the Buddha realized from his own intuition. Then the Buddha approached another teacher, Udaka Ramaputta, who was teaching the base of neither perception nor non-perception at that time. It's unclear whether Udaka Ramaputta had experienced this himself or was teaching based on his father's instructions. He kept the recipe and taught it to others. The Buddha followed the same pattern. I have followed rituals and traditions. I have recited all texts and performed all rituals. Now tell me the essence. How do I attain the base of neither perception nor non-perception? Like he did with Alara Kalama, the Buddha quickly mastered the recipe to attain this state. So then, the Buddha underwent a similar experience. He tested and realized that the base of neither perception nor non-perception was the most sublime experience anyone could undergo. However, he discerned that despite experiencing this state, there still remained subtle perceptions. Even though a significant amount of perception had been relinquished, these subtle perceptions were enough to give rise to the world. 
At that time, the sadhus, ascetics, were unable to let go of perception completely because they believed that doing so would amount to the annihilation of the self. They were in a dilemma. If they remained in full perception, they would endure feelings of sorrow, bodily pain, and mental anguish. Yet, if they dwelled in neither perception nor non-perception, they could let go of these pains most of the time, except for the lingering subtle perceptions they were unwilling to abandon completely. Thus, they declared that abiding in the base of neither perception nor non-perception was the most sublime happiness attainable, believing it to be the boundary of the universe. However, the Buddha saw that perception itself was something acquired, indicating that he was not free from acquisitions. He saw that even these subtle remnants of acquisition affected the total peace of mind. What the Buddha emphasized was that we can experience bases of equanimity where equanimity is predominant. Even within these states of equanimity, there is the potential for attachment to that equanimity. The highest equanimity one can experience is in the base of nothingness. In the base of neither perception nor non-perception, there still exists the perception of experiencing equanimity, albeit with less identification. The crucial element that these two teachers could not see was this sense of identification. They were very close to Nibbana, yet there was a barrier they could not transcend. They did not recognize that there was a small opening through which the mind needed to be perfectly still to catch a glimpse of the unconditioned. The experience that the Buddha had earlier indicated that there were still lingering perceptions troubling him like shadows, making him realize that these were still conditioned. Perceiving implies the presence of a self, as there is an experience and an experiencer. This realization spurred his quest to let go of anything, no matter how subtle or sublime. Dissatisfied with the lingering perceptions, he continued his search. Skipping over the six years of struggles, practicing under various austere beliefs, the Buddha endured extreme conditions, minimal food, and experimented with severe hardships and pain. He adhered to all prevailing beliefs of that time. Even today, traces of these practices persist in current practices, with the expectation that such hardships will lead to awakening. Buddha, still in search of what is wholesome and seeking the supreme sublime peace, journeyed through the Magadhan country in stages until he eventually arrived at Uruvela in Senanigama. There, he found an agreeable piece of land, a delightful grove with a clear flowing river, pleasant smooth banks, and a nearby village suitable for a recluse. He considered this place suitable for his striving as he was intent on pursuing ascetic practices. However, he eventually realized that subjecting his body to extreme asceticism was unhelpful. These practices led him towards extreme experiences of non-existence without any insight. The Buddha discarded such practices, realizing that aversion towards existence was also a form of passion and reaction. There are two types of people. A. Those who want to prolong the experience of existence, maintain it, and even grow it. And B. Those who want to completely obliterate it, to escape entirely. Both types of experiences manifest strong craving and are unhelpful. This is where the middle way comes into play. We need to strive in a balanced way, supported by a healthy body and mind. The Buddha discovered that the body and mind are interrelated, and a healthy body supports a healthy mind. Understanding this dependence of body and mind is crucial on the Buddha's path. With this understanding, he found a path that avoids both extremes. We can make use of things we ultimately want to abandon, but we should use them until we reach a specific point. Don't abandon them prematurely. Some people are very attached to maintaining the purity of the body and perform rituals to purify the mind. Many follow extreme forms of vegetarianism or veganism, believing such a lifestyle purifies the mind. However, purification of the mind comes from mindfulness and wholesome actions, not from specific types of food. We use essentials without clinging to superstitions. Once we make progress, we can abandon them altogether. The Buddha's middle path is a path of balance that avoids both luxury and asceticism. Now, moving on to the analogy I was trying to find. Consider a spacecraft on a space mission exploring other planets. It starts with a huge massive rocket carrying ample fuel. As it journeys through empty space, it progressively becomes lighter by shedding fuel tanks in different stages. This parallels the experience of Nibbana. Once we have used the fuel, it has served its purpose. 
it's best to let it go, allowing us to be lighter and progress on our path. Ultimately, the state of Nibbana is letting go of all acquisitions and utilities we have used, allowing them to be released. In the emptiness of space, there is no need to worry about falling off precipices or into chasms. There is no gravity pulling us anywhere. This absence of gravitational pull is akin to the sublime peace of Nibbana. That's why I draw this connection with space exploration. In empty space, without gravitational pull, there is no need for support from Earth or any surface. Things simply exist. Nibbana is akin to that state. Let me find another very good sutta, this one from the Udana, called Parinibbana IV. The Buddha recounts that he observed a monk deeply engaged in practice. The monk had let go of all things, allowing the Buddha to explore his mind to see if it was truly free from all dimensions. The Buddha observed that the monk had completely let go, transcending all experiences. In a deeply personal expression of joy, the Buddha said, For the supported there is instability, but for the unsupported there is no instability. So what do supported and unsupported mean? Supported refers to anything we depend on or lean towards. When we rely on an experience, it continues, creating instability because we constantly crave happiness or pleasure. However, for the unsupported, there is no instability. If our experience is not dependent on seeking happiness or pleasure, but arises naturally from abandonment, that is independent happiness. Thus, if we have let go of that dependency, if we have let go of everything, then there is no need for support. When there is no instability, there is serenity. When there is serenity, there is no inclination. Yes, letting go allows stabilization to occur, there is no we in that. But for the sake of language, it's okay to say we are experiencing it. As we let go of all those objects, we progressively become more stable, eventually reaching a state of complete equilibrium, a very refined state where no support is needed. Until then, a finer adjustment is necessary so that serenity involves letting go of even minor inclinations. When there is no inclination, there is no coming and going. Thus, once we have released even the slightest movement of the mind, mental phenomena or mind objects, our tendency towards those objects diminishes because we're not feeding them with attention, thereby ending their arising and passing away. As I mentioned, these Dhamma objects are dependent and thus fade away. When there is no coming and going, there is no arising. Therefore, those Dhamma objects will subside because we are not feeding our inclinations towards them. We are not attracted or repelled by them. We are simply maintaining stillness. Consequently, the arising and ceasing also cease. When there is no arising and ceasing, there is no here or there, nor anything in between. This marks the culmination of something, a very fundamental experience in the Dhamma. This is the state of Nibbana. It's not imaginary. This is the simplest definition of Nibbana. By not inclining our minds towards anything, we prevent the objects of meditation, anapana, from arising. They naturally subside. When they cease subsiding, the arising and ceasing also subside. As all wave-like oscillations and ripples fade away, conceptualization ceases. This is the state of Nibbana. One aspect of Nibbana, the state of Nibbana that is experienced, also called Nispapanka, is that all forward-going concepts, all wandering explorations, come to a halt. Nispapanka signifies that state of isolation from all the types of suffering, all the experiences to which we are bound, also what the Buddha described as whirlpools. Then, by remaining in a state of non-proliferation, of staying where we are without seeking externalities, we attain a steady state, we simply abide without taking any action. This brings about a complete cessation of the proliferation and the arising of all mental acquisitions. These are all contingent on our attitudes, our explorations. We even need to relinquish the inclination to explore. Now, returning to the Sutta. The Buddha recounts the days nearing his awakening when he found a tranquil place on the banks of the river Niranjara, near a pleasant village. Unlike before, he was not seeking distance from the villagers. Previously, he had withdrawn from society, practicing extreme asceticism. He gained insight into the need for balance in life, to maintain a healthy body and a healthy mind. This is crucially important. I always tell anyone I meet, practice while you still can. 
Yes, for practicing this Dharma, we need a healthy mind and a healthy body. So don't delay this practice until you're 80, when your grandchildren have settled down and have their own families. Start practicing as soon as possible. Don't wait until your body is no longer able to support you. The Buddha realized that a healthy body and mind are necessary to sustain this practice. This practice involves a middle path. We do not abandon all comforts and facilities. We still need them. So, that's the middle part. I recall Delson Armstrong saying, we use a thorn to remove a thorn causing pain in our body. Once that purpose is served, both can be discarded. I will now summarize the key points from the Sutta. So far, I have covered quite a number of points. What I also wanted to emphasize is how the Buddha's awakening can be distilled into two breakthroughs. In other words, the essential lesson of this Sutta ties the Buddha's awakening to two truths, the truth of specific conditionality and the state of relinquishing all acquisitions, and the truth of the cessation of all formations and the abandonment of craving, Nibbana. These are the two profoundly deep experiences that the Buddha entered into after emerging from the cessation of perception and feeling. Niroda, on this path beyond both perception and non-perception, lies the phase of disenchantment, when due to the repeated experience, including Arupas, we've had enough with that. That will naturally lead us to dispassion, and having that, developing sufficient dispassion, will naturally lead to cessation. Therefore, we don't need to anticipate cessation. It occurs naturally when we are sufficiently dispassionate. So even if a person is in the first or second jhana, it doesn't matter. I don't view cessation as a grand attainment or a supreme experience. I simply sit. When I sit and have a very deep sitting, I lose awareness. Later I realized that I had moments of blankness and then understand that was a cessation. Sometimes it might occur in the second jhana, maybe in the fourth, or in the base of infinite space. Thus I see that these sorts of things can occur whenever we are sufficiently dispassionate. These experiences need to be approached lightly. Otherwise, excitement will invade the mind. Once we understand their nature, we should frequently use these experiences to refine our practice, experiencing them and letting them naturally occur. We should develop a been there, done that attitude, and these experiences will manifest naturally. So it feels like whenever it happens, it happens. I don't know when it will happen, and I have experienced it many times. It might be in the first few minutes or after half an hour. It just happens. For some reason, when I started practicing, I went through all these jhanas and arupa stages, and gradually I became more and more dispassionate about them. Because it's all the same, isn't it? Once we have experienced something, we go there and experience it again. After some time, it's the same thing. We need to develop an attitude where we go there not to bliss out, but to see what's there. This is what leads to disenchantment, dispassion, and cessation. These steps are key. However, People often gloss over them too quickly. They don't really grasp what disenchantment, dispassion and cessation entail. They might say, okay, so Buddha discarded neither perception, but look, what did he do again? He's using neither perception again in Pali Suttas. Why is he going through nothingness again? People miss this point. What is disenchantment? What is dispassion? What is cessation? They generalize it, but these are very specific experiences. So that is actually quite a good recipe that I wanted to highlight here. One thing I can add is that when the Buddha was going through the process of nothingness and neither perception nor non-perception in the early days, there was still identification with the experiences. What the Buddha is pointing to is the relinquishment of this identification with those experiences. Vendor Damagavesi. Yeah, and because there's a difference in the impersonality of these things, that leads to dispassion, disenchantment, and cessation. So that's a very good point. Both states are similar, but this state has a different flavor because of the relinquishment. Speaker, yeah, that's exactly it. That's the key element. There was no dispassion, no relinquishment, and no stilling. I mean, I wouldn't say that stilling is unique to the Buddha's teachings, but the combination of relaxation, observation, and the relinquishment of identification is specific. There's a specific term called atamyata, or non-identification, and that is a key point. If we get identified with all these experiences, then the sankhara, the mental formations of being stuck in that state, can lead us to much higher realms where we are stuck with experiences in that realm.
If we don't know how to get in and out, we can get stuck. Do we want to get stuck in that realm? Probably not. We don't want to be stuck in those states, however blissful they may be. The Buddha was really after the most ultimate quest, letting go of everything, there's nothing beyond it. Then, Dhammagavesi. But the Buddha had to work diligently over many lifetimes to achieve this. It wasn't accomplished in just one lifetime. He dedicated himself across numerous lifetimes to reach this point. Now we benefit from having a ready-made formula. We don't need to reinvent it. We have it ready for us. That's the advantage of having the Buddha's teachings. I wanted to emphasize this point. Speaker. Yeah, the Buddha has provided us with guidance. We find ourselves in these conditioned states, and the Buddha has shown us the path to reach beyond them. This is the state of Nibbana, where all these states are still conditioned. We are conditioned by them, and we have this recipe to achieve perfect alignment or disentanglement. That's the state of Nibbana, where we don't identify with any of these aspects. They are simply experiences. Utilizing these experiences to achieve alignment is what I wanted to illustrate. I was searching for practical examples to explain that all these movements of mind we observe are conditioned. Only when we know how be aligned can we unlock complete convergence or alignment with reality. Practice unravels itself to complete alignment of experiences, and that's when we begin to understand reality. So in contrast to a normal Rubik's Cube example, the practice of mind needs just the opposite. Letting go of all efforts leads to complete alignment. Okay, I think that's clearer now. Then the Buddha discussed these two elements, specific conditionality or dependent origination and the state of Nibbana. One thing I explored in dependent origination is called dependent simultaneous arising. So all these phenomena are present before us. I see colors, I hear all these experiences, they arise simultaneously. These experiences are interconnected, they do not follow separate times or spatial domains. Earlier what I noted is termed specific conditionality. The Buddha states, this being, this comes to be. With the arising of this, this arises. With the cessation of this, this ceases. This not being, this does not come to be. With the cessation of this, diseases cease. In many translations, they use this and that, but actually it means this and this. Dependent origination transcends the concepts of space and time, here and there, now and then. It goes beyond them. This state arises when we release all notions of this and that, here and there, leading us to the unconditioned state. Awakening to dependent origination is the realization that even in a single moment, one awakens to a dimension where there is no space, no time, nothing. It's the state of emptiness. That is the unconditioned state. Nibbana. Yeah, and I think that covers most of the sutta. Questions may arise, how are we going to tread that path? The Buddha guides us to experience, observe, and let go of all these old mental acquisitions. We reflect on them, step back, and see them for what they are, conditioned. Then through reflection, observation, and letting go, we arrive at the unconditioned state. Yeah, I hope. I don't think I need to read the entire sutta. In the interest of time, I concluded here. This is the sharing of merits we do at the end when engaged in any Dhamma work together. May suffering ones be suffering free. And the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief. And may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share in this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Chapter 12. Story of my meditative journey. Straight ahead, your majesty, by the foothills of the Himalayas, is a country consummate. In energy and wealth, inhabited by Kosalans, Sola by clan, Sakyans by birth. From that lineage I have gone forth, but not in search of sensual pleasures, seeing the danger in sensual pleasures. And renunciation as rest. I go to strive. That's where my heart delights. Sutanipata 3.1 The Going Forth On the foothills of the Himalayas, in the sacred garden of Lumbini, is the birthplace of Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha. Born as a Shakya, I feel privileged to share the affinity and reverence for the Buddha that my family has upheld. 
I was temporarily ordained as a novice monk at the age of ten. This took place in a monastery in Lumbini, along with my nine cousins from our large family. The memories of those days always bring me inner joy and peace. One way I bring the feeling of loving kindness into my daily practice is by remembering those ten days I spent in the Lumbini garden, practicing the eight precepts, listening to Dharma sermons, and generally spending the days in peace, calm, and tranquility. The seeds of Buddha Dhamma were planted in me during those days. From then on, until 2013, I was a typical young man, too busy trying to figure out what to do and seeking the best out of my life and career. I went to study engineering, exploring radio waves and telecommunications in the university. From 1997 to 2008, I focused on developing my academic achievements and research skills, earning another postgraduate qualification and a PhD in radio technologies from the University of Sussex. My life took a major turn in 2013, allowing me some time and space to explore the Dhamma. After a few years of intense technology consulting work with organizations like Ofcom, Network Rail and Virgin Media, it seemed that nature was guiding me to switch to the space industry. I used to live in Worthing by the sea, but I had to drive around three hours every day for work at a Surrey-based company. I did this for almost two years. During that period, I had the perfect opportunity to listen to all the Pali suttas while driving. I listened to MP3 audios made by Venerable Dhamma Buddha Mahavero. I managed to listen to almost all the suttas from the four Nikayas, Digha Nikaya, Majjhima Nikaya, Samyutta Nikaya, and Anguttara Nikaya. This gave me a very good understanding of what the Buddha was teaching. I realized that most people, even in the Buddhist world, were missing the teachings that came directly from the Buddha's words. I knew then that most people only ever managed to hear a few distorted words here and there, but nothing close to what the Buddha had actually said in the Pali Suttas. One question that captivated my mind was, how do I directly experience the jhanas that the Buddha talks about on hundreds of occasions? My inner self was telling me I must find a way to realize the experiences of the successive stages of happiness in jhanas that lead to freedom of mind. But how? I searched the internet for teachers who could understand the teachings in the suttas and also teach how to experience the jhanas. I still had a very confused mindset about how the jhanas, mindfulness, hindrances, enlightenment factors, and final nibbana are interrelated. I knew very well that the Buddha was not teaching deep, one-pointed, concentration-based practices that suppress all hindrances. But there were very few teachers who could really explain how all the Buddha's teachings can be tested in a coherent meditation practice today. Eventually, I stumbled upon the materials of teachers like Arjan Brahm, Arjan Sujato, Chuladasa, Richard Shankman, Shaila Catherine, Sharon Salzberg, and Thanissaro Bhikkhu. I read their books and articles as much as I could to gather their understanding of the suttas and how much they followed them in their practices. Arjan Brahm has a very charismatic way of delivering Dhamma talks and captivating new students who find his stories very convincing and enticing to listen to. I listened to many of his playlists on YouTube from his one- and two-week-long meditation retreats. I read his book on jhanas and bliss too. His summary of meditation experiences of going through all four jhanas gives the impression that getting to experience jhanas is a momentous achievement. His accounts made jhanas sound so blissful that they were terribly addictive and as good as or better than having sex. While such attributes and characteristics of jhanas he experienced may be appealing to some, I felt that he was not experiencing jhanas exactly as the Buddha and his disciples did back in those days. Furthermore, his approach to entering jhanas by focusing on nimittas after observing that the breath has become sufficiently stabilized did not feel correct after having listened to so many suttas. Even though I had some reservations about his methods of meditation, I continued to listen to Ajahn Brahm's talks and read some of his books. There used to be a good collection of his talks from meditation retreats held between 2000 and 2010. I recall his vivid explanations of how matured jhanas can lead to the ability to remember early childhood and past lives. He explained how he remembered those days in exquisite detail, including the smells of his toys and cots. It sounded fantastic to be able to recall so many details from the deep within memory. He guides listeners on how the process of letting go 
leads to the gradual disappearance of self and perceptions. He describes the culmination of his practice as the experience of seeing the emperor who has no clothes. He vividly describes the experience of letting go while immersing deeper and deeper into jhanas. At some point, nothing else remains. Just the experience that there is nothing, everything disappears completely. The notion of I and self disappears, leading to a direct experience of emptiness. Ajahn Brahm is a very articulate and patient speaker, with many tricks and tips to keep listeners captivated. I appreciate his extraordinary flair in presenting Dhamma and his stories beautifully. However, in the back of my mind, I always thought, the Buddha said there would be teachers who are very polished and poetic, who can captivate people with their teachings, while the original teachings of the Buddha may fall into oblivion. Then, after having analyzed enough of Ajahn Brahm's teachings, around 2014, I searched for ways to experience jhanas as described in the Pali Suttas. I found a talk by Bhante Vimalaramsi called Jhanas Commentaries vs. Suttas. His talk made a lot of sense to me. He was echoing exactly what the Buddha warned his disciples about in the Pali Suttas, that in the future, the teachings might become so different from the original teachings of the Buddha that one would find only a trace of them, akin to a drum having so many pegs inserted over time. Bhante explained that about 1,000 years after the Buddha's passing, a Brahmin from India entered the Sangha. He was so proficient in Pali that he even thought he was better than his teacher. Eventually, his teacher sent him to Sri Lanka to collect all the commentaries on the Buddha's teachings and compile a text to make them easily available for wider readers. However, Buddha Gosa, coming from Vedic traditions, did not understand the meditation that the Buddha was teaching. He injected many Vedic practices into his book called Visuddhimagga. Bhante explained very well how Visuddhimagga is a real curse in the Buddha's legacy, leading millions of Buddhist students away from the true teachings of the Buddha and towards Vedic one-pointed type meditation practices. Bhante's talk, Jhanas, Commentaries vs. Suttas, was an eye-opener for me. It saved me from losing many years following incorrect practices and getting caught up in the tangles of wrong samadhi, which the Buddha warned about as a real possibility. From 2015 to 2016, I spent two good years listening to everything Bhante had to say and checking each word against the Pali Suttas. I realized that he reads only the Pali Suttas, about 100 suttas from the Majjhima Nikaya, to be precise. This was a big relief for me, but it also meant I extensively and very carefully listened to how he explained the deep meditative experiences of jhanas and arupas, which he validated from the sutta perspectives. I knew there were many other teachers who also taught how to experience jhanas, but none taught how to experience the cessation of perception and feeling, or nirodha. Bhante repeatedly emphasized in his talks how he experienced cessation and how to achieve it. Only after being fully convinced that he could teach students all the way to experience Niroda did I become committed to contacting him. Around the summer of 2016, I started sending emails back and forth asking about people's experiences of jhanas from attending Bhante's meditation retreats. I received many confirmations that his way of teaching the practice is almost immediately effective, as the Buddha says many times. I got a lot of feedback and support from those meditators in the email group. I practiced as I understood from the online sources from the Dharma Sukha website, figuring out what 6R is and how to apply the 6 steps in the practice. So I practiced 30 minutes each evening to test if the 6R technique worked or not. I felt that it was definitely different and had some effect, like clearing my mind of thoughts. However, I was relaxing by deeply inhaling and exhaling rather than relaxing my whole body and mind. Sister Kema warned me not to focus too much on the breath and instead allow my mind and body to settle like a ball dropping to the ground when let go. Eventually, a friend advised me to join an online retreat with Dhammasukha teachers before committing to a physical retreat with Bhante himself. Finally, I signed up for an online retreat with David Johnson in May 2017. It was a perfect opportunity for people like me who could not commit to 10 days off work without expecting tangible outcomes. If I did not experience any significant development of mind, I could simply forget about it. Not having to take time off work was a plus. So I gave it a go. There was nothing to lose. By committing to practice two to three hours a day while still going to work, 
and being at home with my family, I was not losing much from the world, even though I was retreating from it in a way. David gave me the direction and motivation to progress, which comes from diligent practice rather than the half-hearted practice I used to do at home on my own. Now I will go through the exact steps I took in those ten days to progress from being a confused meditator to an experienced one. I was told that after experiencing the fourth jhana, I was qualified to claim this title. In the next part of this chapter, I will detail my progress through the TWIM practices during the 10-day online retreat with David Johnson. After signing up for the retreat, I was provided with a small TWIM guidebook and instructed to follow the five precepts. A. Not to kill or harm living beings on purpose. B. Not to take what is not given. C. Not to tell lies or use harsh speech. D. To avoid wrong sexual activities. E. To abstain from intoxicating the mind. Additionally, it was customary for retreat participants to take an additional precept of being loving and kind to oneself and all living beings. Each day I was encouraged to listen to one or two Dhamma talks from the Majima Nikaya delivered by Bhante. In the next section, I have included a copy of the exact instructions I received, which the Dhamma Sukha Meditation Center sends to all beginners of their online retreats. Each practice session assumes a sitting of 30 minutes or more. Beginning Loving Kindness Instructions When you practice the mindfulness of loving kindness meditation, begin by radiating loving and kind feelings to yourself. Remember a time when you were happy. When that happy feeling arises, it is a warm, glowing feeling. Some of you may complain, we actually do hear this a lot, that we cannot recall any good memories. So then we ask, can you imagine holding a baby and looking into its eyes? Do you feel a loving feeling? When that baby smiles, do you? Another idea is to imagine holding a cute little puppy. When you look at the puppy, you naturally want to smile and play with him. The feeling you are creating is a warm, glowing and sincere feeling radiating from your eyes, your mind and your heart. Once you have established this feeling, use this feeling to wish yourself happiness. Just as I was happy then, may I be happy now. Continue with phrases like may I be peaceful, may I be happy, may I be calm. Do you know what it feels like to be peaceful and calm? Then put that feeling and yourself in the center of your heart and surround yourself with that happy feeling. When that feeling fade, bring up another phrase to remind you of the feeling. May I be tranquil. May I be content. May I be full of joy. Now give yourself a big heart hug. Really and sincerely, wish yourself to be happy. Love yourself and mean it. This feeling is your object of meditation. Each time the feeling fades, repeat the wish verbally a few times in your mind. Just repeat it enough times to bring up the feeling. Do not make it a mantra. Saying a phrase over and over will not bring up the feeling you want. The phrase just reminds us to bring the feeling up. When the feeling comes up, you drop the phrase. There are a number of other teachers who focus on just saying the phrases over and over, and that doesn't work. That will just turn it into a concentration practice on the phrase. Some people visualize easily, others do not. It is not important that you clearly see your object of meditation. Just know it is there. Keep the feeling of yourself in the center of your chest, wrapped in this happy and content feeling. And I do mean really feel good. Feel peaceful or calm or loving or gentle or kind or giving or joyful or clear or tranquil or accepting. Be okay sitting and feeling this. It's okay to feel good, so let yourself be there in the present, just feeling this contentment. You have nowhere to go. You are on a little vacation from life now. There is nothing to do other than to be happy and radiate that feeling to yourself. Can you do that? Don't try to be happy. Be happy. Be content. Be at peace right here, right now. You have my permission to be happy for at least the next 30 minutes. This is a feeling meditation, but don't over-observe the center of your chest trying to bring up a feeling of loving-kindness. Don't force a feeling where there isn't one. Don't put the cart before the horse. Smile and feel that smile all through your body. As you say the phrases, bring this feeling up and it will resonate in your heart area on its own. Sincerely wish yourself happiness. Believe it and know that you do wish happiness for yourself. Just be with this feeling, know it is there and smile with it. 
there may be some blocks that come up, such as saying to yourself, no, I don't deserve to be happy like this. This aversion to your own happiness is a distraction. Distractions will be covered shortly. I will explain the method to deal with them so that you can allow and train yourself to feel real loving kindness for a longer period of time. Later, when you begin feeling this feeling toward others, know that similar blocks may come up and that these are distractions too. There is no reason that others should not be happy as well. The goal is to first accept and allow yourself to be happy and peaceful. It's okay. Then, since you feel that happiness in your own mind, you will be happy to share that feeling with other beings. Smiling. This is a smiling meditation. The reason that you should smile is because it has been found that when the corners of your mouth go up, so does your mental state. When the corners of your mouth go down, so does your mental state. Put a little smile on your lips, but also put a smile in your eyes even though your eyes are closed. You'll notice there can be a lot of tension in the eyes. Put a smile in your mind and especially, put a smile in your heart. It can be a mechanical smile at first. Eventually, it will turn into a sincere, happy feeling. It should be a smile that conveys loving kindness. It's important to believe it. Smile with your lips, smile from your mind, and smile from your heart. If your mind wanders away 25 times in a sitting, and 25 times you recognize it, release it, relax, re-smile, and return to your meditation, then you've had a good meditation. It definitely might not be a quiet and calm meditation, but it is an active meditation, and that can still be a good meditation. Every time your mind wanders away and comes back, and you relax and smile, you are developing your ability to see a distraction and let it go. You are improving your mindfulness, your observation power. As you practice, you will get better at it, and your powers of observation will get stronger. Hindrances The Buddha talked about five hindrances to meditation. Hindrances are distractions that will pull you away from your object of meditation. Five troublemakers who will surely come calling. Every distraction is based on at least one of the five hindrances. Often, they come two or three at a time and gang up. The five hindrances are 1. Sensual desire. I like that, otherwise known as lustful or greedy mind. You will hang on to things that are pleasant and want more. This will cause attachment to pleasant states of mind that have arisen in the past and desire for pleasant states to arise in the future. 2. Anger, aversion, fear. I don't like that. You will want to push away states of mind that you don't like. Or you might experience fear or anger over unpleasant or painful feelings that have already arisen. You will try to push away and control anything causing you pain. You will even try to force your mind to experience things in a certain way that you think is right when you actually should just observe what is there. Now that is really overly controlling. 3. Sloth and torpor, dullness and sleepiness. These will cause lack of effort and determination because you've lost interest in your object of meditation. You will experience a mental fog. When you look at it closely, you actually see that it has tightness and tension in it. There is even craving in sleepiness. 4. Restlessness. With restlessness, you constantly want to move and change, to do something other than what you are doing, to be somewhere other than here. Restlessness can manifest as very tight, unpleasant feelings in the body and mind. 5. Doubt. You are not sure you are following the instructions correctly, or even if this is the right practice. It makes you feel unsure of yourself and may even manifest as a lack of confidence in the Buddha's teaching or your teacher or both. When the hindrances arise, your job is neither to like them nor to fight with them. Your job is to accept them, to invite them in, and to offer them tea. Don't feed them with your attention. Forcing and not liking them to be there just gives them the attention they crave and makes them stronger. That's what happens with one-pointed concentration meditation. You force the hindrances away by practicing intense concentration, but as soon as you stop meditating, they come back, sometimes even stronger. If you just let hindrances be turning your attention to something that is wholesome instead, gradually the energy inherent in them will fade away. They will disappear like a fire that runs out of fuel. That's how you overcome the hindrances for good. The fire just goes out. In Pali, Nibbana translates as ni or no, and bana or fire. No fire, no craving, no hindrance. The six R's. Now we are going to give you specific instructions 
on how to work with the hindrances in the way the Buddha taught. Imagine for a moment the young bodhisattva resting under the rose apple tree as a young boy. He was not serious or tense. He was having fun, watching his father's festival. Right then he attained to a pleasant abiding, jhana, as stated in the suttas. With a light mind, he was able to come to a very tranquil and aware state. Later, on the eve of his enlightenment, after he had tried every method of meditation and bodily exercise that was known in India at that time, he remembered this state, and he realized that this simple state, this tranquil, aware, and happy state, was the key to attaining awakening. But how to convey this? When he was teaching, the Buddha worked largely with uneducated farmers and merchants. He had to have a simple, effective practice that was easy and worked quickly. He had to have a method by which everyone could experience the path and benefits for them, selves easily and immediately. This is how he was able to affect so many people during his lifetime. Do you want to see clearly? It's easy. Lighten up, have fun exploring, relax and smile. Relaxing and smiling leads you to a happier, more interesting practice. That sounds like great advice, but how do you do it? When you have been carried away by a distraction and you lose your smile, just follow these steps. 1. Recognize that mind's attention has drifted away and that you are lost in thought. You have forgotten what you were doing. You are no longer on your object of meditation. 2. Release your attachment to the thought or sensation by letting the distraction be, by not giving it any more attention. Just stop feeding it. Just back away from it. 3. Relax any remaining tension or tightness caused by that distraction. 4. Re-smile. Put that smile back on your lips and in your heart. Feel again that happy feeling of loving kindness. 5. Return or redirect. Gently redirect mind's attention back to the object of meditation, that is, to metta. Continue with a gentle, collected mind to stay with your object of meditation. 6. Repeat this entire practice cycle. Repeat this practice whenever your attention is distracted away from your object of meditation. We call these the six R's. They are drawn directly from the Sutta text as part of right effort. The first four R's are the four right efforts, with the last two R's to remind you to return and repeat as needed. Notice that you never push anything away. You never try to control anything. Trying to control is using craving to eliminate craving. Please don't do the six R's for some slight noise in the background or a minor bodily feeling. As long as you are still with your feeling of loving kindness, just stay with that feeling and let it deepen. Ignore those slight distractions in the background. As a beginner, do the six R's only if your attention is completely gone from the object. In the explanation of the Eightfold Path in the suttas, one of the components is right effort. Right effort and the six R's are exactly the same things. What is right effort? 1. You notice that an unwholesome state has arisen. 2. You stop paying attention to that unwholesome feeling, letting it be there by itself, with no pushing away or holding on to it. 3. You bring up a wholesome feeling. 4. You stay with that wholesome feeling. The six R's just add the return and repeat to complete the cycle. You are practicing right effort by repeating the six R's cycle again and again. You see and experience for yourself what suffering is and how to relieve it. You notice what causes you to become tense and tight, and then how to reach its cessation by releasing and relaxing and bringing up a wholesome object. You discover how to exercise the direct path to the cessation of suffering. This happens each time you recognize and release an arising feeling. Relax and re-smile. Notice the relief. When you look at the benefits discussed in the Sutta about the Dhamma, there is a phrase that says the Dhamma is immediately effective. By practicing the six R's, you fulfill this statement. When you relax the tension or tightness caused by a distraction, you immediately experience the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering. In other words, you are purifying the mind by relaxing and letting go of suffering. You see this for yourself. Then you bring up a wholesome object by smiling and return mind's attention back to metta, which is a wholesome feeling. You do not have to practice for long periods, months or years, to feel relief. You can see it right after the relaxed step of the six hours. You notice the moment of a pure mind, free from craving. 
by repeating the six R's over and over, depriving the hindrances of attention, their fuel, eventually you will replace all of the unwholesome mental habits with wholesome ones. In this way, you bring up only wholesome states and will eventually achieve the cessation of suffering. To be successful in meditation, you need to develop your mindfulness skill and observation power. Also, keeping up your sense of fun and exploration is important. This helps to improve your mindfulness. The 6 R's training develops these necessary skills. Sometimes people say this practice is simpler than they thought and have actually complained to the teacher because they want this meditation to be more complicated. Chapter 13. Progress in Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation This chapter is largely based on my diary of key experiences, practicing TWIM during 2017-2018. The first stages of progress involved experiencing the four jhanas during a 10-day online retreat with David Johnson from the Dhammasukha Meditation Center in May 2017. I practiced during my spare time every day and reported the results to him. He assessed my progress, issues, and next steps via email replies. I took his advice and made adjustments the next day, and so on. After the online retreat was over, I continued on the path myself, using David's landmark book, The Path to Nibbana. Below I have extracted key excerpts from my daily reports to David from the retreat. Day 1. Getting ready and familiarizing with the TWIM 6R practice. As I was still getting used to the new routine, I experienced a lot of restlessness and had high expectations for what this practice would lead to. I was obsessed with what the experience of jhana would feel like. Since it was a Saturday, I had plenty of time to sit down and practice as per the given instructions. I believed I needed to be relentless in my pursuit of the clarity and happiness of jhana. I may have had some very brief experiences of jhana before, but I did not understand how they arose or ceased. The difference from my previous sitting practices was that I invested my time and effort to follow the practice 100% without worrying about what my family thought. I remembered to keep smiling all the time as a secret for fast progress. I did my best to stay light and smiling all day. Nothing interesting happened, I was not expecting any major breakthrough, but was also not very optimistic about experiencing all jhanas in the next ten days. I was simply giving it a shot. If I experienced jhana, great. If not, I did not lose anything. I was not asked to pay a fee in advance, so it was entirely up to me if I felt like giving a donation upon completion. The online retreat process was very simple. I did not need to attend any interviews or meetings with the teacher. I was free to choose when to sit in practice, managing work and family commitments. I was expected to sit for three, four hours per day during the ten days. So I sat for about one hour in the morning, half an hour in the afternoon, and two hours in the evening. I had to submit a report every day by visiting a website that had a form for each day, asking specific questions related to each practice session, any interesting experiences, challenges blocking progress, and questions for the teacher for any needed clarifications and concerns. In the next nine sections, I will detail my personal experiences of progress in experiencing all the jhanas, formless states, and cessation experiences. This covers my experiences from 2017 to 2018. I may have been an average student, so I managed to experience the four jhanas at the end of the retreat. I was told that some did not make it all the way, or experience all the four jhanas, so it turned out to be a lot more successful than I expected. First jhana. Sutta reference. Again, bhikkhus, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. He makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Just as a skilled bathman or a bathman's apprentice heaps bath powder in a metal basin and, sprinkling it gradually with water, kneads it till the moisture wets his ball of bath powder, soaks it and pervades it inside and out, yet the ball itself does not ooze. So too, a bhikkhu makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. As he abides thus diligent, 
That too is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. Majima Nikaya 119 Kayagata Sati Sutta Day 2 Sending Metta to Myself and a Spiritual Friend David, what was the title of the last talk you watched or listened to? Indu Majima Nikaya 20. The Removal of Distracting Thoughts I thoroughly enjoyed listening to the sutta this time. It was exactly what I needed for my practice. I didn't know that I could listen to this talk earlier in the day. I enjoy listening to Bhante's talks over and over again. So if it's okay, and if I find the time, I would like to listen to each talk twice or more. The talk covered many aspects of how we can become entangled with hindrances, which can be a major obstacle in maintaining meditation breaking down each distraction into its constituent parts and seeing them as individual processes with no personal attachment, seem to be the key insight I gained this time. For instance, anger can be broken down into heat, pain and dislike, which are simply feelings and reactions of the mind. These are impersonal processes conditioned by the arising situation. We don't have to respond with anger. Instead, we can apply the six R's and see it as not ours. Smiling seems to keep my mind uplifted and happy throughout the entire day. My family seems to have noticed that I was kind and gentle all day. I was able to keep wishing Meta to my spiritual friend most of the time, unlike before when I struggled to keep my attention on Meta while walking. However, I didn't feel the radiation of Meta as strongly as I did during formal sittings. I understand that this requires more practice. D. Remember practice is essential but don't push too hard to intensify the meta feeling. Allow it to naturally infuse things, avoid forcing it. The strength of the feeling isn't as important as your ability to recognize when your mind wanders and to apply the six R's to return to the feeling. I, around 6 p.m., while I was in my garden sending meta to my spiritual friend, my mind became calm so I decided to sit again. I felt very composed, with only a few minor and weaker distractions arising. I kept applying the six R's to all distractions. At around 35 minutes, suddenly I felt a strong, joyful feeling. I became a little confused and tried to relax into it while forgetting to let it be and continue with my spiritual friend. I noticed that the feeling quickly disappeared and I couldn't bring back the meta feeling for my spiritual friend. So I switched to sending meta to myself with the hope of returning to my friend later. The feelings did not arise as strongly as before, but I was feeling very comfortable and quiet for about 10 minutes. Then I stopped meditating as I lost my meditation object and could not bring it back naturally. D. Good for you. That joy came about as a result of your applying the six R's correctly. This is good progress. Don't apply the six R's to the joy. Just allow it to be. Nothing wrong with experiencing joy. Just make sure you don't start thinking about it and get lost in thought. Let it be there. It's okay to be happy. This is where you are headed. Now you can give up any internal verbalizing of the wish. There's no need to say the phrases now. Just make the wish and feel the meta. Drop the phrases, especially if they make your mind feel tight when you say them. They are only a reminder when the feeling fades. Now when it fades, just remember the feeling and bring it back. I, my mind keeps thinking about what it's like to be in jhana. This thought keeps coming back, and I applied the six R's. I have to admit that this thought is probably the strongest of all thoughts that keep me away from sending metta and makes me restless toward the end of my sittings. D, yes, you analyzed this correctly. It's a desire and will cause you much suffering, keeping you away from jhana as long as you want it. It's a bit like a cat chasing its tail. You can never attain it by actively chasing it. Just stop, and there it is. I, also quite often, after about 20 minutes or so, my mind starts to become dull, and the feeling of meta-radiation starts to fade a little. D, you might be trying too hard here. Smile again and relax. Don't push the six R's too hard. Only apply the six R's if you are no longer in the present moment. I, I sat at noon for about 50 minutes. I noticed that my mind was less distracted by thoughts and I felt calmer compared to the morning sitting. Around the 30-minute mark, I felt the need to cough, so I did without any aversion, all while maintaining metta for my spiritual friend. I relaxed, smiled and returned to the practice. It took about a minute to regain the state of mind I had before the cough. 
After a few minutes, my mind started to dull, and the sensation of meta-radiation faded slightly. At this point, I began to recall instances when my spiritual friend had been kind and helpful to me, which helped reignite the feeling of meta. Shortly after that, the feeling of meta became stronger, and the radiance of my mind intensified. How should I treat my image chart concept of what it's like to be in jhana? I've heard this term many times, and I'm quite curious about this state, which may be affecting my progress. D. Apply the six R's to it. Understand that it's merely a desire, and desires tend to cause suffering and pull you out of the present. This is entirely normal, especially in the early stages of practice. I, toward the end of my evening sitting, I became a bit confused about whether my six R's were effective or not. The room I use for meditation has bright light, and I was sitting directly under it. I kept getting caught up in wondering if my mind was alert enough to visualize my spiritual friend smiling, and if I could feel metta radiating strongly. Are bright lights conducive to meditation, or should I try a different setting? D. Well, darkness is not conducive for sure. Bright lighting isn't one way or another, it's up to you to judge. Don't try too hard to visualize your friend smiling. Just know they are. Visualization is a small part. What's most important is to stay with the feeling. Seeing the friend smiling is much less important. Just feel the metta towards them. Day 3. Sending metta to myself and a spiritual friend. D. What was the title of the last talk you watched or listened to? I. Majima Nikaya 111 Anupada Sutta. I listened to the talk twice today. I gained a lot of information from Bhante on the meditation method that the Buddha was actually teaching. I know that it is the eightfold path or mindfulness and full awareness while in jhanas. A meditation object can be the breath or the feeling of metta, but as long as a meditation contains all the folds, it becomes the Buddha's meditation. I have listened to Bhante's talks on the Anupada Sutta many times, and it provides a lot of perspective on what to expect as I progress in meditation. I've always had the thought that what the Buddha taught cannot be absorption jhanas, which can have adverse effects. D. Yes, they can. There is a new study out that shows many types of meditation that don't use the six Rs can actually make people crazy or cause them to lose their emotions. Not good. I. I smiled all day today, as far as I could remember, and it seems to have become more and more automatic. Unlike a few days ago, I rarely had any unwholesome thoughts that usually made me angry and discontent. I know that keeping the precepts is definitely helping in this, but smiling seems to make my mind very clear and uncluttered. Noonday sitting for about 40 minutes, I kept sending metta to myself and then to my spiritual friend. After about 20 minutes, my mind became calm and composed. Each step of relaxation was taking me deeper into meditation. I had some thoughts popping in, suggesting that I should expect some joy and deeper calm. I applied the six R's to these thoughts as they arose, and I stayed calm. About thirty minutes into my sitting, I became very calm and composed. When I tried to verbalize my wish for my spiritual friend, I noticed some slight headaches. So I stopped verbalizing the wishes and simply felt the wish for calm, peace, happiness, etc. for my spiritual friend. I experienced another episode of joy, which was subtler. I had quite a few goosebumps, and they kept arising throughout the sitting. I felt very light in my body and mind too. D. Great job. Very good. And yes, don't verbalize the wish now. Second jhana. Sutta reference. Again bhikkhus, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind, without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure, born of concentration. He makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of concentration just as though there were a lake whose waters welled up from below and it had no inflow from east, west, north or south and would not be replenished from time to time by showers of rain, then the cool fount of water welling up in the lake would make the cool water drench, steep, fill and pervade the lake, so that there would be no part of the whole lake unpervaded by cool water. So too, a bhikkhu makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, 
so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. As he abides thus diligent, that too is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. Majima Nikaya, 119, Kayagata Sati Sutta I, evening sitting, after listening to Majima Nikaya 111 twice, I started sitting at 7.15 p.m. I felt that experiencing strong joy did not take as long, but I reminded myself not to expect this to happen every time. Every sitting is different, and you never know what will happen, so don't expect or try to control anything. After about 15 minutes, I continually applied the six R's to any distractions that arose, although they were not strong. From time to time, I relaxed on purpose to see how much karma I could get and to ensure there was no subtle craving remaining in the background. I noticed stronger and stronger feelings of joy that lasted much longer this time, perhaps about 20 minutes. I felt as though my feet and hands were not part of my body, and I did not notice any sensory input from them. I found that I could send metta to my spiritual friend very easily and did not notice strong distractions that could knock me out of the intense feelings of joy. I tried verbalizing a wish and noticed a slight tightness around my head. D. Yes, that is what happens, so there's no need to verbalize. I, I felt some joy come up in my sitting. It's joy like I have never felt before, more than just a feeling of happiness. I think I still tend to try harder unknowingly and then get stuck. But I felt that I made good progress in meditation, so I will continue practicing and will report problems as they arise. D, oh my, you are doing so well already, there's no need to try harder, you are way ahead here. Further effort on your part will not work, so just go with the flow. Keep smiling too. I, the morning sitting. Within ten minutes from the start, I heard the background sound of my laptop and suddenly got completely caught up in thoughts about why it had to interfere with my meditation. I felt very strong irritation and could not stop thinking about it, despite relaxing a lot. I wasn't sending meta to myself anymore. I was focused on how to let go of this disturbance. Thoughts kept coming, like I should have turned off the laptop before I sat. After about ten minutes of applying the six R's, I regained some equanimity toward this sound, but I could not completely relax into it. This was probably the hardest experience of distraction that knocked me out of meditation. D. You learned a lesson. Even a simple sound can cause aversion, and you can't control it or make it go away. So don't try. Applying the six R's isn't about pushing away the sound. It's about allowing it to be there with equanimity. The sound is only a sound. Why are you angry with that sound? What about other sounds? Why not something else? It's because you are conditioned, and this conditioning is out of your control. There is actually no controller, and you can't control anything other than applying the six R's, which means allowing, releasing your attention to the sound, relaxing your aversion, and re-smiling, then going back to the object. Allow and accept everything. Don't push it away and try to go back. That is concentration suppression, not twim. This lesson was a good one. I, I have some good results, but they indicate a somewhat fuzzy experience compared to what I've read in Sutta texts. Do we expect that over time, a definite pattern will emerge regarding my experiences as I progress in meditation? After hearing the Anupada Sutta, I am getting a roadmap, but I want to allow my practice to unfold naturally rather than forcing my experience to match this sutta. D. Just keep going. You are doing very well, way ahead of where others are in this amount of time. I. What do you suggest my attitude should be toward meditation progress versus expectations? D. These are just thoughts, and you allow them to apply the six R's, which means allowing and accepting. Also, you can't have expectations because you don't know what to expect. Why? Because you've never been there before. Don't expect any sitting to be one way or another because it is likely to be completely different than anything you have experienced so far. Jhanas are not fixed things, they are learning steps, and as you learn them they change and even disappear, getting left behind. Third Jhana Sutta Reference Again, Bhikkhus With the fading away as well of rapture, a bhikkhu abides in equanimity, and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, 
He has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. He makes the pleasure divested of rapture drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pleasure divested of rapture, just as in a pond of blue or white or red lotuses, some lotuses that are born and grow in the water thrive immersed in the water without rising out of it, and cool water drenches, steeps, fills and pervades them to their tips and their roots so that there is no part of all those lotuses unpervaded by cool water. So too, a bhikkhu makes the pleasure divested of rapture. Drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pleasure divested of rapture. As he abides thus diligent, that too is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. Majima Nikaya, 119, Kayagatasati Sutta Day 4 I, I have listened to this talk. Majima Nikaya Ten Satipatthana Sutta Twice today, one of the most important suttas by the Buddha that shows what meditators should be doing with all experiences. Having the background of Majima Nikaya 111 yesterday fit nicely within the framework of Majima Nikaya 10 regarding the observation of feelings. As I mentioned yesterday, I kept applying the six Rs even to small distractions on purpose to see if I would get karma. Actually, Bhante said here that this is right and can lead to good progress. D. Yes, your observations are correct. The closer you can see the hindrance arising, the quicker it disappears. If you can see just a painful feeling arise, then the thoughts that follow won't arise at all, and you won't get lost. Afternoon sitting lasted about one hour and twenty minutes. I have developed a habit of smiling all the time and also keeping the feeling of metta for my spiritual friend in my heart as long as I can remember. I sat and gradually started going deeper. Thoughts kept coming about what I should be expecting while in jhanas. But I continually applied the six Rs. The frequency of thoughts became less and less. I felt more and more balanced in dealing with distractions. I did feel a shift in the feelings of metta radiating from the center of my chest upwards. I noticed them slightly above. At some points, I could not feel the wish in my chest. Instead, I felt my head was radiant, and I saw my mind's attention go up there. Usually, this is where I see my spiritual friend, but this time, my spiritual friend and the feeling of metta were coming together around my head. I relaxed to see if the feeling would go back, it seemed to stay up. What I also noticed is that when I saw distractions and applied the six Rs, I saw the feeling of metta going back to my chest. So there was some ping-pong of the feeling of metta between my head and heart. I was very comfortable in my sitting and did not see anything that could derail it. I could have easily continued sitting longer, but then I thought I should try longer sittings after having more similar experiences so I can be sure I am not imagining. Evening sitting, 50 minutes. I sat right after the walking meditation. Order changed this time and it worked nicely. I felt very energetic and my mind was very bright throughout the sitting. I got deep into meditation within a few minutes. It was becoming more and more solid, sitting with very few distractions to shake my mind. My mind was bright and very alert. In about ten minutes, I started radiating metta to my spiritual friend. I did not feel metta much around the chest area. I noticed the feeling was around the head. Very strange. How could that be? Feeling with the mind. I relaxed several times. Once or twice I felt a faint feeling of metta around my chest. But as I kept applying the six Rs, the feeling started to go to my head. I was feeling more and more balanced in mind, and its radiance became much stronger than in previous sittings. I did not lose the sense of my body parts completely, however. As I was sitting cross-legged this time, I felt some pain discomfort in my leg later. Although I was not that distracted by this physical feeling, I thought that even if I broke the sitting, the experience is reproducible. In typical engineering terms, and with me being an engineer too, I am looking forward to further instructions on what I should be doing next. D. Yes indeed, when the feeling of metta starts moving up into the head, you just allow that to happen. I am going to change your meditation now as you have advanced to a higher level of progress. The first exercise is quick and you can do this in one sitting. It's about breaking down the barriers. As soon as this is done, write me back and I will give you the next practice, which is, in fact, radiating from your head. But first, follow this link to the next process.
with Abra as the password, breaking down the barriers. I, so far, I have been working with distractions and how to get to deeper stages of mind. I may be doing the six R's more than necessary. Maybe I need to be more observant in seeing how the process works. Both are correct. Just apply the six R's with a little more mindfulness to uncover what happens before what we can see. Plenty happens, but we can't see it at first. This morning, I kept applying the six R's to any distractions that arose. From time to time, I was thinking about when some strong joy is going to arise. As soon as I noticed these thoughts, I kept relaxing and smiling. I had a much calmer, peaceful, comfortable feeling going on. So I'm still learning to be more patient. D. The joy in this meditation is much more subtle. Don't expect any cosmic explosions. That happens in other forms. But for many, the joy in this practice is pleasant, sometimes even extreme, but you have already experienced joy coming up. There is another form of joy to come, but again it is a contentment and strong happiness, so let go of this expectation now. I, reading the talk and your TWIM guidebook, there are mentions of specific types of experiences at different stages. Does everyone report all of them, or does it vary from one person to another? D. Everyone generally reports similar things, and that's how I know what jhana you are in. But there is variation, so sometimes it takes a little intuition to understand. I. At what stage of meditation do meditators develop the ability to investigate the arising and passing away of the links of dependent origination, e.g. ignorance, formations, nama rupa? D. That is coming for you. Let's see what happens. Notes. Abiding in this jhana is more pleasurable than first and second jhana in that experience is smoother and mind has more balance while the body feels pleasure. While during the online retreat, I had only a short and vague recollection of abiding in this state. More recently, I have developed skills to stay in different jhanas by means of determination and steering of mind accordingly. While previously I had no control over how long and if I could remain in the third jhana. I was experiencing this state for more than 30 baht of 45 minutes today, to observe it very closely during the sitting that lasted 70 minutes. I could see that my mind is fully aware of all the surroundings including noises, but my mind did not get pulled into any of those events. The mind has become more stable and solid like a rock, so these external disturbances like breeze do not have any influence over the mind. Body awareness is still very much present, although feelings of pain have largely gone away. Another very important thing that became clear in this state is that the mind is still vibrating a little with joy and happiness, which do not occur in higher states, e.g. fourth jhana and formless states. This is why the Buddha called the first, second and third jhanas still the perturbable states, and the fourth jhana and formless states as being the imperturbable. Fourth jhana. Sutta reference. Again bhikkhus, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. He sits pervading this body with a pure bright mind, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pure bright mind. Just as though a man were sitting covered from head down with a white cloth, so that there would be no part of his whole body not covered by the white cloth. So too, a bhikkhu sits pervading this body with a pure bright mind, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pure bright mind. As he abides thus diligent, ardent and resolute, his memories and intentions based on the household life are abandoned. With their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. That too is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. Majjhima Nikaya, 119, Kayagatasati Sutta. Day 5, Breaking Down the Barriers. I, afternoon sitting, I started by sending metta to myself for about 10 minutes as usual. The feeling of metta was somewhat rising, although I felt some slight sensations near the chest. Then I began wishing happiness, starting with three more spiritual friends. The feeling of metta was strong, radiating from the head, and I have to say it was quite intense and powerful most of the time. I applied the six R's when the feeling faded a little, and then the metta became stronger. After I saw my spiritual friends smiling and happy, I moved on to family, acquaintances, and finally to the people I was not that comfortable with. 
It took three or four times of going back and forth between each of them and returning to one of the acquaintances. Then I felt much at ease and saw the people in the last group smiling and happy. I don't really have any ill feelings or intentions toward them in general, and I do appreciate what they did for me at times. But our last interaction did not end well. I think this practice of breaking down barriers gave a very strong and intense radiation overall, but was not the very peaceful and calm type that I used to feel earlier. Listen to Majima Nikaya, 10 Satipatthana Sutta PT2, a very helpful talk that delves into the minutest details of how a meditator should regard each experience to understand the process of dependent origination. Evening sitting, one chant R 20 minutes. I started this practice today, and I felt it was a little different and somewhat difficult to master. In the first 40 minutes, I focused on settling in and on the six directions. So far, I was used to only focusing on the front direction, so radiating to other directions seemed a bit unbalanced, especially towards the back and down. It felt like the energy from the head was losing some intensity in those directions. D. That's okay. You're not used to it yet. Energy will always be changing. Just go with the flow. You're just beginning. No real comments from me other than to practice and see what develops. Use the six hours when your mind starts to tighten or move to something else. I, after that, I applied the six hours a few times to return to the initial feeling of metta radiating from the head without focusing on specific directions. Then I gradually released the feeling. Again, it wasn't evenly distributed to all directions, but it was starting to spread out. Since this practice is going to be longer, I felt the need to be more comfortable in my upcoming sittings. Towards the end, I had several thoughts on how to achieve greater comfort and eventually ended the sitting. D. The way to be more comfortable is to apply the six R's to thoughts of how to achieve comfort. Try six ring the controller who wants to control everything. Just direct the mind, smile and let it flow. If you feel the need to adjust or change something rather than just doing it, try six ring that desire to change things. See what happens. I, I felt I was managing distractions well in the afternoon, as before, and the six hours worked effectively until the practice of breaking down the barriers. During the directions practice, towards the end, I became distracted and ended my sitting due to some discomfort. It would be very helpful if you could share some of your experiences on how to become familiar with the directions practice and how others have managed to overcome the challenges of getting used to it and maintaining composure. D. That's a big question. And ultimately, you're the only one who can answer it, as everyone's experience is a bit different. This is your laboratory, and you're the lead scientist there. I can provide guidance, but I can't make it happen. It's up to you. You'll do fine. You're already ahead of others, so relax and take your time with it. Day 6. D. Any comments on the talk? Majima Nikaya. 38. The Greater Discourse on Destruction of Craving. I. It was a very detailed and profound talk about dependent origination, D.O. I think the talk was well planned to explore the links of D.O. I would have liked more explanations of each point of the Sutta texts. However, the whole purpose of this practice is to see through my own observations, so I am quite happy to have listened to the talk. I generally felt comfortable with the practice. I continued to sharpen my skills in observing the mind's attention and radiating metta in various directions. Morning sitting, 1 HR. I spent the entire hour radiating metta to six directions. I didn't realize that I was spending ten minutes on each direction, so I had to end the sitting to get on with my day. But I was becoming more at ease with the practice and working with hindrances. D. Great. I. I still feel that I may not be completely relaxed and haven't developed enough in my mind to let go of the physical painful feeling that arises after long sittings. I was able to prolong staying with this feeling by applying the six hours several times, but I need to develop a calmer attitude. Today, during my evening sitting, I was dealing with a dull mind. I used the awakening factors of joy, energy and stillness to settle my mind on my meditation object. It worked well, and I had a very balanced mind for much longer. D. Very good, balancing the enlightenment factors. I. I am a little confused at this stage about how much of my attention I should apply to staying with my meditation object 
and how much to investigating how subtle distractions arise and applying the six R's to them, e.g. contact, sense bases, nama rupa. D. This isn't about splitting your awareness. You should be on your object all the time until something arises. Stay alert for things to arise. You'll get this with time. Day 7. I. Majima Nikaya, 148. Chachaka Sutta, the six sets of six. In this sutta, the Buddha delves into complete length and entirety, exploring all possible details to show us that there is nothing left in our existence that we can declare to be a self. After listening through all the sets and analyses, it became very clear to me that any belief in personality and the special feelings I have about myself are mere illusions. This leads me to wonder if the database of all habitual tendencies we have accumulated over time is what makes us think of ourselves as unique personalities. Even in this sense, we rely on our memory to define ourselves. This is no different from a computer, albeit with an unreliable memory that deteriorates over time. D. Yes, could we just be robots? Ha ha, something to consider. When one realizes that this could be true, disenchantment starts to set in. I, I spent the entire hour radiating meta to six directions. I didn't notice that I was spending ten minutes on each direction, so I had to break the session to go about my day. But I was becoming more at ease with the practice and working with hindrances. No worries. Evening sitting, 1.5 hours. After listening to the Chachaka Sutta Majima Nikaya 148, my mind became very clear and rid of any dullness I had after the meal. I sat for about 30 minutes already radiating meta in six directions. I was doing okay and catching any distractions as they arose, applying the six R's. However, I noticed that my mind wasn't as bright and alert as it used to be when focusing on the spiritual friend. So I tested what happens if I make a big smile on my face. Immediately after this, I was completely out of the slump with a very bright and alert mind. I gained a strong balance of mind and stayed on my meditation object very easily, without distractions, for a long time. D. Great. Day 8. I. Majima Nikaya. 44. On the Noble Eightfold Path. In this talk, Bhante gives very clear explanations of how all eight folds of the path are practiced, with good examples. The Buddha never said that those who practice should use only part of them. For instance, I had heard somewhere that meditators need to practice only five of the eight folds because the other three are part of sila and meditators do not need them. Bhante is probably the only teacher who could explain that all eight folds of the path are integral to meditation and practice in daily life. Meditation is not just sitting, it is an all-the-time practice which has had a great impact on me. This talk gives all the information that we need on how to do that. D. Very good. I, I generally felt quite comfortable with the practice. I continued to sharpen my skills in observing the mind's attention and radiating metta in various directions. Morning sitting, 1 hour 10 minutes. I sat very comfortably and was alert to any distractions most of the time. My mind became more radiant as I continued to apply the 6 R's. There was a moment when I experienced a blissful state for a short time. I applied the 6 R's and continued. What I noticed this morning was that I felt meta-radiation going out very naturally when I radiated to each of the six directions one by one. However, when I attempted to radiate meta to all directions simultaneously, it did not feel like it was expanding as much. D. So at this stage, that's okay. Sometimes it goes way out, sometimes not at all. It is only my job to be like a candle radiating light and heat. If it goes out, fine. If not, that's okay because it will change as you progress. I. I was simply observing the mind's attention and letting go of distractions as they arose. I smiled and radiated metta, which mostly remained focused around myself most of the time. I still have not fully developed equanimity towards body pain that arises towards the end of longer sittings. D. You mean you are not fully enlightened yet? Ha ha. Sit as long as you can and use chairs when needed. I, in the initial minutes of my sittings, I had some thoughts, but I have developed a habit of letting go of them, using the six R's almost automatically. Now it is becoming a question of how quickly I can catch them. I am experimenting with how thoughts arise. Suddenly, some memories come in a flash and I notice they impact my mind, creating a contact. 
The mind then reacts to that memory with associated thoughts about that event. I am observing these phenomena quite frequently. D. Yes, that's right. When you become aware the moment the thought arises, that is contact. Then there is a feeling and images about that contact. Then you may not like it or really like it, which is craving. Then you think about it, which is clinging. Then you form opinions about it, which are habitual tendencies. Then you may do something about it, which is action. These are the links of dependent origination. I, I just wanted to know if what I am doing sounds right to you and how I can keep my practice going in the right direction. I am very grateful for your daily tips and comments. Would it be okay to ask some questions later? D. Yes, what you are doing is correct. I don't have much more to comment on because I think you are understanding this. And yes, you can ask questions later. Refer to the other comments above for guidance. Note, I was informed that the retreat is now over and I needed to wind down the schedule to prepare for my return to normal daily routines. I didn't want to let go of the new schedule that I was enjoying. So I thank David for making such a profound change in my life by guiding me to experience all the jhanas. However, I noticed that my family was feeling a bit impatient because I was not spending as much time with them. They were signaling that it's time to face the reality of managing daily work and family life together. I had to figure out the rest of the way on my own, the four arupas and cessation. I brought a book from David Johnson, The Path to Nibbana, Johnson 2022. This book was very helpful in assessing my progress while I continued practicing on my own. It is a complete guide for those who, like me, test and see everything for oneself, though at a slow pace. Base of Infinite Space Sutta Reference Again, Bhikkhus, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite space. And the states in the base of infinite space, the perception of the base of infinite space and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Majima Nikaya 111, Anupada Sutta. It was August 2017. I went to Vienna with my family for our summer holiday to explore this beautiful city known for Mozart and his symphonies. While at the hotel, I sat in my morning practice as usual. I found the feeling of metta, which is generally warm, suddenly changed to a cooler and calmer feeling after I had finished radiating metta in all six directions to the universe. I noticed my mind expanding continually for some time. This feeling stayed with me for quite a while, and my perception and feeling of compassion towards the universe grew significantly. I found this state to be quite soft, cool and peaceful in mind. It was as if my body was suspended in the empty space of the vast universe, with deep expanses all around me. I did not experience any fear. It was just calm and peaceful. The base of infinite space is the most peaceful and comfortable state among all the experiences I have had so far. The calmness, softness, and the mind filled with the open vast expanse of space, balanced all around, heightened my awareness, just being in that space of the mind. There were no disturbances of towns, villages, schools, shops, or offices, just space and mind. Wow! As with all the jhanas and arupas, the experience of the base of infinite space changes from the initial experience in subsequent sessions. In my case, it took only a few short sessions to progress my practice from the fourth jhana through the base of infinite space to the base of infinite consciousness. I can now describe the experience of this state in much greater detail since I can enter into it when I want while sitting, but it's one of those things that may be good for storytelling. However, there is little value in clinging to those experiences as definitive pointers. I will share more on this experience based on the Dhamma to understand its nature and how not to get stuck in any of these experiences. Base of Infinite Consciousness Again, Bhikkhus, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, 
Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite consciousness, and the states in the base of infinite consciousness, the perception of the base of infinite consciousness and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him, those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Majima Nikaya, 111, Anupada Sutta. It was back in October 2017. One evening while sitting, I began to notice that feelings of calmness changed to vibrations and energy. My senses started to perceive subtle flickering. I could hear sounds in finer detail, and they somehow caused disturbances in my mind. Visual senses were also flickering, and I could see the light from the bulb dimming and brightening as if it were being slowly switched off and on. The perception through most of my sense doors was somewhat fragmented. I continued to experience these phenomena throughout the rest of 2017. In early 2018, one day while sitting as usual, strong equanimity was present throughout. Within a few minutes of starting, I began radiating joy, which lasted for an hour and a half until I was forced to open the door upon hearing my doorbell ring. Thoughts, perceptions, and insights came and went, but my mind remained completely unmoved by these activities. It did not waver even when I engaged in thoughts and analyses about Dhamma teachings. I still noticed subtle flickering at the sense doors, but it was happening at a slower rate. Unlike previous sittings, I did not pay much attention to these phenomena, and my mind remained calm and composed throughout. By April 2018, I had been sitting almost twice daily for about two hours each session. I sensed all the subtle flickering happening at my eyes, tongue, body and mind, whether walking, sitting or sleeping. My sense perceptions had somewhat sharpened, and these conscious experiences were impacting my mind, causing subtle disturbances. I hoped these perceptions would subside soon to see what lay ahead, but it seemed they were not going away any time soon. It was becoming a bit bothersome to experience all these consciousnesses arising and passing. My mind anticipated progressing to the next stage, but something seemed to be blocking my progress. So I decided to contact the Dhammasukha mailing group for feedback and advice. Here was a reply from Sister Kema. In this situation, I am going to advise you to six are all phenomena that comes up. Look at it this way. You are on a path that is moving towards a signless state of cessation, and when moving in that direction, it is not a good idea to pay attention to any arising phenomena and just stay with quiet observation. I am not so clear where you are exactly. But if you are in nothingness, the advice is to imagine you are the first explore to enter into this land of nothingness. Your responsibility while there is to just observe what is the nature of nothingness. And this scenario has helped many of my students to get through this state and then fall over into the next state. So bubbles, that is the answer. Now if you are in infinite consciousness, and flickering is going on, that is another matter. If they are happening fast, you just six are them and keep going with quiet observation. When they slow down and barely come up during a sitting, that is when you then attempt to just notice what is in between them and notice how they are happening. Don't think of what you do as I have to make this or that do this or that. That leads to suffering. Instead of thinking about making the flickering stop, view it as the Buddha advised his monks to abandon the hindrance let it go, ignore it, and continue with the quiet observation. Okay, this advice was very helpful. I noticed that at these stages, the boundary between pure observation and paying attention to phenomena or engaging in curious investigation becomes narrower. The former is what was advised, and I absolutely agree it is the right approach. I was reading from the suttas that emphasize the need to maintain attention on the meditation object. In my case, focusing on joy, without being distracted by perceptions of other things, as in the Majima Nikaya, Wanda 21, Kula Sunata Sutta. Now I see that I may have been putting the cart before the horse. I was looking for signs of progress that are often described in talks, books, rather than simply practicing without any expectations that could lead to a specific outcome. It took me quite a while to realize this. Base of Nothingness. 
Again, Picus, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of nothingness. And the states in the base of nothingness, the perception of the base of nothingness, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Majima Nikaya, Wonder 11, Anupada Sutta, Time Flies, it is April 2018, and I am now exploring this base, which is far more sublime. Indeed, this base is where the mind is most stable and peaceful. I used to sit for around two hours in one session, and the effect of the experience kept me very peaceful and calm every day. The mind does not tend to seek company with others and stays inwardly at ease and content. In the morning, after breakfast, I sat. I had the day off to look after Anya, my daughter. During the sitting, the feeling of joy changed to serene peacefulness without any vibrations. I did not perceive joy pervading the entire cosmos. Instead, the feeling was much calmer. There were a few shifts between restless and slothful meditation, and I kept adjusting my focus on the meditation object, which was radiating the new feeling out. I observed phenomena such as body, feelings, thoughts, and consciousness popping in and out. In the evening, I sat for an hour. I quickly reached the earlier state. I had strong equanimity, and nothing could shake my mind. I did not perceive anything around me. Even the perception of the entire cosmos being pervaded with the feeling of joy was absent. It was just a balance of mind, shifting between dreamy and active states. Another morning sitting was filled with experiences of equanimity, shifting between dreamy and active states of mind. I was still testing whether the feeling had traces of joy as earlier or if they were totally different, as described by Bhante. I know for sure the feeling has changed from vibrant joyfulness towards calmer and balanced states. One evening I sat in the garden, feeling quite content with the stupa I made for my mother since her passing away in January this year. I felt calm and settled, so I decided to sit for some time before Prey, my wife, would call me for our evening Sunday dinner. I felt very comfortable in mind and body, observing all the sensations from the gentle wind and rain. My mind became radiant from time to time, as if the sun was shining, which I did not expect on such a cloudy and rainy day. April 16th. Today is Mother's Day in Nepal, but she passed away on January 2018. Unlike previous years, I no longer had her with us. So I sat with the thought that this sitting would be a wish for welfare and happiness for her wherever she is reborn. I entered a deep state of equanimity fairly quickly. My mind was intensely bright at the beginning, and some thoughts started arising. I used the six R's to release those and adjusted my energy to feel more relaxed. I observed even more peaceful states arising and remained very calm and tranquil. I directly saw these deep states of equanimity as if looking from a hilltop with full mindfulness and clear awareness. I had a thought, this is definitely a superhuman state as described in the suttas by the Buddha. My body was tranquil and my mind was bright and soft. Insights were arising and I was verifying the descriptions in the suttas one by one. I had to interrupt my sitting after one hour due to the need to get ready for Monday. One of the traps I keep falling into during meditation is starting to observe the feeling of breath instead of radiating the feeling of metta or brahma-vihara. This causes a slowdown, and I either end up in sloth and torpor or restlessness. This afternoon, I noticed the moment I was falling into this trap again, and then backed off to observe the feeling of brahma-vihara and the radiant mind after using the six R's. The meditation was very alert, light, and full of awareness. It is now May 2018. During these days, I continued my meditation as a normal practice, without any excitement or expectations. Each day is just another opportunity to practice, making me more at ease. Lately, I have noticed that I am becoming more at ease in entering states of strong equanimity. It feels as if I am holding on to a very stable platform and nothing can shake my mind. However, I still need to sharpen my mindfulness to catch exactly when my mind drifts or engages in thinking.
which I discover a little later. Today is May 6th, 2018. Yesterday, all our family members from the UK came to my place to join the inauguration and consecration of the stupa I built in my mother's memory. It was a wonderful sunny day, and Bhante Sumana led the chanting and blessing. This morning, around 8 a.m., I sat for meditation by radiating equanimity in six directions. My mind settled very easily, and by the time I was radiating in all directions, my mind was very calm, bright, and tranquil. I observed whatever arose in my mind. What I noticed was that my mind is bright most of the time, but gradually it becomes clouded or covered with shades, and then some images or memories from the past appear. If I am attentive and apply the six R's right away, my mind becomes fully radiant again. So I had the thought that these are arising mind consciousnesses. The moment I start to grasp the form of that consciousness and give it names, it leads to the arising of name and form, which is a concept that arises because I identified with that consciousness. Relaxing right then immediately led to a radiant mind devoid of any such phenomena. I had a wow moment, realizing this was a good insight. I did not continue long, as I thought I would sit again and observe if this insight is consistent or not. Today is May 7th, 2018. This morning, I sat for almost two hours. As usual, I started by radiating equanimity in six directions for 30 minutes. After that, I began radiating equanimity in all directions simultaneously. I noticed that while my mind was intensely bright, I could see thoughts coming one after another almost incessantly. I realized that maybe I was putting a bit too much energy into watching my object of meditation. So I backed off and started infusing a tranquil feeling while radiating equanimity. Immediately, I noticed a subsiding of these thoughts. On another occasion, when my mind was a little restless, I mentally recited the words of the Buddha from Majjhima Nikaya 106, the Anenja Sapaya Sutta. I am not anything belonging to anyone anywhere, nor is there anything for me with anyone anywhere. This brought me equanimity immediately, and I continued with my practice. Similarly, in previous stages, if I encountered any thoughts obsessing my mind, I used to mentally recite an extract from the Buddha's advice to Rahula. Majjhima Nikaya 62 Rahula, develop meditation that is like the earth for when you develop meditation, that is like the earth any arisen thought or feelings will not invade your mind and remain. Just like people throw clean things, dirty things, excrement, urine, blood and earth is not horrified or humiliated by that. So too, when you develop meditation, like to earth any arisen contact, will not invade your mind and remain. So with all five elements including space, I found space to be very helpful when I was experiencing the realm of infinite consciousness to release the mind from being overpowered by strong thoughts. Today, I am on a work trip to Germany. After taking a flight, I decided to meditate on the plane. My mind settled into a deep state of strong equanimity quickly. Many small thoughts kept coming and going, though I was not attending to any of them. Suddenly, I had an insight. It will be impossible to attain the total cessation of suffering just by experiencing deep concentration where the mind is totally absorbed without a direct understanding of phenomena arising in the mind. In this fully aware state of meditation, the mind is very alert to phenomena, but is not obsessed or invaded by any of them. It is like sitting on top of a hill with a panoramic view of everything below, yet with no reaction or excitement to anything seen, heard, sensed or cognized. It is quite remarkable to know that I have full awareness of myself meditating in this seat with all surroundings, and at the same time I perceive another dimension that is totally separate from these worldly activities, where peace and equanimity are very prevalent. I know I am in a deep state of strong equanimity, but at the same time, I have full awareness and can make the decision to stay in or come out of this state any time I want. This morning's sitting was one hour as usual. I was not particularly keen on doing anything, nor did I have any excitement about anything. I started meditation by radiating equanimity in all directions at the same time. However, I was experiencing all kinds of thoughts coming up and pulling my attention away from my meditation object. I tried various methods to regain the balance of my mind. It took a while. By the time I was settling into my meditation, it was already time to break it. I had discussions with my friends about some big plans, and my mind was still attached to those plans and actions, 
so calming the mind was still a challenge. What is actually meant by vipassana and why without a tranquil mind insight is impossible? Vipassana does not actually mean insights as it is widely thought. Rather, it means discriminatory observations of perversion or abnormal mental activities that arise in a still mind. With a mind equipped with the knowledge of Buddha Dhamma, these observations lead to insights and ultimately to Nibbana. As to why we can't see those subtle things in normal times when the mind is still humming, I recall the sutta called Sangharava Sutta in Samyutta Nikaya 4655. Here, the Buddha says it is impossible to see what's beneath the water if it is muddled by different perturbations, e.g., color, algae, boiling, wind, shade. He compared these to lust, sloth and torpor, hatred, restlessness and doubt, respectively. I had a direct insight into these statements. Indeed, it is impossible to see those subtle things with an uncalm mind. Why does even abiding in the base of equanimity not lead to awakening? My mind was exceptionally quiet and calm while I was meditating one day. I saw that I could be in this peaceful and tranquil state for millions or billions of years, experiencing bliss. But I did not see any progress towards the way out to complete liberation of the mind. It felt like I was just sitting stationary in the ocean of calm and equanimity, and that's all. I definitely saw what was missing, and escape was possible through observations of the mind and figuring out how the mind, as part of the dependent origination process, works. Difference between consciousness, vinana, and wisdom, pana. The difference between consciousness, vinana, and wisdom, pana. The deepest riddle of our existence, according to the Buddha, is understanding consciousness within the process of phenomena due to dependent origination, how we get trapped in the links of dependent origination that lead to suffering again and again. Literally, consciousness is called vinana or vijnana in Sanskrit. Vinana means knowledge that discriminates things like red, blue, warm, cold. This in itself is generally considered sufficient, and we rely on consciousness to define our worlds. The Buddha compared consciousness aggregates to a conjurer's or magician's tricks. Why he said that may be extremely hard for many people to accept. I was also baffled by this for a long time and unable to grasp this statement. Now I know why. Consciousness is a very narrow or only a small subset of knowledge that is attached to the senses. When we understand the Buddha's teachings of the Four Noble Truths and dependent origination, we come to realize that the six sense consciousnesses are like projections of narrow beams of light in the tunnel of darkness of ignorance. And attention is the beam. The teachings include consciousness at very early stages of dependent origination, where a person immediately gets trapped into making sense of sense awareness to produce name and form. It is like some children opening a box, always presuming there is a gift inside, without reflecting on whatever may actually be inside. This is also the case with magician activities. People are enticed or cheated to focus on a small area, excluding much greater activities hidden underneath by the magician. Panna or wisdom is consummate knowledge that enables us to see the complete picture of our realities and opens our mind to see the four noble truths and how consciousness sustains the dependent origination of suffering. It's June 2018 now. I sat one evening around nine. Lately I have noticed that I am more at ease in overcoming sloth and torpor as I practice adjusting my energy while radiating equanimity in all directions. I was having sporadic thoughts coming and going. I kept six Ring them. When a particular hindrance is hard to let go of, I mentally recited the Buddha's advice to Rahula with the similes of the five elements as in Majima Nikaya 62. I have found this to be really helpful at this stage and was able to overcome major restlessness very easily about 30 minutes from the start. After this, I entered a very deep state of calm and equanimity. I saw that my mind was extremely radiant, malleable and wieldy as described in the suttas. I was very comfortable and saw how my mind gradually settled into this still state. I can easily compare this to a scientific analogy. The state of mind is a superposition of many individual mind objects or components. Usually, our minds are obsessed by one or more of the five hindrances. During the sitting, the magnitudes of these hindrances were gradually decreasing, and the composite mind was becoming calmer and calmer, as if it were converging towards a point of cessation. 
In digital communications, there is a branch called adaptive filter theory, where the radio channel is learned through training signals embedded in transmitted data. Using these signals as references, adaptive filters adjust weights to gradually reduce channel estimation errors and approximate the true channel magnitudes. Over time, the filter achieves nearly perfect precision in estimating the channel and reaches a state of total convergence with the underlying channel. In this steady state, the filter weights become fixed and further adjustments cease completely. To achieve this state, the filter typically uses a small step size for weight adjustment. Choosing a very small step size can prolong the convergence process, while selecting a large step size can cause overshooting, leading to significant divergence from the underlying channel. This process bears resemblance to adjusting the energy awakening factor to guide us towards reaching cessation. It's June 2018. One morning I sat down for meditation after breakfast, which was a change from my usual routine of meditating before breakfast. Typically, I start my mornings with a strong coffee, so my mind was quite active at the beginning of this session. For the first 30 minutes, while radiating equanimity in all six directions, I observed my mind jumping from one thought to another. However, after that initial phase, I experienced a strong feeling of equanimity, radiating in all directions simultaneously. My mind became exceptionally alert and agile, and the sense of equanimity I felt resembled the states I used to achieve when reaching the fourth jhana about a year ago. It was almost unshakable. While in this state, I suddenly had an insight into my meditation practice and how it compared to absorption concentration practices. My mind drew a comparison to mobile wireless environments and the design of receivers that can decode information sent through such environments. The insight was that a traditional receiver, which operates effectively only in a static environment with minimal fluctuations, often referred to as a white noise environment, can decode information well under those conditions, but fails miserably in dynamic environments where fluctuations are present. This failure occurs because the receiver is trained to function under fixed conditions. However, a receiver that is aware of environmental fluctuations can decode information regardless of how much the conditions vary. This analogy perfectly reflected the meditation practice I was engaged in, a practice rooted in mindfulness and full awareness. The receiver can decode data even when receiving information from a single direction or path. However, the reliability of decoding information significantly improves when it can receive multiple copies of the same information from various paths and coherently combine them. The figure here illustrates how superimposing multiple waveforms can greatly reduce deep canyons like states and create a flatter surface for easier traversal. The seven awakening factors act like multiple branches of the receiver, where each contributes proportionally to increasing the reliability of information, decoding, and mitigating losses caused by environmental factors. A sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, specifically in the chapter on awakening factors, Samyutta Nikaya, 46.56 Abhaya Sutta, clearly demonstrates this principle. Here, the Buddha explains how each awakening factor contributes to understanding things as they truly are, beginning with mindfulness and culminating in equanimity. Prince Abhaya acknowledges the profound help provided by each awakening factor individually, let alone the synergy when all seven factors are developed. Furthermore, the meditation experience was precisely as described in the suttas. There was full awareness of the surroundings, while the mind remained exceptionally composed and alert, free from wandering thoughts, akin to an arrow poised to hit a target with precise accuracy. Base of neither perception nor non-perception. Again, Bhikkhus, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. 18. He emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he contemplated the states that had passed, ceased, and changed thus. So indeed, these states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood, there is an escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Majima Nikaya, 111 Anupada Sutta It's almost the end of June 2018. I am feeling more at ease with the state of meditation now. 
I am able to steady the mind and observe any distractions as they arise. It is much easier to allow the mind to calm down. When it settles, the mind is very radiant and alert. I have found the Buddha's advice to Rahula to treat any arising thoughts just as the five great elements do, to be extremely powerful in maintaining composure and deepening the mind's balance. As I frequently dwell in this state of deep meditation, which appears to be at the most subtle level between perception and non-perception, I gain more confidence and ease. My perception of the world fades away, and the senses seem to fade as well. Yet the radiant mind remains visible, a sublime state of tranquility and calm that goes deeper and deeper. I have had some sittings where I could see the mind gradually settling to a very still point with very little movement. It felt very peaceful and tranquil, calmer than when I was radiating equanimity in all directions, for sure. At times, my awareness drifted in and out of dreamy and alert states. Some dreamy states are caused by hindrances, so the moment I relaxed into them, I felt exceptional clarity in my mind. It became more radiant and alert. Another thing I noticed was that my senses were not as fully aware of surroundings as before. This included body feelings, perceptions, and all other aggregates. I could observe how the mind was occupied with new thoughts emerging seemingly from nowhere and how they arose. I felt like an observer of this play or game between mind and mind objects in slow motion. Sometimes thoughts arose like, what if I die while in that state? Well, I had enough awareness that I have nothing to lose and nothing is mine anyway. So I could see some fear arising, but it did not frighten me at all. What about the family? I was reminded again. That is not for me to worry about if this happens. But I was able to let these thoughts go very easily. My mind was in the most sublime state, for sure. In the past few days, I feel that I have a lot of balance in everyday life. There are no big reactions even to quite stressful situations. I am just aware of what needs to be done and carry on with my work. My mind is alert and equanimous all the time, and it feels like my forehead is beaming equanimity to anything in front of me. This morning, I sat for one hour and ten minutes. Nowadays, my mind settles very easily, and I can enter a state of lower perception very quickly. My mind is clear and alert, but the radiance varies from time to time within the same sitting. I have noticed several semi-aware states, comparable to dreamy states, but with a bright mind and enough awareness to relax any thoughts or mental activities. After each relaxation, my mind goes into a very tranquil state, and I feel a lot of bliss. My awareness of mind objects as they arise is very sharp. I also noticed that all the other consciousnesses are subsided to a bare minimum. Although I can notice when they arise, I can see their coming and going. My response to them all is, this is not me, this I am not, this is not myself. One afternoon after a walk, I sat for meditation. It was quite a pleasant experience, and I noticed my mind settling quite quickly. I continually relaxed the mind as any thoughts or reactions to sensations arose. Somewhere in the middle of the sitting, I lost awareness for a few minutes. I wasn't sure if I was aware or not, but after becoming aware of my meditation again, I felt very calm and composed. It was quite a nice experience, very peaceful and tranquil. It's July 2018. I sat one morning after a somewhat restless night with difficulty sleeping. Mind objects and consciousnesses were arising and passing continually throughout the sitting. I observed them without reaction, relaxing the mind each time attention drifted from its clear, bright state. One significant insight from this sitting was directly seeing that the body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations and mind that we perceive as the self were slowly dismantling and breaking apart. There was nothing solid, nothing permanent or stable that I could hold on to. On another morning, my mind was initially quite active. It settled quickly though. I noticed my mindfulness was very sharp. It seemed no mental object escaped my awareness. I saw them arising and passing away very clearly, like scenes in a slow motion movie. Eventually, awareness started to become checkered. I noticed some dreamlike states and alternations in awareness of the senses happening in turns. I felt calm and composed, hovering between dreamy and bright states, with the mind completely relaxed and at ease. I heard loud sirens outside, but my mind was unperturbed. I simply observed the waves arising and ceasing. I didn't go beyond hearing sounds as they actually were. No craving, 
no clinging. It was amazing. August 2018, during my sittings, I experienced loss of senses and dreamy states. I saw things that later seemed absurd, like emails stacking up to the sky like Jack and the beanstalk tree. My body and senses were fading and checkered. Sometimes thoughts arose as if I should have control over them, as if I had lost authority. I noticed a continuous vibration-like sensation which I continually relaxed into. At times, I observed the vibration slowing down a little. At one point, the vibrations faded and a bright, calm state arose. I stayed in that state for a moment, but it didn't last long. The body felt as if it consisted only of the head, feet and corners of the hips, totally disintegrated, yet I could perceive them as a body. It's September 2018. I sat one morning. After reading many suttas from the section on Anapanasati in the Samyutta Nikaya, I truly grasped what Anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing that the Buddha spoke about, was. It says this method is so effective that it can instantly dispel any ill will or unwholesome states, like rain washing away all dirt and dust. The key to this is to tranquilize on the in-breath and tranquilize on the out-breath. What does tranquilize mean? The Pali word is pasambayam meaning to tranquilize, relax, or let go of tension. As Bhante Punaji said, meditation is not doing something but letting go of doing and just letting things be. I was amazed at the relief in having a mind devoid of activities. Anything the mind picked up was completely clear to me. I effortlessly let any arising phenomena go, and there was only peace and calm. No suffering at all. I was amazed that I could interrupt the chain of dependent origination by simply relaxing into the arising phenomena. I could see the mind was very bright but slightly cluttered by arising mental objects, like thoughts that started as small patches and grew into images of something I was very attached to. The moment I let them go, there was nothing afterward, just a peaceful and tranquil state. The mind was detached from all consciousnesses, clear and bright. In this state I noticed vivid colors and shapes arising and ceasing, as well as some dreamlike states, but the mind remained very alert. I hardly felt my body, and sitting was effortless, easily continuing for a few hours. Had another interesting sitting that passed very quickly. I could feel that I still needed to catch up on sleep and wasn't feeling very fresh. Consequently, my mind wasn't as bright and alert. It didn't sink into sloth and torpor, but I noticed my mind drifting into dreamy states, although the peace and calm were still very pleasant. So getting enough sleep is crucial for a good meditation session. Too long with neither perception nor non-perception. But no cessation. At this stage, it's tempting to be eager for meditation to progress, feeling like we've come a long way with just a little left to do. As we practice 6R and guide the mind's attention, we closely observe voidness and experience complete peace. Longing for progress can extend this state and lead to restlessness. Also, this state can be confusing. The loss of perception and senses can often be due to sloth and torpor or tiredness. In a single sitting, we may experience dreamy states without mindfulness, as well as very bright and alert NPNNP states arising and passing away. Many other experiences come and go, with no control over anything, akin to watching a lamp flame flicker in the wind. For instance, it's like wanting to skydive but holding on to the airplane door and questioning why it hasn't happened. Let go of any notion of I falling away. The waiting must cease. If it happens, let it be, and continue sitting content with what has been achieved so far. Sometimes the mind becomes exceptionally quiet and still, as if everything is about to stop completely. Suddenly, the mind tricks us by instilling fear in the form of craving. If all perceptions and feelings stop, the mind itself may die. Only when the mind is ready to accept anything without desire can cessation occur. It's not planned. The mind will naturally reach this state. Developing disenchantment and dispassion towards anything that arises will be the next steps. November 2018 one thing I've learned over the last few months is that meditation sitting is best when I'm relaxed and have no expectations, particularly on days like Saturday or Sunday morning when I have plenty of time. If I sit with the thought that I have ample time and will have a great experience, my mind often doesn't go deep and struggles with distractions. No matter the method I use to let go of distractions, 
They keep coming back. I've spent entire sessions just trying to overcome them. I'm learning the hard way that having expectations and longing for a good meditation is a hindrance. Thinking longer sitting times are better than shorter ones is also greed. So regardless of whether it's 30 minutes or 5 hours, it's not important. Expecting 5-hour sessions to lead to good meditation doesn't work. My morning sittings usually last about an hour. I typically set a timer, which often becomes a distraction. However, one morning I was calm and relaxed, not trying to achieve anything. The mind wobbled a bit at the start, but for about 45 minutes it was very peaceful and tranquil. Any small disturbances arose and passed without causing any movement in the mind. I simply noted their arrival and departure. It was very pleasant and quiet. In the afternoon, I usually sit for around 30 minutes after a 20-minute walk. One afternoon, my mind felt very energetic. Strong equanimity pervaded the sitting, and it was a quiet period with no distractions pulling my mind in any direction. It felt solid as a rock, and nothing could shake it. Over the last several days, I've noticed my mind feels blank, without any thoughts or memories. My mind tricks me into thinking, what if I lose my mind and memories completely? However, it's simply that my mind is becoming quieter and isn't used to being so still, as it was previously preoccupied with criticizing others, planning and thinking about how to enjoy things. On cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness. Again, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the cessation of perception and feeling, and having seen with wisdom, his taints are utterly destroyed. To this extent, friend, the Blessed One has spoken of the achievement of an opening amid confinement in a non-provisional sense. Anguttara Nikaya, 1042, Confinement. 21. Nov. 2018, sat this afternoon for about 35 minutes as usual after lunch and a 20-minute walk. I felt a bit tired but quite relaxed and wanted to just sit and see what would happen. I found a good balance of mind and entered into an NPNNP state several times. At times, I could hear colleagues in the breakout area talking loudly, and then their voices would fade away, making my experience a bit fuzzy. Near the end of my sitting, I noticed that my mind went very deep somehow. For a short time, I didn't notice anything. Then my perception and feeling returned gradually, as if starting from zero and gradually returning to normal awareness. My mind saw much grosser vibrations coming and going. My entire body felt these vibrations, which were very pleasant and different from any previous feelings. This experience was by far the most vivid experience of seeing the arising of links, appearing like energetic and vibratory bubbles. I sat there in awe, thinking, what is this? It seems like a major step forward. I'll need to sit more to see if I can feel that again. I was totally unprepared and did not expect such an experience to occur at that time. I barely had more than 35 minutes to sit, and I never thought I would experience something like this, especially while at work during my one-hour break. I usually use this secluded spot in a large hall where everyone comes for lunch break. People used to think I just took a nap to recharge. Anya's birthday was yesterday, and we have been planning a trip to Bournemouth over the weekend as an additional gift for her and for the whole family to enjoy some quality time together. We left home around 9am, driving through the M25 motorway. While Prey tuned into her Spotify streams, I listened to songs playing over the car audio. I still experienced some joy and feelings of freedom from the worldly cycles. Then, I heard the famous song by Narayan Gopal called, Tonight What I Saw in My Dream, I Saw Myself Dying. While I used to feel a bit upset by the gloomy lyrics of the song before, I now heard the song from a different perspective. There is dying, but the dying has nothing to do with me. What is dying is a body. I do not see this body as me, myself, or anything. If it dies, what is there for me to lament? This body has already shown signs of giving up, so why should I consider it anything special? I thought about how the singer has a sad attachment to this body, seeing it as himself and dreading its demise. I viewed this in a different light. I realized that my mind and body are totally separate entities. There was nothing surreal about this sense of looking at things. I could only feel relief that there is no body to afflict the mind. My mind seemed totally relieved, knowing that this body will one day die, 
and I will not regret losing it. As one becomes familiar with being able to enter cessation, it becomes very clear why the Buddha praised this state so highly as the ultimate step towards the way out of all suffering. In other words, he categorically mentioned in Anguttara Nikaya 943.51 that when one emerges from cessation of perception and feeling, one is guaranteed to attain the destruction of taints at some point in life. However, ideas from teachers like Shaila Catherine are heavily influenced by the Visuddhimagga and other commentaries, missing the very important point of the Buddha's teachings. The cessation of perception and feeling is the culmination, the highest state in the Noble Eightfold Path. The experience of cessation is nothing to fear or apprehend, as many people, including famous meditation teachers, seem to think. This state is also preceded by the signless abiding in voidness that the Buddha himself often temporarily dwelt in during his old age for relief from bodily pain, where one is devoid of all distractions, a state of sublime peace and relief. Unlike the earlier jhanas and formless spheres, in this state there is no feeling, perception or consciousness. Most people think it must be a terrifying experience to lose feelings, perception and consciousness. However, experiencing this directly is entirely different. Here lies the utmost relief from all kinds of stress, pain and sorrow. I have now entered this state many times and can confidently say it is the most worthwhile and sublime experience among all jhanas or formless states. This state can never be reached by anyone practicing methods of suppressing hindrances through various forms of one-pointed concentration or bare insight practices. This is because one can enter cessation only when all craving and hindrances are completely let go, leaving no residue at all, like a spacecraft that has come to a complete halt due to the exhaustion of all fuel, a state of the complete end of all activities. The fuel is craving, which in its finest state can manifest as the finest bit of restlessness, excitement or fear. Only after completely letting go of these very fine states can one enter cessation. One enters this state unknowingly and emerges from it unknowingly. There is no control over it. However, when one has mastered the practice of determination to enter and emerge from cessation, as stated in the suttas, one can at least plan when to experience this state. This does not mean the process is spontaneous and requires no preparation. Rather, one must fully cultivate the seven factors conducive to awakening. These are mindfulness, investigation of experiences, energy, joy, tranquility, stillness, and equanimity. As one progressively calms the tensions arising from mental factors that touch the mind from time to time, one becomes very comfortable in body and mind. Mindfulness, alertness, joy, comfort, and calmness become more refined, and suddenly, all states dissolve. After some time has elapsed, one notices directly how the senses and perceptions gradually return to normal. Hearing returns, body sensations restore themselves as if one has awakened from a dreamless, deep night's sleep. Again, Bhikkhus, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the cessation of perception and feeling, and his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. He emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he recalled the states that had passed, ceased and changed, thus... So indeed these states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind ride of barriers. He understood, there is no escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is not. Majima Nikaya 111 Anupada Sutta Getting used to cessation January 2019. Over the past few days, I've really gained a good understanding of how to progress with right effort in letting go of craving. I was able to abide in comfort and calmness, effortlessly letting go of distractions. The method I adopted was simply to take distractions as they arose, letting them be and dropping them without exertion. No energy was wasted. I felt very light in both mind and body. This approach has perhaps been the easiest of all the efforts I've made in my meditation practices so far. From my experiences, I've learned that as one progresses to higher realms, the amount of effort needed diminishes. While in lower jhanas I did not feel any headache or discomfort with the same level of effort, 
I did experience this when trying harder during NPNNP. Among all the stages, I've spent the longest in the NPNNP state, so I've noticed its diversity in terms of experiences. These days, I feel that I don't stay in this state for very long and often drift from NPNNP to cessation. I usually recognize that when the mind becomes very still and collected, its brightness increases significantly. It sometimes feels like observing milk being heated in a pot. Milk generally takes a few minutes to heat up near boiling point. As we watch, it reaches a point where it starts boiling rapidly and evaporates quickly. Anyone wishing to retain the milk in its hot liquid form must exercise extreme caution to cook it fully. I've noticed the mind reaches a very similar state, and in this crucial moment to maintain composure, if one is not mindful and internally balanced, the mind can easily slip into restlessness or anxiety. I've seen this happen so many times that now I feel I'm getting better at handling such situations. The radiance of mind I've experienced has also grown as I've become more familiar with this practice. The brightness of mind resembles the illumination of the sky with thousands or millions of suns. 5 Feb 2019, we are driving from Kathmandu to Baglung to visit our birth home and other places. It took about 12 hours to get here after driving through Pokhara and rugged roads to Baglung, which were damaged by torrential rains. We stayed in our cottage home for the night. However, I was unable to sleep all night due to the new location. I continually noticed all sorts of thoughts invading my mind and felt restless. Around 4 a.m., I decided to freshen up and sit in meditation. I meditated for about an hour, experiencing NPNNP states back and forth. By the end of my sitting, my mind was free from restlessness, sleepiness, and tiredness. I didn't experience any such feelings throughout the day and felt fresh and alert. 11 Feb 19 I am in Nepal for two weeks to commemorate the first year anniversary of my mother's death. My meditation practice has become somewhat sporadic, and I haven't had many deep experiences. Yesterday, I tried sitting just after the morning meal, which consisted of a good portion of rice and curries. I felt a bit drowsy during the sitting, and within 15 minutes, I had to break the sitting due to sloth and torpor. Later in the afternoon, I sat again and lasted about an hour. Meditating in Nepal is a bit different. Here I hear background noises of people, cars, bikes, metal workers, dogs and birds almost all the time, so I am used to these sounds. Also, I have been experiencing NPNNP states so many times that I do not sit with any expectations for meditation to go deeper or experience cessation. Sometime in the middle, I lost perception of anything around me. Gradually, my perception and feeling returned like the volume of a speaker being turned up. I noted grosser vibrations of the mind, but due to the background noise, I could not quite see them clearly. 24 Feb 19, sat this morning for 1HR as usual. I was very calm and composed, even before the sit, and did not have any expectations from the sitting. I found reciting the Buddha's words, or the five elements on his advice to Rahula at the beginning, balanced my mind. I was just observing a clear mind and applying the 6R method to any distractions. My mind entered and exited the NPNNP states several times, and my mind was very bright and light. I noted a short gap in my awareness again, followed by some gross movement of the mind, and immediately after that, a lot of joy and happiness followed. I kept applying the 6R method and stayed with my object of meditation with a very balanced mind hardly impacted by any distracting thoughts. 12th of March 2019 I have not had good sittings in the evenings for a long time. Usually it seems that my mindfulness weakens due to some sort of tiredness, and I feel sleepy within a short time. This evening I sat at 20.30 for about one inch hour. My mind was very active for the first 15 minutes or so. I kept relaxing and coming back to observing the clear mind. I did not give up observing the mind and watched it very closely. I observed many kinds of thoughts and feelings arising, trying to grab my attention and fading away by themselves as I continually applied the 6R method to them. I now understand very well that there is nothing for me to grab onto and consider them to be me or mine at all. Instead, I was amused by such thoughts, which appeared like uninvited visitors causing some nuisance to the mind. My mind remained very balanced after that and went very deep into the NPNNP state, 
My mind was like a still pond due to the complete subsiding of any thoughts for long periods, and equanimity and stillness pervaded my body and mind, along with some joy and happiness. I clearly saw what the pure mind looks like and was amazed by the experience. 19th May 2019, today is Vesak Day, a very special day for all who follow the Buddha's teachings. Over the last few days, I have made some adjustments to my practice, and I am blown away by how much better my sittings have been since then. Previously, while sitting, I used to focus only on a bright spot around the forehead part of the mind and relax there, instead of opening up the whole mind and relaxing. Now I understand why I used to experience headaches and a slow, confused mind. I was not opening up the mind enough and relaxing. I was also very focused on body pain as it arose and couldn't sit for longer. Observing only a small part of the mind eventually led to one-pointed concentration, and this had all the side effects that I was experiencing. This little adjustment has greatly improved my meditation. The mind was bright and full of energy throughout the sitting. My mindfulness was very good. I experienced that the mind becomes so subtle that all sense experiences are checkered. There is no solid consciousness at all. 12th of November 2020 the Buddha has said that as one practices diligently, the liberation of the mind through the cessation of perception and feeling can be experienced even while in the first jhana, second jhana, or any of the jhanas or formless attainments. I have practiced meditation so many times now that I recall entering cessation while abiding in the second jhana, fourth jhana, base of nothingness, and NPNNP. Entering the state of cessation really happens when there is no prior planning or intention. I have found myself slipping into cessation, particularly during those sittings when I least expect it. Very odd, but true. On determinations and mastery of the jhanas, around 2019-2020, after having experienced various jhana stages and formless spheres, I have recently been practicing and experimenting with a method to experience any of them at predetermined periods of time. This is a very useful tool to be able to experience and understand more clearly the characteristics and nature of each jhana. A detailed description of the jhanas is given in the Anupada Sutta of Majjhima Nikaya, where the Buddha states that Saraputta experienced each jhana up to and including the base of nothingness while remaining mindful and fully aware. Previously, when experiencing each of the jhanas, I did not have much control over how long I could sustain them and I didn't know if my experiences were accurate. With the practice of determination, I have been able to closely observe how the first jhana arises, how it ceases, and gives way to enter the second jhana, and so on. The practice of determination requires time, patience, and perseverance. Some days the experiences flow smoothly, while other times they do not. I have found that on days when I am more comfortable and well-rested, my practices yield very fruitful results. I can see each jhana very clearly and can remain in them for as long as I intend. Fine-tuning the timing has also improved with each practice session. Initially, if I aim to emerge from the first jhana in 30 minutes, I might end up staying for 40 minutes or 25 minutes, close but not achieving the precise timing I aimed for. Nowadays, after daily sittings for nearly two weeks, I can emerge from the jhanas fairly close to the intended time, within a minute of the set duration of, say, 30 or 45 minutes. Today I wanted to revisit the experience of the fourth jhana, so I determined to emerge from it after 45 minutes during my sitting. I radiated metta to myself for five minutes, then for the remaining time I directed metta towards my spiritual friend, feeling warmth in my chest area. I could sense the shift with feelings of calm and equanimity arising, while the feeling of joy simultaneously subsided. The remained in this experience for the duration I had determined and allowed the mind to stay and kept coming back to it if distractions pulled my attention away. I knew how mind is very powerful in maintaining its own clock, so I did not see a need to perfect this skill anymore. What I've learned. Over the period from 2017 to 2020, I experimented with the twin practice and calibrated it with suitor references and descriptions. I understand that keeping notes of specific experiences as definitive guides may be pointless, as things can often turn out differently, a paradox that the Buddha highlighted, perpetuating our existence in the conditioned realm. Here are some notes, or perhaps anecdotes, I hope you find useful. 
keep mental proliferation in check right from the start. I've noticed that when I radiate meta towards people or other living beings, paying more attention to someone triggers many associated memories that instantly divert my focus from the object of meditation. It helps a lot if I adopt a light attitude towards these distractions, simply radiating the feeling without getting entangled in thoughts. I once heard from Bhante Punaji that metta represents the spreading aspect like the surface of a cube, whereas compassion represents delving into depth to fill the volume, a fitting analogy. Avoid involvement in identification or duality. When we engage with thoughts, concepts crystallize into the five aggregates, leading to a notion of self or existence that we cling to tenaciously. This creates a dualistic perception of mentality versus materiality, where we identify with mentality as our self and view materiality as external. However, these two are interconnected through consciousness, which projects our sense of self and the world. Craving stitches together name and form with the aid of consciousness, as stated in the Tisameteya Sutta of the Parayanavaga in the Suttanipata. When craving is eradicated, the distinction between name and form, form and formless, self and world ceases, leading to the attainment of Nibbana in this very life. Do not fear the cessation of existence, Bhava Niroda. We often fear the idea of extinction associated with Nibbana. For countless eons, we have clung to the body and mind as representing ourself. Through the lens of dependent co-arising, we must see that what we consider ourselves is merely a heap of aggregates resulting from craving and clinging, arising due to our limited perception of the world. As we progress in meditation and contemplate cessation, the illusion of our solid existence evaporates, revealing that all that arises is suffering, and all that ceases is the same. Firmly holding on to this perspective eliminates any hindrance, no matter how subtle it may be. Get adequate sleep to rest the body and mind. Throughout my years of twin practice, I've had many instances during sittings where my body and mind weren't fully rested due to insufficient sleep. I typically get eight hours of sleep daily, which is generally enough to feel comfortable in body and mind in the mornings. However, I've found that extending my sleep by just a little, say eight and a half or nine hours, and then sitting makes a noticeable difference within minutes. In these cases, the mind is exceptionally calm and mellow, effortlessly entering deep states. I don't even need to cultivate feelings of tranquility or peace. The mind remains poised, ready to engage like a devoted servant. One morning, I meditated and experienced the realm of neither perception nor non-perception within a few minutes. Although the mind occasionally wavered and drifted towards mundane thoughts, guiding it back to a collected state was effortless, without any unease or restlessness. Adhere strictly to all precepts. The five precepts form the foundation of the Buddha's path, crucial for anyone seeking higher spiritual attainments. Even subtle deviations from these guidelines can disrupt advanced practices of the mind. The Buddha's precepts serve as general guidelines to maintain a clear mind free from guilt and remorse, which otherwise hinder meditation. Some may assume that skilled practitioners in advanced meditation, states like higher jhanas and formless states, are unaffected by adherence to precepts. However, in the Buddha's teachings on the higher mind, such practices are unequivocally essential, and disregarding them can lead to decline in practice. I've had instances where consuming even a small amount of alcohol the previous day directly affected my meditation the next day. My mind became more sensitive, and during normal activities, such drinks cause dullness, lack of mindfulness, and a noticeable loss of mental clarity and sharpness. The effects were particularly pronounced during meditation, manifesting as debilitated brightness and increased drowsiness. It takes several days to restore clarity and agility of mind after such indulgences. Overcoming Sloth and Torpor Welcome to the Sloth and Torpor Club. I've long struggled with this issue as well. Here are a few tips I've found helpful. Meditate in the mornings if possible. From my experience, mornings are when I'm most alert and energetic, making it easier to observe the mind's attention clearly and cultivate energy and joy. Recognize the subjective, emotional part of the mind that flows with thoughts, feelings and sensations. We often get caught up in this flow and succumb to feelings of tiredness, boredom or lack of focus, eventually realizing we've drifted from meditation. 
At this point, we may feel we've already fallen behind in practice due to lost momentum. However, there's also an objective, non-emotional part of the mind that remains detached from these fluctuations, observing them as they arise and pass away, akin to a vigilant guard at a crossroads. This is the mind emphasized in many suttas on mindfulness. It took me some time to fully grasp this concept, but hopefully you'll grasp it quicker than I did. Prioritize walking meditation before sitting. This significantly enhances alertness and energy during meditation, making it easier for joy to arise. Do not fixate on achieving specific jhanas. These states naturally unfold as we focus on metta. At this stage, which jhana we enter is inconsequential. Once experienced, there's no doubt that this feeling is far from ordinary. Summary. I participated in an online retreat with David in 2017, and since then, all my assumptions and doubts about TWIM gradually disappeared. Nibbana is not something to be attained like an academic degree. It is a state of change in your personality. That is, the reduction of greed, hatred, and delusion. There is no clear distinction between someone who has not attained Nibbana and someone who has. It is a path of gradual progress towards reducing these three defilements. Experiencing cessation was a confirming moment that Twim does indeed lead to the end of the Noble Eightfold Path. While other teachers may instruct on experiencing all jhanas, for me, experiencing cessation was the crucial test to determine if the practice is worthwhile. However, experiencing cessation alone is not sufficient. As I will explain later, there must be a maturation of the process and insight with wisdom. Only then does experiencing cessation bear fruit in attaining stream entry, once returning, non-returning, and arahat ship. I do not consider experiencing cessation as an attainment on its own. Anyone experiencing such a state must exhibit irreversible traits. The Buddha detailed the nature of a person undergoing 44 transformations in Majjhima Nikaya 8 Saleka Sutta. In essence, these properties include kindness, compassion, noble attitudes, freedom from hindrances, noble virtue, and diligence. I can confidently say that I am now more kind, considerate, thoughtful, and less prone to anger or bitterness than I was a year ago. This is the true measure of progress on this path. Part 3. On Expositions of the Mind In this part, I share insights from my direct meditative experiences on key aspects of the Buddha's teachings, including the state of the mind, the five hindrances, the experience of awakening from conditioned existence, and the states of cessation and nibbana. I begin by exploring the mental states of people engaged in various activities, showing how distractions can be managed to achieve a tranquil, aware state from which deeper reflections on the workings of the mind can be made. I also delve into the Four Noble Truths, providing insights from direct meditative experiences. I explain what it means to awaken from the dream of existence, and describe the experience itself. I further elaborate on the Buddha's teachings in his first sermon about the cessation of suffering and a mind free of all mental proliferation. By understanding the Buddha's teachings on dependent origination, one can break free of the flow of this process, leading to the complete cessation of mental proliferation. A dedicated chapter focuses on the practice leading to nirodha, or the cessation of perception and feeling the culmination of the Noble Eightfold Path. I explore the practice, the illusions of mind that keep one away from progressing to cessation and attitude one should adopt to navigate in this path. I use various metaphors and similes to illustrate the vivid experiences encountered when committing to this path, emphasizing why this is one of the most valuable gifts as humans we can attain. Finally, I conclude this part by referencing numerous suttas where the Buddha explains Nibbāna, the unconditioned state, using everyday language to describe something beyond ordinary experience. Drawing on my personal meditation experiences, I offer interpretations to help understand Nibbāna, which is challenging to convey in conventional terms, yet remains central to the path of liberation. Chapter 14. Seeing Through Hindrances This chapter aims to uncover the experiences of those striving on the path amidst various worldly obligations. We all face practical limitations due to household life, along with numerous duties and responsibilities that we must navigate while pursuing success on this path. I am not an exception to this reality. 
The truth is, we are naturally bound by these practical limitations of household life. Our jobs, family responsibilities, and the need to allocate time for practice. We should not consider Dharma as a lower priority or a background task that we can simply relegate while continuing with our daily lives. There is a delicate balancing act that we need to perform, and our situations are often trickier than we might prefer. I intend to compile a list of practices, experiences, and strategies for navigating the path within these constraints, aiming for success. I plan to include significant suitors, supplement the readings with my personal experiences, and share the journeys I have undertaken since around 2017. That's when I began seriously practicing Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation and the 6R Technique. While I consider myself a fairly skilled navigator of this path, I don't take delight in that or feel content even now. It seems that certainty in practice only arrives when we've achieved it. Until then, we must live with these mental acquisitions that often entangle us in various ways. I would like to share some of those insights and compile whatever I have experienced here to see if it can be of value to you. I'm curious to find out if our experiences align. I'll be covering some experiences of how we should tread this path, which doesn't appear to be straightforward in the beginning. We might think that practicing and using the 6R method is sufficient, but we are often veiled by our perceptions, experiences, and the daily accumulation of work and life situations, which can clutter our minds. These things can easily hinder our practice from being a smooth journey. I don't believe I'm the only one facing this, and hopefully you will find it interesting to hear what I have described. I was fairly content and happy with my progress in practice and deep experiences. However, in early 2023, I noticed that I do not easily reach a subtle state of mind. I am quite familiar with the practice and have experienced all the states. Knowing how to navigate and perform certain practices to sustain any particular state, Somehow, I observe that my mind has taken some turns in recent months, which has led me to wonder whether this is really how we should be practicing and what approaches we should take. Those five hindrances that we are all familiar with seem to have become my companions, shadows. I would say they have become my competitors, my best friends, my companions for a good part of the last few months. I know I just have to bear with them. There's no need to defeat or overcome them. I don't have to push them away, and I generally find this easy during sitting practices. However, I've noticed that one day might be a good sitting, while another might be bad. At times, my mind is invaded by a state of sloth. Other times, it is too excited by some prospects. These are the seesaw-type states that fill my diary with inconsistent sitting practices. So what I thought was that it might be a good idea to actually put together some notes and corroborate with the Buddha's advice on those practical challenges. This is so the practical reality of life and the minds of those people who have to continue practicing in such environments can be addressed. The first thing we all might need, if we start navigating this path, is to find ground zero, a state of equilibrium, a quiescent point, a point where the mind is very balanced or fully calibrated, and where is that reference point? It can be quite tricky to find out where our mind is heading and where it currently resides. When we understand these states of mind, we can pursue a practice to develop those factors that aid the practice and the goal of awakening. Observing the seven awakening factors and my awareness of where the mind is and where mindfulness is leading, I found that mindfulness indicates our mind is not settled enough. I can observe the mind and it tells me it is not on the right footing. I can continue the practice to cultivate happiness and joy factors, and I will start to add some tranquility. This exercise can reset the mind, bringing it to a balanced reference point. However, in our daily lives, we might get carried away with personalization and attitudes, be it in the work environment or in life. We might have somehow overstepped or forgotten where the mind slipped. That was one of the things that was quite tricky, and it took some time for me to find the balanced state of mind and how I can start my practice with a mind that is neither too active nor too relaxed, avoiding slothful or dreamy states. What I see is that if we are busy individuals with many daily tasks, we might easily lose that reference point. So it might be a good idea to gauge the state of mind where we are and then try to bring the mind to that reference point. There are several considerations when practicing. The environment should be right and fairly balanced. The sitting position should be comfortable 
and there should be adequate lighting in the room. If sitting outside, we need to position ourselves to avoid facing too much brightness. We might want to avoid sitting in overly dark areas. There are many factors to consider. Yes, these environments, these external factors, do affect the mind, and it is in our interest to choose an environment where we are comfortable and can practice for however long we wish. My professional career and work environment meant I was dealing with many people and various issues, some of them challenging, and somehow these states seeped into my practice. What I found was that when I sit down to meditate, I try to let the mind calm itself. However, the mind settles at a particular state where it moves in certain directions. Yet I still notice the state and magnitude of the mind are influenced by background information from work-life environments. So then I thought, okay, what is that? Then I realized that things like perception of light and environment are important. We have to consider how the mind perceives them to find a sweet spot or a Goldilocks zone. This thought just came into my mind. Is it where the mind is neither too hot nor too cold? The Goldilocks zone is a concept used by planet hunters looking for signs of life in the galaxy. NASA and some other space exploration teams are very familiar with it. You might have heard of projects like Kepler, which has found thousands of exoplanets, with some potentially suitable for sustaining life because they fall into the Goldilocks zone. Similarly, our mind needs a reference point to understand where that Goldilocks zone is. If we are trying to locate that Goldilocks zone to enter Jhana, it might be a good idea to start with a sitting practice where we can observe the mind without the impacts of the environment. Just turn off all the lights and observe that empty space of the mind, like a clean slate or a blackboard. Spending a few minutes in that empty space of the mind, we can gradually see that our mind was a bit too agitated in reaction to any mental objects. We can observe the mind calming down and settling to a state where it is neither too excited nor too lethargic. Then we can maintain our practice and apply the right energy or effort. This approach may not apply to everyone or in all cases of mind disturbances, but it's something worth trying. If we've lost track of the state of equilibrium, simply gauging the state of mind in a quiet setting can be useful for our practice. If we continue with a mind that has accumulated many tendencies without knowing where our mind should be to enter that balanced state of ease, finding this balance is crucial in this practice. The Buddha teaches that there are many places the mind can get hooked and hindrances can linger even while in the most subtle and sublime states. We can only be completely free of these five hindrances when we have fully followed the path, letting go of any minute traces of phenomena or mental objects. These are some of the subtlest attachments that linger within us. We will not be free of these mental acquisitions simply by entering the stages of jhanas. Full liberation is required. In jhanas, we temporarily let go of these attachments, but they can arise and cease any time. The practice we follow aims to release all attachments, including those associated with all jhanas. We let go of the first jhana to arrive at the second, then proceed through to the third, and so on, and may suddenly enter cessation. Entering cessation is also a temporary freedom from these mental acquisitions. They will be completely eradicated only after achieving arahantship. Until then, we continue with this path, which involves hit and miss in our practice. This is one of the points I wanted to share. Most of us are in the same boat, and hopefully these insights are useful for you. I would like to add some words from the Buddha regarding hindrances, disturbances, mental states, and how our practice should be guided. I will read from the Sutta Nipata, Section 1, Sutta 3, called The Rhinoceros Horn. It's quite long, but I'll highlight some key points from that sutta. It says, Sensual pleasures are colorful, sweet, and delightful, but in their diversity, they agitate the mind. Having seen danger in the strand of sensual pleasure, one should live alone like a rhinoceros horn. These sensual pleasures are natural to live with, and our approach to them needs a boundary between indulgence and moderation. It's a balance we need to strike with sensual pleasure. The Buddha's path is that middle ground, where we can live with these pleasures for the progress of our practice. They are necessary for keeping this body alive, but in moderation so that we can remain comfortable and practice this path with a healthy body and mind. The point I want to emphasize here is that these sensual pleasures are colorful, delightful, and diverse. This diversity refers to the restless state of mind that engages with all senses. 
keeping the mind busy and overloaded, making our practice more challenging. We need to let go of reactions to these sensual perceptions so that the mind can enter a unified state based on mindfulness and collectedness. If we read Sutta Majjhima Nikaya 1.11, it states that upon entering the base of infinite space, we let go of the perception of diversity. We no longer attend to the diversity of sense experiences. Instead, we perceive the base of infinity of space there. Even in that space, we still retain the element of perception. The perception of the base of infinite space is where clinging exists. The Buddha explains that although we have let go of all external sense interactions, we have not let go of perception. This perception is also relinquished in practice, at the culmination of the Eightfold Path. Perception and consciousness are closely linked. When perception is let go of, consciousness is also released. This immediate release of consciousness affects Nama Rupa. In the Nama Rupa, the first element includes feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention. Letting go of perception means letting go of phenomena dependent on perception. This cascades to letting go of consciousness, and subsequently Nama Rupa. This includes letting go of feeling, position, intention, contact and attention. It's akin to a house of cards collapsing. Perception is generally viewed as something that arises after feeling. However, I don't necessarily agree. Perception is not merely an outgrowth of feeling. It arises alongside feeling, and they can arise and cease together. Perception plays a crucial role, making it essential to let go of. Perception is a strong attachment, because we often associate perceptions with our ego or identity. What we perceive becomes part of our identity. In practice, as we sit and observe, we may realize there is a layer of perception. We can experience the mind perceiving itself. Even this layer of perception doesn't escape mindfulness scrutiny. When we reach a subtle state of neither perception nor non-perception, the veil of perception begins to crumble. Perception, which was tied to our identity and ego, starts to destabilize. All these things must be continually let go of. The Buddha has provided us with a path, a gradual cessation of all mental acquisitions, sensual, verbal, and mental. These acquisitions and formations are two different aspects of our suffering. The Buddha teaches that suffering arises due to craving, acquisitions, and activities of body, speech, and mind. Exploring these Pali terms, upadi, refers to accumulation or amassing, building up our identity through experiences. Sankara refers to activities that propel us forward, like momentum. Think of it like a snowball effect. A small piece of ice starts rolling, accumulating snow, growing larger. It's the momentum, as Sankara, that keeps it going. This momentum is what creates dependent origination. Dependent origination reveals that phenomena are transient and empty. They lack inherent solidity or permanence. Consciousness, feeling, perception and formations are like ghost-like phenomena, not solid or permanent. These phenomena arise due to continuous motion and process, a vibration or oscillation that gives rise to all experiences. An analogy is the difference between waves and particles in physics. Waves are phenomena without mass or substance, just like consciousness and perceptions. The distinction between waves and particles has blurred with advancements in quantum mechanics over the past century. When scientists delve deeper into atoms, molecules, and subatomic particles, breaking down these components into their smallest entities, they seek to understand what drives these particles at their core. Suddenly, they grapple with the concept of quantum leaps. Quantum physics reveals that particles do not behave smoothly. They jump abruptly from one state to another. The term quantum denotes this behavior, where particles can seemingly appear like ghosts now in one state and instantly in another. They can traverse distances in no time, challenging the laws of physics regarding space-time and the principle of locality. Recent scientific developments suggest that the boundary between particles and waves has become increasingly blurred, with particles exhibiting wave-like behavior and vice versa. Dependent origination, therefore, resembles a wave, its motion interconnected with other dependent phenomena. This interconnected motion gives rise to all appearances, forms, and material aspects. Delving into detailed explanations might contradict those in the physical science community who uphold the belief in an objective, independent world. For example, 
Einstein famously expressed his preference to believe the moon exists even when not observed, asserting its independent existence. However, an alternative perspective suggests that our perception of the moon arises dependent on our act of seeing it. The moon as an object does not exist independently of our perception. This topic can become contentious as it refutes objective reality, and I realize I have digressed from discussing the Dhamma due to my interest in scientific matters. Given my profession, I find these discussions relevant and valuable. While reading the Sutanipata 1.3, The Rhinoceros Horn, I encountered a verse that resonates deeply with me. Like a lion unalarmed among sounds, like the wind not caught in a net, untainted like a lotus by water, one should live alone like a rhinoceros horn. These verses carry profound meaning, particularly in the context of meditation practice. Reflecting on Bhante Vimalaramsi's early teachings, he shared a compelling anecdote about meditating amidst the noise of a water-pumping machine. While some found the noise disruptive, Bhante observed it simply as sound, just sound. This perspective aligns with the Buddha's teaching, urging us not to become entangled in phenomena. These sounds merely touch our ears and occupy a fleeting moment of our mental awareness, akin to a brief time slot seeking our attention. The essence lies in our attention. If we find ourselves ensnared by the web of the six senses, we are already immersed in diversity. The Buddha teaches us to let these sounds be, not to be startled by them. Whether an external sound, an internal smell, a lingering taste, or bodily sensations like itching, these are mere perceptions seeking our attention within the mind. When these sensations arise, observe them without chasing their source or feeling an urgency to stop them immediately. Recognize that their emergence in the mind reflects our mental state and activities. Observe where the mind reacts and let go. This practice begins with the mind. By doing so, the bubbles of distraction burst, revealing their insignificance. It is not an emergency demanding immediate attention. The Buddha guides us, saying, It's just a sound. Don't be alarmed by it. It's like wind passing through a net. Let the mind navigate through these experiences, akin to wind flowing freely through openings in a net. Allow these occurrences in the mind without attaching to each one. This approach is crucial in meditation practice, especially when such phenomena arise frequently. Familiarity and acceptance of these experiences support methods like the TWIM approach to meditation. Another beneficial point to consider in our practice is our current state of engagement. Initially, we might practice amidst diverse experiences, engaging with sensual pleasures and the stimuli of the sixth sense doors. As we progress, we gradually release our reactions to these sensations. This shift leads us into the realm of the mind, where diversity diminishes and we realize unification through unity. This phase can be described as the mental or formless realm. Moving forward, we experience stages such as infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. It's crucial to recognize that each stage is reached progressively by letting go of various perceptions. Letting go of the perception of infinite space leads to infinite consciousness, and so forth, until reaching the perception of neither perception nor non-perception. In this final stage, there remains a residual perception, a faint remnant of perception. At this point, our own perception is greatly diminished. The Buddha emphasizes this in Sutta, verse 74. Having abandoned lust, hatred, and delusion, having sundered the fetters that keep one bound, not terrified at the extinction of life, one should live alone like a rhinoceros horn. This verse highlights that by relinquishing desire, hatred, and delusion, and breaking free from the bonds that bind us, we experience relief and freedom, not annihilation or suffering. We should not fear bhava niroda, the cessation of existence. Instead, we should live independently, akin to a rhinoceros. This verse underscores the importance of not fearing the cessation of life. At this stage, it's common to perceive that our sense of self, feelings, and perceptions define us. There might be a fear that letting go of these aspects will lead to extinction. The Buddha advises calmly allowing these feelings to pass without attachment. Attachment to these perceptions perpetuates the cycle of existence, known as bhava, a continuous cycle of seeking experiences to uphold our sense of self. 
This perpetuation is like a self-sustaining snowball effect, where any interruption feels catastrophic. However, it's essential to recognize that even the perception of self-extinction needs to be released. It's another layer of attachment that requires letting go. It's noteworthy that even accomplished individuals like Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta were unable to release this perception. They clung to their identity associated with these perceptions, fearing loss by letting them go. The Buddha revolutionized this by demonstrating that our entire existence is a mental construct. The collapse of this construct does not result in catastrophe, but in the highest bliss of freedom. This realization led to Nibbana. Nibbana is characterized by the cessation of all formations and, crucially, the relinquishing of all perceptions. This ultimate state of no perception is what Nibbana signifies, a complete tranquility and peace, the profound stillness of all fabrications and the total release of all acquisitions. Perceptions, feelings, consciousness, all these are mere acquisitions. The cessation of craving also means the cessation of these acquisitions. By withholding our undue attention from them, we starve these phenomena, leading to their cessation. This is the state of Nibbana. The extinction of craving is what the Buddha refers to as personal cessation and Nibbana. I believe these shared insights may be valuable. Additionally, I intend to explore the suttas further in the future. To return to the hindrances, they serve as the bedrock of our practice, influencing the stability of our meditation. Hindrances are inevitable, whether we seek them or not. In previous conversations, I've encountered valuable insights that have proven quite helpful. In Sutta Majjhima Nikaya 62, it is stated that when our mind is overwhelmed by restlessness, sloth, or anxiety, practicing contemplation of the four great elements can be quite helpful. The Buddha recommended this approach. For example, he advised Rahula not to directly engage in the most advanced and sublime practices initially. Towards the end of that sutta, the Buddha instructs Rahula to develop the mind or meditation akin to the earth element, explaining that by doing so, both agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade the mind. He then progresses to the water, fire, air and space elements. Next, he recommends cultivating loving-kindness to counter ill-will, which is one of the five hindrances. Following that are practices related to compassion, joy and equanimity all helping to counter negative attitudes and emotions. Finally, the Buddha mentions the meditation on Anapanasati, which lead to four greatest attainments, Mahapalas, commonly translated as mindfulness of breathing and other phenomena. What the Buddha conveys is that after progressing through stages including equanimity, if we transcend that state and reach a point where only the mind remains, our focus shifts to observing the mind and its interactions with mental objects. This dynamic interaction is akin to a game between the mind and mental objects. The key is to observe the mind. In doing so, we reveal the process whereby the mind and mental objects collaborate, giving rise to perception, formation and consciousness. Our observation catches this process red-handed, exposing that the mind generates these constructs. This awareness underscores that the mind is the originator behind all phenomena. When the distinction between the mind and its objects fades, the momentum of the mind's consciousness comes to a halt. Thus, when mind consciousness stops, our perception, consciousness and awareness of the world come to a halt. This occurs because the continuous flow, the momentum of dependent origination phenomena, encounters disruption. Imagine there's a tiny fuse in a circuit and the current flowing through the wire suddenly gets interrupted as the fuse blows. Similarly, when that fuse blows within the mind, consciousness stops, perception ceases, and the entire flow of experiences comes to a standstill. You can also think of it as closing a dam's gate. Suddenly, the river has no more water. The mind is responsible for this illusion of experiences, making us believe that there's a distinction between the mind and mental objects. It's like playing a game with a child, showing an object, and then hiding it. The mind continuously employs such tricks to keep us trapped in this cycle. Falling for these tricks is the state most of us live in. We inherit this tendency, this acquisition, and are entangled in the mind's game. However, we have the opportunity to break free from this cycle, to liberate ourselves from the mind's elaborate illusions. I believe this step could be quite important. Also, this is an exceptionally delicate stage. 
if we find ourselves progressing well towards that state of mind where it's profoundly calm and composed, we must allow the mind to be. Even our observation needs to approach with ease. Sometimes, even the slightest observation can feel as if it's disturbing the mind. If we step back just a bit in response, suddenly our mind might go completely blank. There's an extremely refined maneuver we can employ if we've attained such an exquisitely delicate state of mind. It involves finding a balance between two aspects. One is the subtle effort we sometimes also call energy, and the other is gently relaxing the mind. In the Samyutta Nikaya, there's a very brief sutta that describes an encounter between Devata, heavenly being, and Buddha, where Buddha exemplifies this process. A Devata asks him, how did you cross the flood so hard to cross? And the Buddha responds, look, my friend, when I tried to strive, I was pulled by the current. When I stood still, I drowned. It was by not striving and not staying still that I crossed the flood. This is the precise point. It's like making a micro-millimeter adjustment. We can't simply move abruptly. We have to make these incredibly tiny adjustments to keep the process going. This gradual progression will eventually guide the mind to exit the universe through a minuscule opening. So whether we let the mind be or gently guide it, the key is to ensure the mind is moving in the right direction by allowing all to happen by stepping away. Therefore, the effort required is incredibly minimal and we simply allow the mind to be. It will naturally exit the universe through that tiny aperture, like a crack in the cosmic expanse. We would emerge through that crack in the, say, cosmic egg. I'm not sure if I repeated myself too much, but I find that aspect of the experience intriguing, the way we transcend the universe. That's something I like to describe whenever I have the opportunity. We all understand the importance of the five precepts, these precepts form the fundamental pillars of our practice. We should live by these precepts, making sure not to intentionally violate them. If we intentionally break a precept, it will likely weigh on our conscience because we knowingly transgressed it. On the other hand, if we inadvertently breach a precept, there's no need to feel remorseful or guilty about it. Intentions are crucial in this matter. What's in our mind holds greater significance than our physical actions. It's not the action of stepping on an insect that's problematic. The issue arises from whether we intended to harm it or if it was an unintentional misstep. So that is a key point, whether our mind plays an active role or not. This is one of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta 56 Upali Sutta, where there's a comprehensive discourse on the practice according to the Buddha. He provides robust arguments to counter the teachings of the Niganthas a sect that came to challenge the Buddha's perspective. He asserted that it's not the physical actions, but rather the mental actions that hold greater significance. In this context, let's consider a precept. If our mind is pure, devoid of any intention to harm, steal, or commit any wrongdoing, then we are genuinely living a virtuous life. It's not solely about the external actions, but rather the purity of our intentions. What I would like to convey is that, as we advance in our practice, it's crucial to be a bit more cautious about what we say. If we have made progress and are seeking further development, then being mindful of our words, especially keeping promises and staying true to what we say, becomes increasingly important. I'd like to share a little of my own perspective. I believe this might resonate with some of my previous discussions. At one point, I mentioned that I intended to create a video about Majima Nikaya 111 in another language. While I did indeed start working on the video, I didn't complete that part. Initially, I stated that I would do it right at the beginning of the video, but then I ended up terminating that video and forgot about it. As time passed, I resumed my meditation practice, but I started to notice agitation in my mind. I questioned why my mind seemed to be jumping around, and I felt a certain sense of unease. Despite feeling fairly comfortable with my ability to enter various jhanas for many years, I couldn't be free of this unsettling feeling. I began to reflect on what might be causing this, asking myself what I had done wrong. It's an interesting situation, and I must admit that my intuition didn't provide an immediate answer. So I kept practicing, and I had to accept that sometimes things don't go as planned. If I missed a day, I told myself that it's okay. I can practice tomorrow and see how it goes. If I encountered the same situation, I accepted it and continued on. 
However, this question lingered in my mind about what might be causing this disturbance. It took me a few weeks, but then it suddenly struck me. I had mentioned that I would create a specific talk in another language, and I hadn't followed through on that commitment. Once I realized this, I immediately started working on that video. Interestingly, this was a turning point for me, and I gained some insights from it. This experience reminded me of how important it is to be mindful of what we say and commit to. Even seemingly small things hold significance, and being truthful and responsible with our words can make a significant difference. It's about aligning our actions with our intentions and cultivating a sense of integrity. If we have practiced the Dhamma, our attachment to worldly gains such as deceit, cheating, fraud, and acquiring things unlawfully will start to fade away. The temptation to become rich quickly or possess extravagant possessions, like a nice car, will also diminish. We'll find more contentment in what we have and be satisfied with our accomplishments. Breaking precepts doesn't enhance our contentment. Rather, upholding them aligns with our genuine lack of craving. In the past, we may have desired luxury cars and big houses, but now those desires are less prominent. We become more aware of what truly matters. These changes might be suitable for us, but they might not be the same for others. The whole purpose of keeping the precepts is to maintain harmony in our interactions with the people we care about. It's best to adhere to them to ensure such harmony. That's why having this harmony is crucial and why the precepts play a vital role in this. They shield us from resentment and ill will from others, fortifying us with goodwill. I view these precepts as a form of protection for myself, safeguarding my interactions. I went a bit into my personal experiences, which still amuse me. When I recall these things, they make me laugh. These occurrences do happen, especially as I'm not living an ascetic life. I sometimes unintentionally get caught up in these things, and it's okay to forget. It's fine. We can also offer ourselves forgiveness to make it even more effective. I mentioned this concept in relation to the mind and mind objects. In Asian countries, specifically in South Asia and Nepal, there are large trees called silk cotton trees. During the hot summer season, these trees produce a very fine and tender type of cotton known as silk cotton. The silk cotton is exceptionally soft and delicate, and it grows on these enormous trees, sometimes reaching heights of 40 to 50 meters. During the summer, silk cotton trees bear fruit, which initially appears green and then starts to flourish, with flowers turning reddish. As the flowers mature, silk cotton begins to emerge. This lightweight silk cotton, despite coming from the massive tree, starts to float through the air, giving a feeling of weightlessness. We can experience this sense of weightlessness in higher jhanas. These silk cotton fibers, in a way, are similar to mind objects. They emanate from the tree and were once part of it. However, they detach and float away, just like our thoughts and perceptions. We observe them up close, without an iota of identification. It is just amazing. These silk cotton fibers were once part of the tree, much like thoughts were once part of our mind. The distinction between the tree and the silk cotton is only our conceptualization. Based on our perceptions and attention, we witness them directly. So let's consider the relationship between the mind and mind objects. I used to marvel at how incredible these trees are, producing such wonderfully soft silk cotton fibers. I would venture into meadows and fields to collect these delicate silk cotton fibers, appreciating their beauty. The process is akin to a mind object, delicate and profound. When we reach a heightened state of mind, having let go of numerous things, the significance of these small mind objects becomes evident. In this advanced state of mind, we discern that the process of silk cotton unraveling from the tree mirrors the unraveling of mind and mind objects. Witnessing this process initiates a sense of clarity. Our mindset during this experience is to release any form of observation, reaction, or tendency. Allow the unfolding process to occur naturally without interference. As we do this, we notice a dissolution of the notions of self, mind object, and mind itself. All these aspects begin to dissolve, and as we observe this unfolding process, the mind starts to transition into a state of cessation. It might just be a metaphor, but it resonates quite well with what I used to perceive during my earlier practices. These are the things I tend to keep in mind. Metaphors, examples, and similes. 
The Buddha has provided us with numerous similes, and I often try to see if I can find anything in nature or our surroundings that can serve as a reference to aid our progress. This approach has been quite effective for me personally. When I experience a particular state of mind, I search for something similar to draw a comparison and keep my mind focused on the right path. In this context, I often use examples like particles, molecules, or the concept of fine apertures. These comparisons help me retain a mental reference for what needs to be done. When observing the mind, certain patterns or interactions become apparent. I believe that these observations aren't completely detached from the real world. We can still find analogies that make sense. So consider this as a story that we can relate to. This technique has been one of the valuable ways I've approached my practice. If we become more observant, we'll notice that our mind tends to be in various states. For instance, we might find ourselves feeling a bit crowded or not entirely at ease. Ideally, the mind should be calm and solitary. However, it's common for the mind to be entangled with other mental processes, resulting in a sense of partnership within the mind. I often refer to this process as formations, which tend to snowball and complicate the state of the mind. During our observation, we might perceive our mind not quite settling down. Even though we're aware of our mind's presence, it may not be attaining a state of calmness or composure. This is when we realize that although we intend for the mind to be tranquil, it's still showing signs of restlessness. Even during practices like focusing on our breath, we might find that certain background elements, like the rhythm of our in-breaths and out-breaths, or the warmth of our body, persist and hinder the mind from achieving a state of quietude. If our observation is particularly sharp during this time, we'll notice the background activities occurring within our mind. These bodily formations, such as the rhythm of our breathing, in-breaths and out-breaths, can trigger additional activities that affect the mind. Even though we might have already relaxed verbal formations, we'll realize that bodily formations remain active. This is especially evident when practicing in the jhanas. Even in the second, third or fourth jhana, we'll still sense the body's sensations, like heat or vibrations, intertwining with the mind's activities. This realization allows us to distinguish between the mind itself and the influencing activities of these formations. This observation is valuable. Gradually, we'll start to discern which factor needs the most attention and will guide the mind toward achieving a sense of equilibrium. This process takes time and practice. These stages are not something I frequently encounter. Generally, I find that the mind and body formations gradually synchronize and reduce their activities, becoming quieter. However, there are times when the mind and body activities are out of balance. In such instances, we can directly perceive this and then decide which factor needs adjustment. We might need to focus on the object of meditation that brings calmness or peacefulness, or we might need to immerse ourselves in the tranquility factor. As we do this, the imbalance will gradually subside. This process can take a while. If we notice that certain bodily activities are acting up and not subsiding easily, it might even take up to half an hour or so. This is just the reality of the situation, and dealing with such scenarios is part of the practice. Hindrances can indeed be challenging and can sometimes catch us off guard. At times we might feel lucky or overly confident in our ability to handle hindrances. However, it's important not to develop an overestimation that we can effortlessly overcome all hindrances. I have learned to let go of that overconfidence and not hold on to the belief that I can easily manage hindrances. It's an ongoing process of refining this aspect of my practice. I would like to add another point that might be useful for many of us the concept of Dhamma. In Buddhism, we often tend to become fixated on it. We strive to amass as much Dhamma as possible, aiming to gather thousands of teachings in our metaphorical basket. We aspire to become experts, curating a vast database of countless tips on how to navigate various situations. However, excessive accumulation of Dhamma can lead to possessiveness and attachment. If we listen to and collect an excessive amount of Dhamma talks, read excessively, and try to fill our minds with these activities, it can become another form of acquisition. We should recognize that the Buddha's teachings, or Dhamma, are not meant to be treated as mere words or to be excessively consumed. We don't need an overwhelming amount of Dhamma knowledge cluttering our minds. What we truly need is sufficient understanding. We need not treat them as possessions, nor view them as mere knowledge or expertise, 
but rather adopt a relaxed attitude. Dhamma is not a tangible thing, it's a process. So utilize Dhamma to find balance within ourselves. Avoid becoming obsessed with collecting Dhamma and don't spend an excessive amount of time on it. We don't need to count every minute or worry about missing out if we haven't listened to every talk or excerpt that Buddha has shared. The Buddha's teachings are so rich that regardless of the approach, they all lead to the same destination. Therefore, don't stress over amassing vast knowledge of Dhamma. Don't overindulge in Dhamma. While I'm unsure if such a term exists, simply regard Dhamma as our guiding companion. Live our life, enjoy music, savor our meals, engage in work, unwind while watching TV, and partake in all these everyday activities. Dedicate ample time to our daily life matters. Strike a balance. If we find that we haven't fully understood something, it's all right. Dhamma is always there to guide us. I engage quite extensively in Dhamma research and various related activities, ensuring that my database is replete with a plethora of concepts, ideas and practices. Yet at times, I found myself delving too deeply into this pursuit, resulting in an overwhelming load. Recognizing this, I decided to step back and allocate time for relaxation and leisure. It's essential to strike a balance in our engagement with Dhamma, allocate moments to relish life's pleasures, and in doing so, provide ourselves with the opportunity to foster a deeper practice. Allowing space and time for the teachings to settle naturally is crucial. By doing so, our practice will become more tranquil and harmonious. This, in essence, reflects my personal journey, a story that underscores the importance of moderation and humility. Ultimately, the lesson lies in not allowing greed to drive us. There's no need to boast about knowing every sutta, every concept. Adequate understanding is sufficient, and that's perfectly fine. Yes, having that attitude is very important. Recently, I've been teaching the 6R method and TWIM practice to some of my close friends and family members. During this process, I had to provide them with an analogy to help them understand the practice better. One of my friends had been practicing a different form of meditation, specifically metta meditation. However, she shared that she hadn't encountered any hindrances during her practice. She mentioned that her mind remained in a state of metta all the time and that she didn't perceive any disturbances. I inquired if her mind became active during other moments when she wasn't meditating, and she confirmed that it did. I explained to her that this indicated that she had directed her mind to a specific, narrow focus, almost like a tunnel, and had lost awareness of her surroundings. The practice I mentioned tends to lead us away from the reality of the present moment. To address her question of how to ensure the correctness of her practice, I explained that there's a clear distinction between practicing the Buddha's Dhamma and veering off the right path. To confirm that one is truly practicing the Buddha's teachings, I emphasized an acid test. The more we let go, abandon and release, the more the mind tends to find composure. As we shed the layers of attachment, and delve into the experience of exquisite mental balance, happiness naturally flourishes. Furthermore, with greater relinquishment, the mind becomes even more robust, solidifying the experience of jhana. In essence, the more willingly we let go, the deeper our practice becomes. It may appear counterintuitive, particularly for those engaged in concentration-type meditation. Often people assume that accumulating experiences will lead to richer and happier outcomes. However, this notion is misguided. Contrary to the belief that more experiences equate to better outcomes, the essence of Buddha's teachings revolves around letting go. The more we relinquish, shed and release, the more profound and exquisite our experience of happiness becomes. This is the genuine path that the Buddha illuminated. Such principles resonate with my own practice as well. So, I would like to conclude here. I tried to offer insights into various aspects of worldly activities and the struggles people face while attempting to overcome hindrances. I am no exception in this journey. I am also navigating this path. It would bring me great satisfaction if my experiences and explanations have been of assistance. If they prove helpful, it would be a successful use of my time and effort. I want to dedicate the merit of all the work and time I've invested to all beings who are suffering. May they come into direct contact with the good Dhamma and find liberation from their suffering. Chapter 15 Awakening from the Dream of Existence There comes a time, Vasetha, 
when sooner or later after a long period, this universe contracts. At a time of contraction, beings are mostly born in the Abhasara Brahma world, and there they dwell, mind-made, feeding on delight, self-luminous, moving through the air, glorious, and they stay like that for a very long time. But sooner or later, after a very long period, this universe begins to expand again. At a time of expansion, the beings from the Abhasara Brahma world, having passed away from there, are mostly reborn in this world. Here they dwell, mind-made, feeding on delight, self-luminous, moving through the air, glorious, and they stay like that for a very long time. Diga Nikaya, 27, Agana Sutta. An idea for this book arose as a project to collate all aspects of the path I had shared on the YouTube channel, Realization of the Unconditioned, in 2021. Then in 2023, some audience members requested an explanation of the first discourse by the Buddha, the Dhammachakapavatana Sutta. I considered it a great privilege to speak on such a profound topic. I began collecting notes on related Dhamma topics and terms to make the session more informative. Initially, I felt I might run out of words to explain this sutta, and it could end up being just a mere reading. However, I found that once I started talking, the words flowed effortlessly. They rushed to my mouth, transforming from potential thoughts to recorded talks and texts. It's amazing how two or three hours seem like nothing when I start explaining Dhamma. Here is what I shared on this topic. This discussion centers on the very first sutta that the Buddha delivered to the five ascetics who were his companions in the quest for awakening. This sutta is known as Dhammachakapavatana Sutta and is found in the Samyutta Nikaya, section 56, sutta 11. It is often referred to as setting the wheel of Dhamma in motion. This discourse delves into how the Buddha comprehended the truth of the cessation of suffering, including the origin, cause, cessation, and the means to cessation of suffering. It outlines the path of practice that leads to this cessation. Allow me to read the sutta and provide further insights. I will offer commentary to provide a deeper understanding and align the discourse with actual experiences and practices. Additionally, I'll draw insights from various other suttas to highlight specific points included in this discourse. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Baranasas in the deer park at Isipatana. There the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus of the group of five thus. Bhikkhus, these two extremes should not be followed by one who has gone forth into homelessness. What too? The pursuit of sensual happiness in sensual pleasures, which is low, vulgar, the way of worldlings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and the pursuit of self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, unbeneficial. Without veering towards either of these extremes, the Tathagata has awakened to the middle way, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. All right, let me pause here for a moment. The discourse addresses the fallacies of two extreme paths, excessive self-mortification and conversely, indulging excessively in sensual pleasures. These beliefs reflect the attitudes of many people today, often unaware of deeper truths. The Buddha addressed this in a sutta that discusses right view, shedding light on these matters. What is this right view, or rather, the vision of the middle way that the Buddha elaborates upon? In the Samyutta Nikaya, specifically in the Nidana Vaga, the Buddha offers many expositions related to the process of dependent origination. He explains that the Tathagata imparts the Dhamma through the middle way, avoiding the extremes of absolute existence and non-existence. The Buddha illustrates that the process of dependent origination involves many phenomena linked together through conditions. Ignorance as the condition gives rise to formations, formations as conditions give rise to consciousness, and consciousness as a condition to Nama Rupa. Similarly, Nama Rupa conditions the six sense bases, which in turn condition contact and so forth. This intricate web of interconnected conditions highlights the essence of the middle way, avoiding the extremes of absolute existence and non-existence. In essence, the Buddha says, the world is just a vibration of a multitude of phenomena that transcends notions like things being here, there, or not at all. So, what is this middle path, this middle way, that goes beyond ordinary worldly logic and reasoning, leading to full awakening? 
To provide a practical analogy, consider the Buddha's description of wisdom as being of a penetrative nature. Think of trying to see through a wooden plank or a door. This door or plank is densely opaque, rendering visibility impossible. In this scenario, the notion of penetration becomes essential. We must see through it by piercing through that thick wooden barrier to gain a clear vision beyond it. This is the understanding we require. We need to penetrate the obstacle to gain the ability to see. The wisdom that the Buddha described and revealed for us to realize ourselves is the knowledge and vision of the middle path. It enables us to see through such obstructions. This ability is referred to as penetrative wisdom, which is exactly what it is. The ability to see beyond these barriers. We need to let go of our concepts and fabrications and see things as they really are. So let's delve into what this penetrative wisdom truly means. The Buddha mentions penetrative wisdom many times, but who has actually made an effort to grasp its essence? Now let's attempt to comprehend this concept. Penetration, in this context, means understanding what obstructs our vision, much like a thick plank of wood that hinders our sight. This plank is so opaque that we cannot see through it. This is where penetrative wisdom comes in. It's akin to a drill at our disposal that bores holes through that obstacle, allowing us to see through the thick veil or door that was once entirely impenetrable. It opens up an aperture, enabling us to see through such barriers. So what exactly is this wisdom? This wisdom is about observing reality as it truly is. Our ordinary vision is clouded by ignorance, craving, and other distractions that prevent us from seeing reality in its unadulterated form. Penetrative wisdom allows us to truly see through the veil that ensnares us in darkness, or dare I say, in a state of blind vision. Thus, the wisdom we need to develop is the ability to discern the mechanisms that shroud our eyes in thick darkness, obstructing our vision. This darkness, this blinding force, is none other than what we refer to as the process of dependent origination. We are not seeing through the wisdom that illuminates how this intricate process unfolds. When we comprehend precisely how this process operates, we gain a tool to pierce through the formidable barriers that obstruct our ability to perceive things as they are. Once we understand how ignorance functions, how it leads to the origination of formations, how these formations give rise to consciousness, how consciousness begets Namarupa, and how Namarupa triggers the formation of the six sense bases, we begin to unveil the intricate interplay of these elements. The direct experiential is what the Buddha refers to here, not conceptual. He often brings up emptiness, insubstantiality, and the not-self nature of phenomena. When developing his path through experiences of jhanas, these facts become crystal clear. If we directly observe this process, it leads us to open a pathway that allows us to see through and penetrate the darkness that causes us to suffer repeatedly. When we talk about suffering, or the formula that the Buddha presents as the middle path, we are referring to the penetrative view of how things truly exist. Seeing things exactly as they are constitutes wisdom. In fact, the Buddha asserts that the noble way, awakened by a Tathagata, gives rise to the vision leading to Nibbana. This way is the noble eightfold path, which encompasses right view and right intention as the knowing aspect. Additionally, the path includes right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right collectedness. The first two factors contribute to panna or wisdom. Then we have three more factors, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. They belong to the category of sila or virtue, which pertains to righteous behavior, conduct, and morality. The third category is samadhi, which is collectedness or unification of the mind. Within this category, we find right effort, right mindfulness, and right collectedness culminating in a unified mind or sama samadhi in Pali. They guide us on how to train the mind in order to penetrate the nature of things as they truly are. In many suttas, the Buddha tells us to experience jhanas so we can see things in their true nature. This jhana or sama samadhi serves as a tool to see things as they truly exist. When we talk about seeing things as they really are, we are essentially unraveling the mechanisms of the mind itself. We don't necessarily need to explore the external world to gain a genuine understanding of reality. The Buddha's path is to unravel the projections that the mind crafts. What the Buddha is conveying here 
is that we need not focus our attention on external factors or what lies out there. The truth, the reality, is not to be found outside. It is an inner phenomenon. The reality doesn't exist externally. Rather, it resides within. The dynamics are such that external forms, sounds, and other sensory stimuli impact our senses from the outside. Conversely, within us, we possess internal sensory faculties, eyes, ears, skin, tongue, etc., which function as counterparts to the external sensory stimuli. Between these internal and external sensory elements, there exists an intermediary space where the concept of contact comes into play. So contact occurs as soon as any notion of things arises. It's observable that whenever there's a sensation or some form of perception, the impact of that sensation triggers the emergence of consciousness. This consciousness promptly distinguishes and categorizes whatever is perceived within our sensory domain as something external. It simultaneously acknowledges that what we are observing is originating from within. This consciousness is referred to as Vinana in Pali, and it serves as a discriminative element. Its function is to establish a demarcation. It designates the perceived entity as external, while confirming that what we perceive originates internally. This process leads to a separation of the senses and the material universe. Once consciousness emerges and executes this distinction, contact and feeling are solidified. There are many sutta references on how contacts arise on the six sense bases. The Buddha explains that when the eye encounters a form, an eye consciousness emerges, and the conjunction of these three, the eye, form, and its corresponding consciousness, leads to what is termed eye contact. Contact arises as a notion when the mind interprets sensory input, prompting consciousness to categorize the perceived object as external and recognizing it as being seen through our eyes. This interplay of phenomena is what is referred to as consciousness and nama rupa in the Buddha's teachings. The outgrowth of engaging with the phenomena is the five aggregates. There are many profound discourses by the Buddha on consciousness and nama rupa, but delving into their details is beyond the scope of this discussion. What I aim to focus on here is the noble wisdom that operates in the middle. For example, I mentioned that people recognize either what lies outside or what exists within, or they may perceive what is present and what is absent, yet they overlook the inherent nature of phenomena. The constant cycle of arising and ceasing. These cycles of arising and ceasing follow a unique and intricate pattern, forming the mechanism of the law of dependent origination. That's what the Buddha discovered on the night of his awakening. What he precisely saw that night was that during the first watch of the night, the Buddha observed the arising of all the phenomena that were leaning on each other. He witnessed how all phenomena arose when the mind was left unruly, allowing attention, also called manasikara or mind's work, to flow. He saw the play of mind through attention that got tamed, yoniso manasikara. This is what the Buddha recounts as his breakthrough on the night of his awakening. This is described in the Udana, in the Bodhivaga, specifically in the first sutta, called Pathamasambodhi Sutta. Here the Buddha says that he sat under the Bodhi tree for seven continuous days, experiencing the bliss of liberation. Then, at the end of those seven days, he emerged from that samadhi state and paid well-attentive heed during the first watch of the night to dependent arising in the forward order. With ignorance as the condition, he says, formations arise. With formations as the condition, consciousness arises. With consciousness as the condition, nama rupa arises. With nama rupa as the condition, the six sense bases arise. With the six sense bases as the condition, contact arises. With contact as the condition, feeling arises. With feeling as the condition, craving arises, and so on. On the first watch of the night, he observed the arising of the links of dependent origination. On the second watch of the night, he observed the cessation of the links of dependent origination. With the cessation of ignorance, he saw that formations also ceased. With the cessation of formations, he saw that consciousness ceased. With the cessation of consciousness, he saw that nama rupa ceased, and so on. Here, what is happening is that the links of dependent origination are just potentials with ignorance being the condition for all the other links, leading to their culmination in suffering instantly. He states that with birth as a condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, 
grief and despair arise. Therefore suffering arises due to this birth as a condition. All this suffering emerges due to living experiences. So if we scrutinize it closely, it becomes apparent that the cause of suffering is, in fact, ignorance. If we possess direct knowledge, full awareness and insight into the truth, and if we are not heedless, suffering doesn't have a chance to arise. This implies that by remaining fully mindful and discerning, suffering can be prevented. It can be said that ignorance is the root cause of all suffering. Ignorance of what? The process of dependent origination. This is the very realization that the Buddha attained. He spent countless lifetimes searching for the source of suffering, delving into various practices and enduring years of asceticism, all in an effort to fathom the reality behind suffering. Eventually, he directly saw this truth, and what we observe is that this insight led him to uncover the fundamental nature of existence. This sutta is actually explaining what constitutes suffering. So if I read a bit further, it goes on to say, Now this bhikkhus is the noble truth of suffering. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering, union with what is displeasing is suffering, separation from what is pleasing is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. In brief, the five aggregates subject to clinging are suffering. Here, the key point we need to be very clear about is that it's not stating that the five aggregates are suffering. Rather, it is referring to the five aggregates that we accumulate, inherit and take to be our possession. The Pali word is upadana. Pikku Bodhi uses clinging. It is the act of accumulating them that leads to suffering. There is a sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya that clearly distinguishes that the five aggregates are not suffering on their own. We have to have the notion of acquiring these five aggregates, and then they will become suffering. Now to read further, it goes on to say, Now this, Pikus, is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this craving which leads to renewed existence, accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there. That is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. So now the Buddha is saying, what is the origin of suffering here? He is saying craving. But when the Buddha, on the night of his awakening, saw how this suffering is all coming through, he saw the flow of suffering. What he saw was actually the source, the actual fuel of all suffering, is rooted in ignorance. So ignorance, or not seeing, is actually foremost in bringing all the suffering. What he's saying is that if we do not know what this suffering is or where it is coming from, the not knowing aspect actually comes first. That means because the Buddha himself was awakened to the truth of suffering, he was able to precisely pinpoint where the root of suffering is. In fact, what he's saying is that suffering is rooted in ignorance. So what do we mean by suffering is rooted in ignorance? It's basically saying that this ignorance is something that we have been in, like a veil. We are covered in a veil of darkness of ignorance for many, many years, lifetimes. I often say again and again, for countless mahakapas, trillions and quintillions of years. We don't know how many trillions of years or mahakapas we have spent here in samsara. It's incalculable. So what is sustaining this constant arising and ceasing is actually ignorance. We don't see things as they really are. It's like we know all of us have seen a fly or some insect stuck in front of clear glass. The insect doesn't know that there is a glass. It just keeps hitting that glass window again and again and again. That small creature will never be able to get out of that glass window and be free. It will always be trapped. This barrier is clear, but there is a substance that won't let it go outside. So this ignorance is like that. We think that the world is really like what we see around us, and it's like a clear glass that we look through, but we cannot get out. This ignorance is like the notion of how things are instead of seeing them as they really are. Being clueless and not able to get out and be free of confinements. It's like getting stuck in that room forever. This ignorance is like that. We don't know, though we pretend to do so. What the Buddha is showing is that there is a way out. We need to penetrate that barrier. And the way to penetrate that barrier is through the Noble Eightfold Path. What is the actual awakening, or what we call the penetration? We need to see this process as it really is. So there is no way we can be awakened to these four noble truths without understanding the mechanism. And what is the mechanism? The mechanism is the awakening to the process of dependent arising. 
and that's precisely what I read earlier in the first verse of the Bodhivaga in Udana. That's exactly how the Buddha was able to break through the veil of ignorance, penetrate it, and be free from it. He stated that the actual mechanism is that all we need to do is let go of that ignorance by stopping pretending or conceptualizing. Once we let go of ignorance, by abandoning notions and concepts and letting the process be, it will block formations. With formations ceased, consciousness ceases, and so on. This is the process. Dependent origination is the universal law, much like the law of gravity or the law of entropy. Although the foundation of physics is undergoing changes, and even concepts like the speed of light are under question now, there may not be any immutable laws in physics. But this law of dependent origination is indisputable law of our experience as it comes from the direct experience. We understand that one who observes the arising and ceasing of the links of dependent origination will awaken to the truth that whatever we have been dreaming or sleeping through, for trillions and trillions of years, we haven't even known that there is a way out of all this repeated aging and death, and all this sorrow and lamentation. These are actually all mind-made. They are all fabricated. This is what it all boils down to, according to the Buddha's discovery. We are our own worst enemy. We created this mess. Due to this mess, we are stuck in samsara forever, unable to escape its entanglements. Our experiences are constantly subject to arising and ceasing, and this cycle continues. As I mentioned, these links of dependent origination have the nature of arising and ceasing. In everyday life, we can observe this arising and ceasing everywhere. It doesn't require a very sharp mind or meditation to realize this. Even a small five-year-old child can understand that the body's feeling arises, pain arises, and after some time, with the application of cream or some remedy, it goes away. But there is something that needs to trigger our minds to awaken to this truth of arising and ceasing. I need to stress the point of Niroda here again. It actually means the prevention of phenomena from arising. Ceasing is what almost everybody uses, which can mean going down. Niroda is not going down. Niroda means prevention, meaning suffering can be prevented from arising. In a very rudimentary form, one can become sotapanna by simply understanding the fact that anything within our awareness that has the nature of arising due to conditions, by that very fact, can be prevented from arising. Take, for example, the body. The body arises, grows and decays. This is one cycle of arising and going down. Take feeling. It arises, grows and disappears. The same pattern applies to perception. It arises, grows and disappears. Formations arise and disappear. Consciousness arises and disappears. These five aggregates are in a constant cycle of arising and disappearing. But no one seemed to realize they arise due to some support. Our attention. So we need the Buddha to come to earth and enlighten us about the nature of these phenomena, that they do arise and cease. They have nothing at their core that can sustain them and keep them in a state of perpetual rising. There is nothing that can achieve that, not even physics, Einstein, NASA, or any other force. They cannot prevent atoms from decaying. No one has been able to achieve that. The fundamental fact is that anything that arises must also cease. This is the fundamental truth. What the Buddha says is different. He brings Niroda as a solution to arising and ceasing. Niroda means the prevention of phenomena from arising. Let go of cause, and Niroda is right there. That gives us a glimpse of awakening. I will elaborate on this point further later, as it illustrates how one can attain awakening to the fundamental level. Now let me read a bit further. We've covered the origin of suffering and the fact of suffering. The origination of suffering, as the Buddha explains, is due to craving. He states that the second noble truth, the origin of suffering, is rooted in craving. Craving leads to renewed existence, marked by delight and seeking satisfaction here and there. This includes craving for sensual pleasure, craving for continued existence, and craving for annihilation. The Buddha emphasizes that craving is the primary source of suffering, and it is through understanding and addressing this craving that we begin to enter the path. Yes, craving is indeed like a catalyst. It's comparable to a cocktail that infuses various flavors into the world. It's akin to a secret source that blends and presents us with these diverse experiences, each with its own unique colors. Here's what's occurring. 
All the phenomena that surround us consider, for instance, an average person in the worldly sense. Whenever such an individual encounters something visually pleasing, listens to delightful music, or savors the taste of delicious food, they swiftly become entwined in the sensations generated by the senses. This immediate reaction happens because the sensory experiences ignite a response within the mind, leading to the subsequent process of craving. Let's consider, for example, a beautiful car. When I see the car, as soon as my eye makes contact with it, here's what occurs. The notion of the eye and the form triggers the emergence of eye consciousness. Initially, consciousness arises, and then, with consciousness as a condition, the coming together of the three elements results in contact. Hence, contact happens between the eye and the car. Subsequently, with contact as a condition, a feeling arises. This feeling can manifest in one of three states. It might be pleasurable, painful, or neither painful nor pleasurable. So one of these three types of feelings immediately arises when consciousness starts to establish itself on a striking notion of something external. If one can identify these feelings and their distinctions, it sheds light on the interconnected process. If one is able to perceive the emergence of these feelings, what commonly happens is that the individual begins to categorize these experiences. There are three categories, pleasurable, painful, and neither painful nor pleasurable. Almost always, people instinctively place their experiences into one of these three categories. In approximately 99.999% of cases, a person will put the experience into the pleasurable category. For instance, upon seeing that car, the person's mind immediately associates it with pleasure, creating a mental connection between the two. As soon as the feeling arises, the process of identification commences. Once that feeling emerges, it starts to align with the predetermined categories. So what are these three categories? First, there is the feeling that is pleasurable. As soon as this feeling arises and is classified as pleasant, the corresponding craving for that object emerges instantly. This craving is like an arrow directed towards the amassing of sensual pleasure. The Buddha describes it as craving that leads to renewed existence, accompanied by both delight and lust here and there. When craving arises, it is swiftly followed by what we refer to as upadana, which means clinging or grasping. I don't find the term clinging very meaningful. We need a practical understanding of what this means in terms of our experience. Instead, we can consider it as an attitude for continuation. To elaborate, when we talk about upadana, it refers to our act of acquiring, possessing, or owning things. It's about accumulating. When craving arises, we have this upadana as a bonus, which gives rise to habits, or what we call existence. There isn't a direct piece of laboratory evidence to explain how we begin accumulating these five aggregates. The Buddha points out, they are stacked due to our engagement with phenomena. I've already mentioned earlier about these five aggregates and the notion of acquiring them. These two things are different. One is that the five aggregates on their own are not suffering. But as soon as we have the notion of acquiring those five aggregates, they become suffering. Assuming they are me or mine is a persistent delusion that sustains our ego beliefs. I mentioned this earlier, and there is already a detailed sutta about this. We acquire the body, feelings, perceptions, formations and consciousness into our portfolio and our personality. We renew them, nourish them and accumulate them. Although we lack a microscope or some tool to measure how many cells we acquire every millisecond or how many trillions of thoughts we accumulate in one second, these are the measurements we are used to in daily life. Unfortunately, we cannot perform this exact measurement. However, we can make some estimations. We do this all the time, and there is no refuting this. If we look deeply, we can easily confirm that this is the case. It cannot be otherwise. If we did not accumulate this body, if we did not grow ourselves through volition, attachment and craving, this body would die. Essentially, we keep this body alive through the constant notion of craving for existence and pleasure. In reality, we are fueling our existence by maintaining the body on a large scale, or even on a micro or nanosecond level, by providing the fuel for its renewal and growth. We don't need to check this in a laboratory or conduct biological testing in a university or research labs. We can easily be satisfied that this cannot be refuted, as we can observe and notice these processes occurring in our body. It's something that happens naturally. We fuel this process by consuming nourishing food. 
In a more obvious way, if there were no craving, we wouldn't eat or take care of our body. Craving is what sustains our lives. Craving gives us a fixation that this body is ours, and thus we feel the need to protect and care for it. We need to protect ourselves from enemies or even from our neighbors. People are becoming quite paranoid, feeling the need to protect themselves. This tendency can also go to extremes. This craving is truly universal, and that's the core of the matter. Our entire human experience is fueled by craving. In a gross form, this is what the Buddha is conveying. The origin of suffering is craving, wanting things to be a particular way. Moreover, when the Buddha became awakened on the night of his enlightenment, he saw that there is an underlying factor even for craving, and that's our ignorance or lack of understanding of the Four Noble Truths. This lack of understanding is the root cause of suffering and the impetus for knowing and seeing by oneself. So those are the two interpretations that I've derived from both the Sutta text and direct experience. This craving, as I mentioned, can manifest in various forms. It can take the shape of intense emotions such as anger, displeasure, and even paranoia, as well as intense lustful intentions. Gradually, these manifestations subside and become less reactive. Observing people's temperaments, we can notice variations. Some individuals tend to get overly excited, while others become easily angered or agitated. On the other hand, some individuals maintain a calm and composed demeanor. These reactions vary significantly depending on the individual. The amount of craving varies across individuals, influenced by their personalities. This is what we observe in our daily lives. However, craving can become much more subtle, and that's where the practice of Sama Samadhi comes into play. The Buddha's path follows a gradual approach, encompassing Sila, Samadhi, and Panna. Sila involves easing the mind and promoting non-regret and ease, leading to a reduction in impulsiveness. Imagine craving as a wave with different levels of intensity. For individuals prone to excitability or anger, their cravings' intensity will be much higher than those of more tranquil individuals. Among those who practice meditation and achieve samadhi, the magnitude of cravings diminishes significantly. This is where the essence lies, in taming the mind, taming the process of craving, and gradually letting go of it. Observing the mind devoid of all phenomena is panna. If we delve into the Buddha's description of jhana, he explains that a monk enters the first jhana when they are quite secluded from sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. This signifies the letting go of gross cravings and hindrances. These hindrances include sensual desire, ill will, restlessness, remorse, doubt, sloth, and torpor. These are the more overt manifestations of craving. Entering the first jhana initiates the state of samadhi, and this progression culminates in the fourth jhana, where samadhi is at its purest form. This process aids in releasing craving through pure awareness and mastery over the mind. This then brings us to the fourth truth, the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. Let me read the sutta again. Now this bhikkhus is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. It is this noble eightfold path that is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right collectedness. I did mention the division of the Noble Eightfold Path into three stages, Sila, Samadhi, and Panna. When we examine the sequence of the Eightfold Path, we'll notice that the Buddha places right view and right intention at the forefront. These two belong to the category of Noble Wisdom, Panna. Then there's right speech, right action, and right livelihood which fall under sila, virtuous conduct. Finally, there's right samadhi, comprising right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. The Buddha is essentially emphasizing that although the foundation of the noble eightfold path is virtuous conduct, denoted by sila, he positions right view and right intention, both belonging to panna, at the beginning. This placement raises a question, why is this arrangement significant? Upon closer examination, what the Buddha is implying is that before we embark on any practice, we must have a map. This principle parallels our daily lives. Even when traveling, we need a map to guide us. We can't simply hit the road and drive aimlessly. Similarly, the Noble Eightfold Path begins with a map, the right view. We must know our destination, our purpose. 
The right view offers this map, which is why it's an integral part of noble wisdom. This right view provides a clear overview of where we're headed. It serves as the compass, helping us understand the ultimate goal and the path's culmination. In essence, the right view ensures that we have a comprehensive perspective of our journey. Just as we might need to travel east to find the sunrise, the right view guides us toward our desired destination within the noble eightfold path. This right view is meant to convey that our practice is aimed at ending suffering. To achieve this, we must understand what suffering is. Without this understanding, there's no way to bring an end to it. Essentially, the right view emphasizes the need to comprehend the problem before solving it. This principle is fundamental. Attempting to resolve an issue without knowing it results in a range of problems. This underscores the truth that knowing the problem is essential for finding the solution. This is precisely the essence of the right view. It provides a far-sighted perspective. It ensures that as we tread the path, in a month or a few, we'll arrive at our destination, the cessation of perception and feeling. The right view acts like a map, guiding us toward the ultimate goal of the noble eightfold path, reaching the cessation of perception and feeling. It instructs us to aim for this destination, urging us that without understanding and acknowledging the need to reach this point, we cannot traverse the path effectively. It informs us that we must first release those gross hindrances. We must let go of these hindrances. After entering jhana, we release whatever rapture and sukha there is, that intense type of joy and pleasure emerging from a secluded mind free from hindrances. This indicates that the intensity of our craving has significantly diminished. However, this alone isn't sufficient. We must continue to progress. In the second jhana, that initial rapture and joy gradually fade, replaced by a degree of equanimity. The second jhana retains a sense of joy and happiness, a serene contentment arising from the abandonment of hindrances. The happiness of jhana is essentially quite unbelievable at first. When we inquire about the happiness that can arise from meditation, most people, around 99%, tend to be skeptical. They might question whether it's genuinely possible to attain such a profound, joyful and blissful state from within. People often find it hard to believe that such a pleasurable and joyful condition can actually arise through meditation. If we were to ask them whether they've experienced this happiness through their meditation practice, the majority may likely respond in the negative. This lack of awareness stems from a lack of understanding of how to properly practice and attain the pleasurable and joyful state that results from letting go of craving and releasing hindrances. What we are gradually accomplishing is a reduction of craving, step by step. Upon entering the first jhana, it can feel like an earthquake within our understanding, shaking our previous notion that attaining such an immensely pleasurable, happy and blissful state is even possible just by relinquishing our reactionary emotions. This experience is often met with skepticism, as people tend to rely solely on their immediate sensory perceptions and what their eyes can see. The idea that such profound experiences can emerge simply through the act of releasing these emotional reactions might seem far-fetched and unimaginable to many. However, this comprehensive path leads to the cessation of craving, marking a remarkable transformation. So the process of working with this system of craving involves letting go of it. We release the very evident manifestations of anger, displeasure and paranoia through the practice of adopting virtuous behavior. As people tend to become more virtuous, they naturally display increased kindness, helpfulness and compassion. This positive attitude then creates a conducive environment for experiencing the jhanas. Their state of mind tends to be happier as they have managed to shed the burdens of strong and rigid views along with personality traits that once held them back. Moreover, the Buddha emphasizes that the absence of regret serves as the precondition to achieving a composed mind. Such a mind, once attained, readily enters into the jhanas. The Buddha uses a compelling simile to illustrate this concept. It's found in the Samyutta Nikaya 1223, referred to as the Upanisa Sutta, proximate cause. In this sutta, the Buddha uses an analogy. A river originates from the first melting ice sheet in the Himalayas, which feeds into glaciers. These glaciers then flow into streams, collecting more water along the way, eventually forming rivers. Numerous rivers converge, ultimately filling the vast expanse of the ocean. 
Similarly, someone who cultivates generosity and virtuous behavior naturally progresses towards the ocean of Nibbana. This analogy provides a practical perspective on entering the jhanas, and the Noble Eightfold Path serves as a systematic approach to reaching the state of Nibbana. But the Noble Eightfold Path is not an exact translation. It's actually called Arya Atangiko Maga. Arya refers to the superhuman or superior, and Atangiko means eight parts or having eight constituents. It comprises eight distinct components, and we need all eight parts to have the complete path. So let's take the first part, right view, which makes up one-eighth of the entire noble eightfold path. Similarly, right intention or right thought forms the second part, and so on for all eight components of the noble eightfold path. That's the essence of Arya Atangiko Maga. It's important to note that Arya Atangiko Maga means something different than the commonly used noble eightfold path. What we need to understand is that all eight aspects must be equally present for this path to be successful. We cannot take away right speech, right action, and right livelihood, and only focus on the other five parts. It won't work, just like a car won't function if we remove two wheels, we must have all four wheels for it to work. The Noble Eightfold Path is similar, we can't disregard certain aspects thinking they don't matter. We can see that while practicing deep absorption or concentration without necessarily having a virtuous mind. If we neglect the full Eightfold Path, we won't be able to progress towards Nibbana. We know even within the Buddhist community, there are people who practice what is called the Kasina Meditation or other specific practices in a hierarchical manner. They may not fulfill all eight aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path, not comprehending that by concentrating solely on one object, they cannot fulfill all eight requirements of the Noble Path. It's crucial to understand these basics correctly. If we fail to grasp these fundamentals, the practice as a whole could become misguided. This is where the danger lies, and the Buddha emphasized this repeatedly. We can have the right view, but we can also have a wrong view. That means we will be on the wrong track from the start. As soon as we have the wrong view, it means we have completely missed the essence of the holy life. We become an outsider to this noble eightfold path. Therefore, we must possess the right view to enter this path. What exactly is this right view? It entails understanding suffering, comprehending the problem. We need to grasp the problem, recognize our intended destination, and understand what the cessation of suffering entails and to understand that suffering is due to taking as personal the process that is totally impersonal. This map of the right view serves as our guide to enter the Noble Eightfold Path. This is how I am describing this process. Now there are four different pillars. Let me pause for a moment now. There are certain aspects that need to be further understood in this sutta. The sutta now continues to delve into the four noble truths. Now let me read the additional aspect of the Buddha's awakening. Having covered the origin of suffering, which is the first truth, let's move on to the next part, where the Buddha expounds further. This is the noble truth of suffering. Thus, Pikus, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. This noble truth of suffering is to be fully understood. Thus, Bhikkhus, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. This noble truth of suffering has been fully understood. Thus, bhikkhus, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. These are the three frames of understanding of suffering. He divides the four noble truths into three sections. Basically, each of the four noble truths is further subdivided into three categories. The first is the seeing of suffering. The second is the complete understanding of suffering. And the third is the assertion of the full comprehension of suffering. So in essence, the first aspect involves identifying what suffering is. The second aspect emphasizes the necessity to fully comprehend suffering. And the third aspect confirms that suffering has been fully comprehended. That's the way it's presented. Then he proceeds to discuss the second noble truth. This is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. Thus, bhikkhus, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. This noble truth of the origin of suffering is to be abandoned. 
Thus, Picus, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. This noble truth of the origin of suffering has been abandoned. Thus, Picus, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. The second truth is the truth of craving. Yes, craving is the origin of suffering. Then there is a need for the origin of suffering to be abandoned, and the craving, which is the cause, has to be abandoned. The third truth is that the craving, or this origin of suffering, has been abandoned. So this involves understanding craving, the condition for the origin of craving to be abandoned, and whether it has been abandoned or not. Yes, he did abandon it. Then he proceeds to the third noble truth, which is Nibbana, understanding Nibbana, realizing Nibbana, and confirming whether it has been achieved or not. This is about comprehending whether we have realized it or not, and it serves as confirmation that we have indeed achieved it. The third one is the confirmation of the goal. The fourth is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the path for the cessation of suffering. Has it been comprehended, then developed? The confirmation that it has been developed is the third aspect of the fourth truth. So we have got the four truths times three. That's a total of twelve permutations. That's what the Buddha says. So long, bhikkhus, as my knowledge and vision of these four noble truths, as they really are in their three phases and twelve aspects, was not thoroughly purified in this way, I did not claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world, with its devas, mara, and brahma, in this generation with its ascetics and brahmins, its devas and humans. But when my knowledge and vision of these four noble truths, as they really are in their three phases and twelve aspects, was thoroughly purified in this way, then I claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas, mara and brahma, in this generation with its ascetics and brahmins, its devas and humans. The knowledge and vision arose in me. Unshakable is the liberation of my mind. This is my last birth. Now there is no more renewed existence. I cannot comprehend the experience of the Buddha's awakening experience, but I can infer it from my own experiences. What I understand is, this experience is the total and perfect convergence with reality. It's the state of mind where there is no overhead of processing. The mind is completely transparent. When we personally experience cessation, there arises a very strong conviction that this path is the only path. I can provide you with that assurance. When we start to follow the practice of meditation and the Noble Eightfold Path, this path will gradually lead to the cessation of what we call all formations, all inklings of divergence with reality. Formations, or the word Sankara, is a fundamental, very important term to understand. Formations are the immediate link next to ignorance. So, what are these formations called? Sankaras are the basis for all the other links including consciousness, nama-rupa, and all those sorts of things. Sankara, the Pali term itself, means san means together, and kara means making some action. So it means to lead to something. Sankara is referred to as preparation by some, while others like bhikkhu bodhi call it volitional formation. There is a varied connotation of this word sankara, including the interpretation by scholars like Rhys Davids, like habitual tendencies. Sankara is a very, very important term and phenomenon to understand. The Buddha's last words were on Sankaras, insisting us to be heedful of their fleeting nature. I've conducted some research on this, and I also have a video discussing Sankara with Delson Armstrong on YouTube. Sankara is closely related to karma, the notion of one's actions or deeds. What happens is that our actions can fall into three types, actions by body, speech, and mind. So we have what is called Vaki Sankara, which is the verbal formation, Kaya Sankara, which is the bodily formation, and Chitta Sankara, which is the mental formation. This noble eightfold path is, in fact, the gradual cessation of these three formations. This connection may not be immediately apparent in its definition. Where do we see this Sankara in the noble eightfold path? It may not be immediately obvious. However, upon analyzing the path further, its deeper meanings become clear. It starts with the development of virtuous behavior. If we look at it from the perspective of sila, which is virtuous behavior, it generally leads to a more peaceful mind disposition. 
When a person is virtuous, they are at ease and have mastery over their verbal formations. These verbal formations refer not just to speech, but also to our thoughts and intentions. Verbal formations influence our thinking process, making us more thoughtful, deliberate and considerate. As a result, we become less impulsive. This is a part of the sila in the Noble Eightfold Path. The verbal formations fall under the sila aspect. Let's say that when we practice the Noble Eightfold Path and we follow right speech, right action and right livelihood, it leads to a sense of calmness and inner peace. It also helps cultivate a more virtuous character, reducing intentions of harm and ill will. They lead to the pacification of verbal and bodily formations. This provides us with a solid foundation to enter into karma meditation states. Jhana When we practice jhana and enter the first level, our verbal formations, what we call thinking and examining thoughts, are still experienced. But we can directly see where valves are that allow them to flow to stop flowing. They will continue to exist in the sense that we may still have thoughts, although they will not be unwholesome. Thoughts involving lust, ill will or anger, for instance, will be completely absent in the first jhana as those hindrances have dissipated due to letting go. However, in the first jhana, our verbal formations, including subtle thoughts such as thinking and examining, will still be present. But the mind is in charge of their flows. In the second jhana, our verbal formations begin to subside. This means that our thought processes, analysis and planning start to diminish. This description of the Noble Eightfold Path is intended to illustrate the interrelationship between the path and the cessation of formations. If we examine the links of dependent origination, the ultimate disruptor of this process is the prevention of the building blocks of all formations from arising, or the cessation of perception and feeling. This cessation of mental formations marks the culmination of the Noble Eightfold Path, guiding us towards the attainment of Niroda Samapati. This achievement aids in our everyday life, shaping our attitudes and behaviors, and promoting calmness. Increasing such wholesome qualities leads us progressively through the higher jhanas, first to the second, then the third, and finally to the fourth jhana. In the fourth jhana, we experience the cessation of bodily formations. Any intention or urge to engage in physical actions essentially ceases. Some might mistakenly refer to this as the cessation of breathing, but that's not entirely accurate. Bodily formation also encompasses mental processes or subtle intentions related to bodily actions. Therefore, all formations essentially manifest as mental processes, intentions, or mental imagery. The fourth jhana does not stop us from breathing, inhaling, or exhaling physically. Instead, it brings a cessation to the mental processes that typically lead to bodily activities or intentions to engage in physical actions. We won't have the inclination or intention to perform gross bodily activities, such as scratching our back or making any other physical movements. Any intention related to subtle bodily activities will also diminish and cease. This distinction becomes clear with direct understanding of the fourth jhana. As we progress beyond the fourth jhana, we enter what are known as the formless realms, or ayatanas, including the infinite realm of the base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, and the base of neither perception nor non-perception. These formless realms further attenuate mental formations, particularly perception. In this transition, we release our attachment to the perception of the body, shifting our focus away from the physical and towards the subtleties of the mind. In this state, our perception of the body, along with perceptions of objects like houses, trees, cities, and even the earth, planets, and the solar system, ceases. We are left with a perception of the infinity of space within our mind. Over time, this perception gradually weakens, eventually leading to what is referred to as the descent to voidness. Gross perceptions begin to fade away. Initially, we let go of concepts of large objects such as cars and houses, then move on to smaller objects like chairs. We continue by relinquishing the concept of our own body. As this process unfolds, we find ourselves becoming aware only of the vast expanse of space. Eventually, even that awareness of space diminishes, leaving us with a pure awareness of sense consciousness. In this intimate experience, we observe how consciousness affects our sense doors. Various sensations arise as our eyes perceive and process visual input. 
our ears receive auditory signals, and our skin senses tactile information. These are packets of sense consciousness. With the fading away of all these grosser perceptions, a gradual fading process unfolds. Ultimately, we continue to let go. Letting go here means that we no longer identify any experiences hitting our awareness as being a part of ourselves or related to us in any way. The Buddha often urges us to consistently ask ourselves questions like, Is this me? Is this mine? Is this myself? We keep checking this at the level of awareness and realize that these experiences are not me, not mine, and not myself. We always recognize them as mere fleeting occurrences. Is it worthwhile to cling on to these fleeting moments? No, we simply let go. We acknowledge, this is not me, this is not mine. It's as if we naturally see the release happening. There's no true satisfaction to be found in these transient phenomena. When we experience the higher jhanas, any form of engagement becomes a burden, as it only weighs us down. We find joy in lightness, emptiness, and freedom from feelings. Consider this. When we travel with a heavy backpack under the scorching sun, and someone kindly shares the load, taking half off our shoulders, we feel immense relief and happiness due to the reduced burden. Similarly, in our meditation practice, as we progress from the first jhana to the second, our load becomes lighter. We feel more comfortable and happier because of the act of letting go. Letting go is not negative, it brings much more happiness than holding on to things. Unlike the distress that ordinary people may experience when losing possessions like cars, houses or property due to attachment. In this discipline, the Noble Eightfold Path, letting go progressively lightens our journey and path. That's why I say, when we let go of the first jhana, we release that particular rapture and pleasure of the jhana. In letting go of it, we experience an even higher and more sublime sense of peaceful experience. There's no need to lament losing that jhana, because by letting it go, we discover even greater happiness. Then we let go of the second jhana as well, reaching an even better, happier feeling. By continuing to let go, we ease our burden and become lighter. Our experiences become much more subtle, and we find greater happiness as we let go of these burdens. That's how it works in the Noble Eightfold Path. It progresses in this manner. To illustrate this, consider the Apollo Moon mission. The rocket is designed with six or seven stages, each with capsules and engines. At the very bottom are the heaviest and most powerful thrusters and fuel tanks. These counteract Earth's strong gravitational pull. As the rocket enters space, it uses this initial power to overcome gravity. Similarly, in our practice, we first let go of coarse worldly sensual pleasures. Once the lowest stage burns out, the rocket exits Earth's orbit and requires less fuel. In the second stage, it sheds the bottommost part no longer needed. This makes the rocket much lighter, allowing it to travel faster in space and use less fuel. Eventually, each stage burns off fuel, shedding the next stage, becoming even lighter and requiring less fuel. This progression continues until it reaches space. Once in space, we observe that gravity, previously necessary for support on Earth, completely disappears. In the emptiness of space, everything remains without needing external support. As the Buddha mentions in the Udana or other Buddhist teachings, for supported there is worry and anxiety because it relies on that support. But for unsupported, there is no anxiety, no burden. This is where Nibbana comes in. Nibbana is unsupported, unconditioned and undirected. It requires no support. It exists as a state without conditions. Ultimately, our aim is to reach a state where we are not bound by Earth's gravity, not dependent on it as an artificial form of support. It's important to realize that the absence of gravity in space doesn't mean falling into an endless abyss. In the vastness of space, gravity is unnecessary. There's no need for that support. Likewise, Nibbana can be understood similarly. We don't need to cling to false notions like gravity to stay in our chair or on our bed. Concepts such as beds, chairs, houses, or the shade of a tree. All these constructs will fade away in space. We won't need anything. They are all fabricated supports for dependent existence and will vanish when no longer needed. These are all burdens, factors that can lead to the arising of suffering. Maintaining and clinging to them only lead to more rejection, suffering, unhappiness, and pain. 
consider what it would be like not to have a body. While we often think having a body brings happiness, for 99.99% .99 of the time, it is a source of pain. It is the origin of all difficulties and discomforts. Recognizing that having this body is not always a source of happiness is crucial. Only those completely out of touch with reality take this body as a source of pleasure. The Buddha says this body is to be seen as a cancer, a disease, a tumor, a burden. There is nothing about this body to be happy or delighted about. Now, returning to the Sutta, let's examine its final parts. What the Buddha demonstrates is his experience of unshakable liberation of the mind. This is his final birth. There is no more renewed existence. Essentially, we let go of everything, the body, feelings, personal formations, and consciousness. This means the mind is fully liberated from all those fabrications, all layers of artificial constructs. Now, only the mind remains, free from all these burdens. It has reached the unconditioned state. This is why it is said no more, indicating that all concepts of birth, death, feeling, craving, and nama rupa have vanished. These are all fabrications. When we let go of associations and formations, everything ceases. What the Buddha realized was the cessation of birth, association, existence, craving, feeling, perception, consciousness, and ignorance. What remains is just the mind, fully liberated. There is nothing for it to latch onto. That's it. It's fully freed from all sides. This is what the Blessed One said, delighting the five monks. As this discourse was spoken, the Venerable Kondana, one of the five monks, dustless, freed, with stainless vision of the Dhamma arose. Whatever is subject to origination is all subject to cessation. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, having the dustless, dust-free, stainless vision of the Dhamma means that Kondana became a stream winner, a Sotapanna, just by understanding the fact that all that has an origin means that by that very nature, it can also be prevented from arising. We don't need to be in deep meditation to understand this or even be in a jhana. All we need to understand is that all these five aggregates are in a constant state of arising and ceasing. Because they arose, that means something caused them to arise. If the condition is let go, they stop immediately. We don't need to have that super mundane jhana or formless realm experience. We can see it in our daily life. So all we need to do is to have the right view that this experience of arising is suffering, and these arising and ceasing due to perceptions are of such a nature. Once we grasp this understanding with the right view, it means we are established on the path in the Dhamma. Let me read on further. And when the wheel of the Dhamma had been set in motion by the Blessed One, the earth-dwelling devas raised a cry. At Baranasu, in the deer park at Isipatana, this unsurpassed wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion by the Blessed One, which cannot be stopped by any ascetic or Brahmin or Deva or Mara or Brahma or by anyone in the world. Having heard the cry of the earth-dwelling Devas, the Devas of the realm of the four great kings raised a cry. At Baranas, this unsurpassed wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion by the Blessed One, which cannot be stopped by anyone in the world. Having heard the cry of the devas of the realm of the four great kings, the Tavatimsa devas, the Yama devas, the Tusita devas, the Nimanarat devas, the Paranimitavasavat devas, the devas of Brahma's company raised a cry. At Baranas, in the deer park at Isipatana, this unsurpassed wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion by the Blessed One, which cannot be stopped by any ascetic or Brahmin or deva or Mara, or Brahma, or by anyone in the world. Thus, at that moment, at that instant, at that second, the cry spread as far as the Brahma world, and this ten-thousand-fold world system shook, quaked, and trembled, and an immeasurable glorious radiance appeared in the world, surpassing the divine majesty of the Devas. Then the Blessed One uttered this inspired utterance. Kondanya has indeed understood. Kondanya has indeed understood. In this way, the Venerable Kondanya acquired the name Anya Kondanya, Kondanya who has understood. That's it, this is the end of the Sutta. It took us some time to elaborate a bit more on the various aspects, so I hope this has been fruitful. I don't want to take much more time. Thank you very much and have a great practice and a great day. Chapter 16
exploring the Buddha's Samatha Vipassana path. So indeed, these states, not having been, come into being, having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood, there is an escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Majima Nikaya, 111 Anupada Sutta. This work was created in response to a Dhamma friend named Anna. She reached out via my YouTube channel in response to one of those videos where I discussed my experience with the jhanas, the complete path from beginning to end. I previously covered this topic in another language, based on the Majima Nikaya 111 Anupada Sutta. Since I didn't cover it in English, there was a request for me to do so, prompting me to print out this sutta. Here, I will explain it step by step, as it happens for most twin practitioners, and I'm no exception. Now what exactly is this path? Do we truly understand what the Buddha's path entails and what it does not? This is something we must clarify. After conducting sufficient research, we discover various interpretations even within the Buddhist community regarding what constitutes the Buddha's path. This diversity of opinions, ideas and concepts can be bewildering. Many people express spending 10 to 20 years before finding practices that enable them to experience jhana relatively quickly. If we carefully read all the suttas, it becomes evident that the Buddha and all his disciples considered jhanas as a natural, effortless phenomenon. It's akin to clothing we wear every day, nothing particularly special or otherworldly about the jhanas. However, over time, the practices leading to the experience of jhanas, as described by the Buddha, have faded, and other practices have blended in, bringing different ideas and concepts that distort the path of jhana. Thus, it should not surprise us when people talk about jhanas in completely different ways. The path of jhanas taught by the Buddha has been elaborated in numerous places in the suttas. However, perhaps the most detailed description of the jhanas is found in Majjhima Nikaya 111. This sutta serves as a comprehensive reference for understanding what the jhanas truly entail according to the Buddha's teachings. It's crucial to be thorough and rigorous in learning meditation techniques that conform to the Buddha's way. Cross-referencing information across multiple suttas is essential. Even the Buddha employed cross-referencing methodology. If he described a specific experience in one sutta, he would often reference it, stating, I spoke this particular verse on this particular occasion, say in Atakatha, here is its meaning. In doing so, the Buddha referred to the section where he had shared that experience and then explained its significance before moving forward. This cross-referencing ensured a solid interlinking of his teachings, preventing practitioners from becoming isolated and blindly following a specific method without connecting it to other related practices. Therefore, it is important to read suttas discerningly and grasp the key messages of each. Then, cross-reference with other suttas to validate certain teachings, especially those of Buddhist teachers who advocate a one-pointed type of practice, focusing on a particular sign or nimitta. Teachers like Ajahn Brahm, when describing jhanas, follow the practice of allowing nimittas to arise in the mind. As one closes their eyes and intensely focuses the mind on a specific object, such as in-breathing and out-breathing. After sufficient practice, the mind gradually releases awareness of surroundings and begins to visualize a bright, disc-like object, which they call a nimitta. They assert that as this nimitta becomes stronger and brighter, one should release the breath as the meditation object, making the nimitta the primary focus. They describe a progression where one continues focusing on the nimitta, which starts to expand and contract. This adjustment of attention towards the nimitta is how they measure progress. So this is what I would say about absorption jhana. It may be termed conventional jhana in a sense that reflects what the majority of people think jhana is. However, this interpretation does not align with what the Buddha taught. He did not teach absorption. But how do we determine what the Buddha's practice of jhana truly is? For that, we need to synthesize teachings from multiple suttas. For a good foundation, I suggest reading Majjhima Nikaya 10, the Satipatthana Sutta. Here, the experience of jhanas is included, but the Buddha leads through the ultimate experience towards full awakening via the path of mindfulness, where jhanas serve as milestones. 
the four Satipatthana act as anchors for awareness to settle whenever it drifts. This framework guides our mindful observation, where we observe A. Body, B. Feeling, C. Mind and D. Mind objects. These four objects of attention strengthen our mindfulness. First by observing the nature of body awareness, then by observing the dependence of body and feeling that arises. Observing feeling naturally leads to observing the mind, the platform of awareness. The mind serves as a base, akin to the body base, where feelings arise dependent on the body. Feelings arise, and the mind in turn serves as another base dependent on these feelings, giving rise to mind objects. This interplay forms the framework of Satipatthana. Now where do jhanas fit within these four foundations of mindfulness? Jhana occupies a small part within the framework of Satipatthana. Which aspect does jhana pertain to? In the Buddha's teaching, jhana pertains specifically to the observation of feeling. Even within the observation of feeling, there are various categories. Worldly, joyful feelings, worldly, painful feelings, and worldly, neutral feelings. Worldly feelings are connected with bodily sensations and our reactions to them. Otherworldly pleasant feelings are the jhanas, arising when our reactions are relinquished. Otherworldly painful feelings include aversions and hindrances, subtle experiences of aversion even during meditation. Otherworldly neutral feelings represent non-reactivity, neutrality or equanimity. In contrast, worldly neutral feelings maintain some elements of reactivity, staying away from full awareness. Within the Satipatthana framework, jhanas occupy a small fraction. Therefore, jhana is somewhat embedded within the four foundations of mindfulness, not as the anchor of our attention, but as one part among many experiences within the broader framework of mindfulness. This clarifies that in the Buddha's path, the overarching process and framework for awakening is not solely focused on jhana. Jhana represents a supernormal experience indicating progress beyond worldly experiences, integrated within the overall framework of mindfulness. Understanding this perspective clarifies that one-pointed, nimitta-based jhanas and other highly focused practices do not fully align with the mindful awareness of experiences, whether worldly or otherworldly, painful or pleasurable. We remain mindful and aware without being bound or constrained by them. If we can understand this, then we are on the right track. It means the jhana that the Buddha taught is not closed. It's aware, open and completely mindful. So this understanding is crucial for entering into the right collectedness, sama samadhi, or right jhana. Otherwise, if we start following an approach not guided by mindfulness, we might enter the wrong door, possibly leading to a completely different destination. This could result in accumulating bhava, a tendency to be attached to rebirth in such experiences, but it will not lead to full awakening. I will elaborate on many experiences later. Some preliminaries. I generally like to follow a framework when conducting explorations. So I cover some preliminaries about the idea, the experience, and support them with explanations. I begin with background information and emphasize the importance of stepping back, reflecting, and then determining the right practice to follow. This is the preliminary I want to cover. Then, I will proceed with the beginning. What is the process now? The state of jhana, or whatever we call it, the eightfold path. Let's ponder a little. The suttas are very concise when it comes to definitions and experiences. They do not spend many words describing the state of jhana or expanding on its richness. There are numerous experiences and interactions within the mind that seem to show great richness within that experience. But the suttas do not delve deeply into jhanas. I can appreciate why the suttas do not elaborate much. They cannot encapsulate something that is so individualistic, more speculative than factual in terms of the Dhamma. For instance, if someone experiences blissful states, they might say, I had a very blissful experience. I was in a heavenly state where I saw a cloud, or I floated across. These are personal experiences. If such descriptions appeared in the suttas, it would lead to debates and discussions, as anyone could claim, your description doesn't align with my understanding. Therefore, many of these things remain somewhat speculative and purely personal experiences. They are influenced by a person's accumulated tendencies, inclinations, traditions, upbringing, and culture. These factors color perceptions, potentially distorting the experience of jhana. 
This is why the minor details of these experiences cannot be thoroughly explored. Even if someone says, I saw this particular thing in this jhana, they must be cautious not to overly describe the experience. While different personalities may add their own interpretations when experiencing jhana, there are certain hallmarks of each jhana that apply universally to all individuals who experience them. The Buddha and his disciples quote these jhana factors in the suttas, committing them to memory within a rigorous framework that upholds the qualities of the Dhamma. These are principles of Dhamma qualities. Therefore, concerning these personal experiences, the experiences of jhana, I would refrain from excessive description. Even if descriptions are provided, they should be treated as narratives. These narratives may be intriguing or somewhat foreign to us, but the fundamental truth lies in the conditionality, the dependent phenomena, our experiences, our interactions with them, and the mechanics of the mind. These are universal truths consistently experienced by all meditators. This is my analysis regarding these experiences and how we should ensure their reliability. We have every right to ask the question, what assures us that we are following the right path of the Buddha? In terms of preliminaries regarding the Buddha's path of entering the higher states of mind, moving beyond the cluttered mind affected by the five hindrances and the jhanas as experiences that can also be contaminated by these hindrances, the Buddha refers to them as barriers, confinements preventing us from entering higher states of mind. Let me cover a very interesting sutta first, called Incompetent Cook from Samyutta Nikaya 47.8. I will not read the full sutta, but I will share some excerpts. The Buddha says, Bhikkhus, suppose a foolish, incompetent, unskillful cook were to present a king or a royal minister with various kinds of curries. Sour, bitter, pungent, sweet, sharp, mild, salty, bland. That foolish, incompetent, unskillful cook does not pick up the sign of his own master's preference. Today this curry pleased my master, or he reached for this one, or he took a lot of this one, or he spoke in praise of this one, or the sour curry pleased my master today, or he reached for the sour one, or he took a lot of the sour one, or he spoke in praise of the sour one, or the bitter curry, or the pungent curry, or the sweet curry, or the sharp curry, or the mild curry, or the salty curry, or the bland curry pleased my master, or he spoke in praise of the bland one. That foolish, incompetent, unskillful cook does not gain gifts of clothing, wages and bonuses. For what reason? Because that foolish, incompetent, unskillful cook does not pick up the sign of his own master's preference. This is quite a typical example. We might have seen some sloppy cooks who just cook, but don't know the right timing, the right environment, or how to prepare. If someone doesn't know the right time to practice, the right environment to practice in, and the right preparation, then, no matter what we cook or prepare, it's not going to satisfy the objective. That's what the Buddha is saying. Even if we cook a dish, if someone is not hungry or doesn't like the taste, then, no matter how good the food we made is, it will not satisfy because we simply didn't find the right approach. The Buddha then mentions that here comes some foolish, incompetent, unskilled individual who dwells contemplating the body in the body ardently, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed covetousness and displeasure in regard to the world. While he dwells contemplating the body in the body, his mind does not become concentrated, his corruptions are not abandoned, he does not pick up that sign. Although some teachers are quick to say that the Buddha is referring to the sign as the nimitta, it's not really about the nimitta. That sign is the object for anchoring attention for bare mindfulness. It doesn't mean that it is a radiant glow that we need to focus on and be glued to. It simply means finding that state of mind where it is slightly settled and more at ease. Has the mind found the entry as soft and spacious awareness? That is the sign we need to observe. Has the mind started to roam around the terrain of the mind and is it agitated? Has the mind found that entry through an aperture or crack amidst blockers like obsessions, reactions, to enter that higher state of mind or not. Somebody can ruminate around aimlessly for hours, days or even years and not enter that state of mind because he didn't pick up the sign, that soft, open, spacious entry point to allow the mind to lean into. It's the same in a sitting session too. We can be meditating for many hours and still not be able to enter that higher state if we engage with experiences too much and try to force them. 
He dwells contemplating feelings in feelings, mind in mind, phenomena in phenomena, ardent, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed covetousness and displeasure in regard to the world. While he dwells contemplating phenomena in phenomena, his mind does not become concentrated, his corruptions are not abandoned, he does not pick up that sign. Samyutta Nikaya, 47.8, Incompetent Cook If I were to give an example, let's say we are going into some bush or forest. If we are not observant, it can be an aimless endeavor, spending many hours without identifying the spot. Maybe we can call it the sweet spot, or I call it the Goldilocks zone, or a zone where the mind is a bit more malleable, a bit softer, and we need to find that entry. When we are practicing, our mind wobbles, and our mind is constantly searching. Now, we need to take a step back and observe where the mind is trying to settle. It wobbles a little bit, and if we take a step back, the mind will gradually settle, and it will start to settle into a dip. There is a depth in the mind where if we rest in that particular state, it becomes pure, very relaxed, at ease and calm. That's where we allow the mind to plunge, but keeping a watchful eye to see what it's doing. So that is the entry to the higher state of mind, and that's what we call a mind devoid of all confusion, hindrances, and what we call the jhanas. Therefore, observing the state of mind where the mind takes a step back, lets itself calm, finds its equilibrium, and allows itself to rest and dive into that state of tranquility, calmness, and inner happiness. That's how we need to progress in this practice, not through exertion. It's not about putting too much force into trying to evoke that experience. That would be like putting too much gas in a car, risking a crash. We need a smooth ride, making maneuvers to ensure it perfectly aligns with the reality of the present moment. So our maneuver is to back off. If the mind is heading in the right direction, back off without exerting too much effort. If the mind becomes sluggish and is already taking a back seat, nudge it a little to ensure progress. This is a practical example that we are all accustomed to, like driving in a picturesque village or countryside. It can be as enjoyable as that, so if we are practicing meditation, following the path of mindfulness, being fully aware, then following the path closely is the right approach. For example, someone practicing one-pointed concentration is heading in one direction without even being aware of what is happening in the surroundings. This could lead to incidents like imbalance of mind and those who persist in this approach may remain trapped in that condition for a long time. This is the real situation. We need to assess the present moment, the situation, and make the right effort. What does that mean? We practice, and today we manage to achieve a very good and peaceful, higher state of jhana. But the same approach may not work tomorrow because, like human beings, tastes can change. Just as someone might not fancy a spicy dish one day and prefers plain food without spices the next, the mind may become completely unsettled if we follow the same approach tomorrow, spending hours without entering the jhanas. Therefore, tomorrow again, we need to observe what the mind is doing. Is it too agitated, too relaxed, too lethargic, or too restless? Then we adjust our effort accordingly, or take a step back. This means at each practice, at each step, we need to conduct such an assessment, a reality check as it were. This is what the Buddha is advising. Don't blindly enter a state and expect to reach a higher state of mind. We need to consciously assess the present moment. There is a book by Ajahn Brahm titled The Art of Disappearing. Brahm, 2011. In it, he describes some experiences that are not supported by the suttas, or they are in concordance with the suttas. I'm not saying that Ajahn Brahm is wrong or right, but we can test his approach against the instructions in the suttas. Here's a small excerpt from his book. When the body disappears, you experience stillness deep inside. It's a jhana state. In this jhana state, you are disengaged from the outside world. The five senses have vanished. Sometimes, this state is described as being aloof from the world of the five senses. In fact, it goes beyond aloofness. It is complete disengagement, the complete ending of the world. Once you start to taste the stillness in the mind, it becomes terribly addictive. And that's a good thing, because the mind's addiction to stillness is what drives you deeper towards nibbana. The Buddha actually said that attachment to deep meditation can only lead to the stage of enlightenment. He quotes Digha Nikaya 29, the Pasadika Sutta, 
and mentions that we don't need to be concerned or worried about the addiction to letting go. It is part of the pleasure, joy and freedom of the mind of monastics. It is an addiction that leads to more and more fading away and letting go. The peace of Nibbana increases and pulls us away from the world. Okay, I think I would neither completely disagree nor completely agree with these few words. First of all, what I want to clarify is that jhana does not entail complete disengagement from the external world. In the Buddha's jhanas, the five senses do not vanish as Ajahn Brahm suggests. They arise, stay, and cease, if they were to disappear completely, as he claims. Shutting down, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling, then we would be left only with the nimitta. However, this contradicts what the Buddha taught in the Satipatthana Sutta and other suttas describing jhanas. According to the Buddha, we observe the body as simply the body, feelings as feelings, and the mind as the mind. The existence of the body, eye, ear, taste, touch, these are all aspects of the body and the five senses. In any jhana, according to the Buddha's teachings, awareness of the body remains present in our consciousness. These senses arise because external phenomena make contact with internal sense bases. Consciousness arises dependent on these internal and external sense bases. When consciousness and these sense bases meet, contact arises, and from that contact, feelings arise. If we were to not perceive the feeling of the eye or the hearing of the ear, it would mean we are shutting out all these phenomena. These phenomena are crucial aspects of the noble truths. The arising of phenomena, the cessation of phenomena, and the path leading to the cessation of phenomena and complete cessation itself. It is essential to observe their arising and ceasing. If we merely shut them out, if we close the door to them, then we are already outside the domain of the Four Noble Truths. Therefore, it is crucial to understand in practice what leads to such aloofness. If it is mere aloofness, where there is awareness but complete isolation, this is not what the Buddha taught. We must be absolutely clear that in the Buddha's path, it involves letting all phenomena be as they are and knowing them. They arise, remain, and cease. What the Buddha teaches is not to engage too much or interfere with this process. Instead, we should let it flow naturally. Let phenomena arise and cease. Let them impact our awareness. Let them make contact with our senses. What is crucial is our independence to observe their arising, to let them be, and to naturally subside on their own. As soon as we begin to push them away, suppress them, or close the door on them, we fail to see how the mind operates. We fail to see the fundamental process of observing conditioned phenomena. Conditionality, what is that conditionality? It involves sense bases, sense contact, and the phenomena that arise dependent on them. This is the heart of the Four Noble Truths, and seeing this is awakening. Entering a deep jhana state and detaching from all five senses does not lead to insight into the arising and ceasing of suffering. If we do not understand the arising and ceasing of suffering, how can we understand the Four Noble Truths? And if we do not understand the Four Noble Truths, how can we attain awakening? There are elements of truth in Ajahn Brahm's practice, but it prematurely enters a state without discerning the ultimate goal of the practice. It focuses on seeking bliss. Ajahn Brahm seems to suggest that once you find the bliss of jhana, you should become attached to that bliss and disregard everything else. However, this contradicts what the Buddha taught in countless suttas. Let's be absolutely clear, staying in the jhanas for as long as possible is not the objective of awakening. We must understand the terrain of the jhanas, the profile of the jhana states, and recognize their unsatisfactory nature. We need to observe how the jhanas settle and explore their various realities. Being observant and skilled in understanding the terrain of these jhanas will mature our insight, leading to what the Buddha describes as disenchantment with the process. Without these three steps, disenchantment, dispassion and cessation, we cannot attain nibbana. So where do we find this element of disenchantment? Where is the element of dispassion? Where is the element of cessation? The book The Art of Disappearing seems to focus more on being addicted to the jhanas, immersed in the bliss of jhana. However, this contradicts what the Buddha taught in Sutta Digha Nikaya 29. In that passage, the Buddha acknowledges that his disciples dwell in the bliss of jhanas, but as a temporary abiding, not as a permanent refuge. 
some teachers misunderstand jhanas as a significant achievement. By becoming absorbed in jhana, we cannot experience nibbana. We need to awaken. We need to recognize when our mind is struck by the lightning thunderbolt of the Dhamma, shaking our perspectives on the nature of phenomena. Understanding this process, this lightning strike will awaken us. This leads to full awakening, the realization that the mind breaks free from entanglement with all kinds of phenomena. When the mind is completely disentangled, we are no longer caught in the cycle of phenomena, including suffering and death. Previously, we were identified with and immersed in these phenomena. Now, as the Buddha says, the mind and phenomena are like a snake and its worn-out skin. They simply fall apart. They are completely disentangled, never to be bound together again. This is the freedom of awakening, never again subject to rebirth, redeath, or any form of repetition. If we can understand this process, then everything I explain later will hopefully make sense. The Four Jhanas Majima Nikaya, 111. Thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savath in Jeta's Grove, Anathapindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus. Venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, Saraputta is wise, Saraputta has great wisdom, Saraputta has wide wisdom, Saraputta has joyous wisdom, Saraputta has quick wisdom, Saraputta has keen wisdom. Sariputta has penetrative wisdom. During half a month, because Sariputta gained insight into states one by one as they occurred. So this sutta asserts right from the beginning that nothing escaped the mindfulness of Sariputta. His mind was so sharp that every phenomenon, or what we call the mind object, state, did not elude his scrutiny. With razor-sharp awareness, he could discern even the minutest details of his experiences. Generally, we are accustomed to categorizing things into experiences like indifference, pleasure, or pain. When the mind is fortified with wisdom, awareness of phenomena becomes very clear as it is no longer bound to or absorbed in these phenomena. The state of mind is such that it remains open to all experiences, unaffected by them and free from reactions. With such a mind, one can closely observe any jhana and its components, such as joy, energy, equanimity, and mindfulness. This is what the Sutta conveys, that Sariputta was able to analyze these components at an atomic level. That's why the Buddha declares Sariputta as foremost in wisdom. Then the Buddha continues, Here bhikkhus, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. The first jhana represents a state of temporary freedom from hindrances while refraining from indulging in sensual pleasures. The rapture and pleasure experienced in jhanas differ significantly from sensual pleasures. In Majjhima Nikaya 10 Satipatthana Sutta, it describes this joy of jhana as unworldly, niramisam sukham. Many Buddhist practices completely ignore this point, saying the Satipatthana Sutta does not mention jhana at all. But the term niramisam sukham means the jhanas is made very clear in. And what bhikkhus is unworldly happiness, niramisam sukham. Here, bhikkhus, secluded from sensual pleasures, a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the first jhana, the second jhana. With the fading away as well of rapture, he dwells equanimous and, mindful and clearly comprehending, he experiences happiness with the body. He enters and dwells in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, he is equanimous, mindful, one who dwells happily. This is called unworldly happiness. Samyutta Nikaya, 3631, unworldly, Niramisa Sutta. So if we don't clearly understand this experience, how can we know how to enter and abide in that state? That's why entering into jhana is a deliberate practice and investigation of the terrain. When I first started practicing, entering into the jhanas was less stable here and there. So I liken this experience to learning any new skill that we are just beginning to master. For example, we might not know how to drive a car. Without knowing how to operate it, we cannot make even a small journey. As we learn, we might struggle with pressing the gas too hard, forgetting to press the clutch, or failing to hit the brake when the car speeds up. All these controls and knobs are there to help us navigate smoothly and stay on the highway of the jhanas. 
we need to start with easy roads. We all begin in a state of confusion. What makes it confusing is that we are so accustomed to indulging in sense pleasures. Listening to music, eating food, and entertaining sensual thoughts and plans. These distractions pull the mind in all directions, making it difficult to find internal composure. That's what jhana is. It's the mind finding composure to remain in a state where it can let go of confusion and diversity, arriving at a steadier state of mind. We start by gently letting go of all sense attractions. We allow them to settle naturally. We neither try to forget them nor suppress them. We simply let them be. Our attention then focuses on the wholesome mind that arises from letting go of hindrances. The best and quickest way to attain the higher state of jhana is to guide the mind towards something wholesome, as in right effort. We let go of unwholesome things and sense pleasures. By not paying attention to them, we naturally see these unwholesome states fade away. Instead, we direct our attention towards something wholesome. What is a wholesome state that we can cultivate and devote more time to? We allow the mind to dwell more on qualities like loving kindness or the antidote of ill will. This is the essence of the practice that we follow. Personally, I haven't practiced mindfulness of breathing extensively. I've only done many short sessions on it. However, after not seeing benefits even after many years, I've been practicing mindfulness of loving kindness. In this practice, we begin by generating warm feelings of loving kindness towards ourselves for 10-15 minutes. We sincerely wish for our own happiness and well-being, mentally saying things like, May I be extremely kind, generous, patient, compassionate towards all beings. May I be a good human being, a good father, a good son, and so on. If we start to bring these thoughts gently into our primary focus and pay full attention to feeling of these loving and kind thoughts, whenever distractions arise and pull our attention away from the feeling of loving kindness, we don't suppress them or force them away. When distractions arise, we let them be. We release our attention from unwholesome thoughts, ideas or distractions. We drop them, let them go. We simply observe whatever arises without getting carried away or upset. We accept the reality of our mind's engagement and recognize that such interactions may bring a slight unease within the mind and body. We may not initially notice that unease. That's why we need to release our attention without trying to investigate. Once we've done that, once we've pulled the string out, we've already lessened its impact. Then we need to relax the mind and body. Relaxing the mind and body means letting them settle by doing nothing. We know that simply letting the mind and body be as they are, without exerting any effort, brings ease. Just relax any tension and tightness in our body and mind by loosening the grip of any muscles and corners of the body. Calm down, relax, and observe an open and spacious mind like a clear blue sky. This invigorates the mind, adding freshness to it. After recognizing, releasing, and relaxing, we bring a gentle smile to our mind and heart. This is quite important because smiling is a practice that keeps us from taking everything personally. Our minds tend to gravitate towards seriousness and becoming overly attached, concerned, and worrying unnecessarily about things. So smiling brings a sense of ease and alleviates stages of sadness and gloom in the mind. It blossoms the mind, preventing it from sinking into negativity. Smiling is crucial to prevent the mind from becoming mired in negativity. As Bhante Vimalaramsi used to say, smiling is vital to uplift our mind to a wholesome and sublime state. Recognize the unwholesome state, release our attention, relax our mind and body, and then smile to return to a mind of loving kindness, compassion, generosity, and gratitude. After smiling, we need to return to our meditation object, which could be wishes such as, may I be a great human being, a good teacher, husband, father, or an extremely generous supporter of charitable organizations. Bringing up these wholesome qualities increases our mind's attention towards the bright parts, reducing the dark parts by not paying attention to them. That's the core of the Buddha's teachings. Thus, the effect of these two activities, allowing distractions to be without interfering or engaging with them, and cultivating a wholesome state, can lead to the fastest progress in entering jhana, at least in my experience. It didn't take me more than two or three days to enter into a jhana. Some very smart and skilled meditators can achieve the first or second stage of awakening in just a matter of days. 
While I may not be one of them, I find satisfaction in my ability to experience jhana in a short period. As the Buddha emphasizes, we attain this state by secluding ourselves, not paying attention to unwholesome sensual thoughts and ill will. The five hindrances. We're not practicing to build walls, instead we're building bridges and allowing these states to come in. As the Buddha says, phenomena are just potentials. They arise due to attention, manasikara. By not paying attention to them, they naturally fade away. Our strategy is not to suppress them, but to allow them to arise and fade away by themselves. This approach stands in strong contrast to other practitioners who focus on the nimitta, suppress the five senses, and immerse themselves in bliss, locking themselves into that state for extended periods. So, we are not part of a group that gets locked into the bliss of a jhana state. Even if a jhana arises, we understand it's just a small part of the bigger picture, sitting in a corner. In this jhana, there is open awareness, the body and mind are happy, and we can experience all surroundings while still being aware of the jhana. However, we are not bound to it. Instead, we pay attention not to the jhana experience itself, but to cultivating a mind of loving-kindness. We continue to nurture loving-kindness for ourselves or our spiritual friend, thereby increasing the state of wholesome mind and abandoning the unwholesome state by letting go. We let the jhana be as it is, keeping it in the background without interfering or becoming involved. The jhana will persist for as long as it wants to, and there's no need to worry about its appearance or disappearance. Just allow it to come and go naturally. By letting it be and letting it go, we contribute to its stability. Therefore, those jhanas will become stronger, more stable, more sublime, and more exquisite if we allow them to be. We simply let them do as they please, and our experience of happiness will grow and intensify. That's why we say don't worry about when these experiences arise. Don't try to grasp them. Just let them be, and they will become even more sublime. Now let me read more. And the states in the first jhana, the applied thought, the sustained thought, the rapture, the pleasure, and the unification of mind. The contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind. The zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus. So indeed, these states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood there is an escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Okay, I mean, I've read quite a few things here, so there is so much richness in jhana when one is open. If we experience a jhana by suppressing all the hindrances and the five senses, we will not gain these insights. We will not be able to perceive the contact. We will not discern the arising of feeling. We will not understand perception, formation, and mind. Those five aggregates. Sariputta saw that. He observed the phenomena of dependent origination in a basic form. So what he's saying is that he observed, in the first jhana, the applied thought and sustained thought and all phenomena. What happens is, when we let the mind focus on some wholesome state and let go of unwholesome states, our practice supports the wholesome. This cultivation of the wholesome and the abandonment of the unwholesome synergize the mind. If we can sustain this effort beyond just one or two minutes, then we can unlock the jhana experience. Our usual states of mind and interactions typically don't allow us to stay with wholesome thoughts or intentions even for one second. They become very fragile and fleeting. If we can manage to sustain our wholesome thoughts for about a minute, the Buddha says it's not devoid of jhana, as in Anguttara Nikaya. If we can maintain our mindfulness of loving-kindness for one minute, guaranteed, we will enter jhana. That one minute is significant, but our normal mind is very weak and it can be influenced by many storms of thoughts and emotions. Our mind is really weak in the beginning, and if we can sustain focus on a wholesome object for even 10 or 15 seconds, then we have begun to strengthen our mind. Then gradually, instead of diverging, the mind starts to unify. It gravitates towards centering around loving-kindness. The mind starts to become integrated, 
and it no longer scatters to eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind objects and thoughts. All those tendencies diminish, and the mind begins to settle on one wholesome thought, unrelenting loving-kindness. It begins to consolidate these aspects, making the mind more radiant, open, and less scattered. This is what is meant by the unification of mind. When we observe that the mind is gradually entering this unified state, then we notice it has fewer distractions and is in a pure, wholesome state. Due to this purity, the Buddha referred to sense pleasures as base or filthy pleasures. We notice that if we simply allow the mind to relax, without expending too much energy in trying to suppress those hindrances, remaining calm and composed, we start to see that our attention becomes sharper. Feelings arise based on conditions, and there's no need to worry about what those conditions are. Feelings arise due to contact, and that's all we need to know. Contact is the trigger that sparks feeling, and we recognize that it's due to contact. So when we experience that feeling and notice that it persists, and there's a slightly prolonged experience of that feeling, we understand that not only is there a feeling, but there is also a somewhat sustained experience of that feeling. Whenever there is a feeling, tied to that feeling is an associated experience, which is perception. Perception and formations are our inclinations to generate kama, or karma in Sanskrit. This is why even experiencing jhana with an attitude of inclination and identification can generate kama, which can sustain dependent origination. Also, let's say we hear a sound. There's a sound and we have an inclination to act upon it. That's the formation. Whether we decide to listen to the sound, continue listening a bit longer, or perhaps ignore it, or even shut the door. These are intentions tied to our feelings. We can observe that our mind and body are always geared towards doing something, responding to every event. That inclination is what formation is. All the activities we are inclined to engage in, intention fuels formation, and then we begin to pay attention to what comes next. That's where attention, me, is involved. I heard the sound. Now I need to do something. We pay attention to that and then plan. This is how we understand phenomena at work, seeing the accumulation of the five aggregates due to dependent origination being sustained. We shouldn't treat them as mystical or mysterious events completely outside our daily experience. They are very simple experiences, yet profound. The Buddha states that the scale and extent of these phenomena cover the entire spectrum of our experience. Whether it's the tiniest micro-events or the grand scale of cosmic explosions, like the Big Bang and trillions of eons and cosmic cycles. They all fall under phenomena in the mind, the interactions between mind and body, what we call the five aggregates or the links of dependent origination, the law of conditionality. These experiences do occur on both micro and macro scales, from billions of light years to nanoseconds, down to the Planck time, which is around 10 to 44 second. If we were to be scientific, that's why dependent origination is the secret of the universe. If we've directly seen this process, being aware of this mechanism is what awakens us. We've fully exposed the show, seen the process, and disentangled from it, never to be ensnared again. Awakening means breaking bonds, unbinding from identification. That's what stream entry is about, becoming an Arya or an outsider of the samsaric chain. Stream entry, sotapanna, is that tiny opening amidst confinement as we've entered the flow of Dhamma. We've detached from the samsaric journey as some teachers describe it as taking a slow boat out of samsara. The experience of awakening doesn't need to be profound or incomprehensible. The descriptions can be simplified. All we need to understand is that these phenomena depend on us. We fuel them, nourish them through our attention and engagement. The entire teaching of the Buddha is about disassociation, freedom and independence from this flow. Once we've taken a step back, become disassociated, insights arise. That's the experience. Sariputta clearly saw the five aggregates and all the jhana factors. So what are the jhana factors? They vary, e.g. pity rapture and pleasure for the first and second jhana, while sukha for the third. Now the jhana factors are accompanied by zeal, decision energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. In any jhana, zeal is present, a sense of keen interest. Decision means we commit to continue practicing or step out at will. 
Because of zeal and decision, we invest our time in that wholesome state, automatically gaining energy. We become free from sluggishness temporarily. In the jhana state, sluggishness dissipates. Our mind becomes energized with sharper mindfulness. We hear and perceive things more clearly, heightening our awareness even further. Our mind remains steady, with equanimity, not reacting outwardly or inwardly. It's balanced in the middle, staying in equilibrium. That's equanimity, encompassing all the jhana factors. Our attention remains unwavering, so we stay with our meditation object comfortably and effortlessly, without requiring much effort. Our awareness becomes stronger. That's all. Sariputta could see all of this clearly, and I would say that is spot on. When we begin practicing, we don't need to worry about identifying each factor specifically. We simply recognize that these states exist. What we clearly notice are the rapture and pleasure that arise from seclusion. That's all we observe. When these states arise for the first time, it can be mind-blowing. It's because we are accustomed to being in a confused state of mind, restless and filled with worldly expectations. We never imagined that the mind could enter such an otherworldly state. How could such a transformation occur from the same mind that was so agitated just a few moments ago? It's astonishing. When I first experienced this, it was truly revelatory. I realized that even I could achieve this. Then I developed a strong conviction in the suttas, understanding them experientially. What the Buddha is describing is simply a process. He's showing how the mind operates. There's nothing mysterious about these jhana states. They arise as naturally as letting go of the unwholesome and cultivating the wholesome. It's easy to be swept away by these simple teachings, which is what I believe the Buddha conveyed in all his teachings. However, I didn't fully grasp this before. People often find it easy to dismiss these experiences. Simply letting go of the unwholesome and cultivating a wholesome state can lead to such a sublime experience. Living harmoniously is the foundation of all jhana practices. The key lies in sustaining wholesome thoughts for a short period. Those few minutes make all the difference between worldly states and jhana. Again, bhikkhus. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, Sariputta entered and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. So in the second jhana, our practice revolves around letting go of the unwholesome and cultivating the wholesome, repeating this process continuously. By doing so, we naturally abandon coarser experiences, moving towards what I call the global optimum. In science, physics, or mathematics, we encounter concepts like local and global optima. Nibbana represents our global optimum, where all states converge, while the jhanas are local optima. With ease, we observe the deepening experiences of the mind as it goes deeper and deeper. Transitioning from a confused worldly state to various jhana states through the same practice is all that's required. Just let go of the unwholesome, cultivate the wholesome. Repeat, this is the Buddha's path, a straightforward recipe. Our task is to practice diligently. This will naturally propel us from the first jhana to the second, from the second to the third, and so forth. It's all about practicing consistently. There's no need to alter our approach when transitioning from one jhana to the next. It's a rinse and repeat process. However, magically, the experience evolves from the first jhana to the second and beyond. There's no need for adjustments in our practice. When the mind settles into a state of ease and comfort, our focus should be on letting go of anything that causes discomfort in the mind and body. This means relaxing. If verbalizing our thoughts makes us uncomfortable, let go of verbalization. In the next stage, if overthinking causes discomfort, let go of excessive thinking and simply abide in the feeling, and so on. So the fundamental rule in this process is simple. Continue with anything that brings comfort to our mind and body. Let go of anything that causes discomfort. That's the key. In the second jhana, which the Buddha describes as having qualities like self-confidence and singleness of mind, without applying sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Previously, even with applied and sustained thought, we had to exert effort. We engaged in verbalization and expended energy, which now needs to be released. This means letting go of any subtle verbalizations. For instance, instead of saying, may I be a kind human being, simply bring to mind qualities like kindness, composure, 
happiness, generosity, bliss, ease, and compassion. Just a momentary thought, not the entire thought process. This will alleviate discomfort and tension in the mind, leading us into the second jhana. In the second jhana, since we've abandoned applied and sustained thought, there's no need to verbalize phrases like, may I be happy. Just let go of that intentional layer and focus on the feeling alone. Stay with that feeling. Self-confidence is a distinct factor in the second jhana. So what is self-confidence in the second jhana? It's the conviction, the reassurance that I'm on the right path. There's no need to worry. If we experience doubt or lack confidence in any situation, dwelling in the second jhana provides a balanced mind. Spending even half an hour in the second jhana when feeling uncertain or anxious in the present moment can dispel worries, anxiety, and mental unrest. We become composed, and our confidence grows. Self-confidence in the second jhana means having the conviction that everything is okay, and there's no need for concern. That's a characteristic of the second jhana. Other factors in the second jhana include rapture, pleasure, and the unification of mind. As mentioned earlier, while the first jhana features rapture and pleasure, the second jhana emphasizes greater unification of mind and self-confidence. Our mental stability increases, excitement diminishes slightly, and peace and tranquility prevail. In the second jhana, we experience less excitement but more composure, a finer state of mind. Therefore, the second jhana is somewhat more peaceful and composed, with reduced excitement and heightened composure. Moreover, there's a greater sense of self-confidence and the belief that we can handle any situation. Regarding the five aggregates, feeling, contact, perception, formation and consciousness, and the factors of zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity and attention, they are also present in the second jhana. This provides a framework for the Buddha's path, where these factors manifest in all the jhanas. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus. So indeed, these states, not having been, come into being, having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood, there is an escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. This is quite an interesting experience. It's akin to seeing the sky on a clear night without any clouds. When we observe such a pristine sky, we feel a sense of extreme clarity. There are no traces of clouds. Everything is just present. We reside fully in the present moment, unattached to any experiences that simply unfold before us. We do not react to them. They merely exist. We are completely immersed in the present moment. That's the essence of this experience, being fully present without being swayed in any direction, completely immersed as if the universe unfolds before us. We are independent. There's nothing binding us. We are entirely disentangled, free from any coarse interactions. It's like two sides of a road that never converge, or two sides of a river where we stand on one bank while the other remains distant. That's the independence we observe. All these phenomena exist, yet they do not affect us. This is how we maintain a sense of freedom and clarity. Now, regarding the second jhana, here's what the Buddha says. Again, bhikkhus, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, Sariputta entered and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. Moving on to the third jhana, it involves bodily pleasure, known in Pali as sukha. In the first and second jhanas, there is piti, a joyful excitement. In the third jhana, this excitement completely dissipates, replaced by profound comfort and tranquil calm throughout the body. It's akin to the body being completely immersed in water, where every part experiences this soothing pleasure. The Buddha compared the first jhana to joy permeating the body like a sponge saturated with water, leaving no part untouched. Similarly, the second jhana is likened to a still lake filled to the brim, where no part of the lake bed remains dry. In the third jhana, this comfort pervades the entire body, bringing deep contentment and ease. If there's one word to describe the third jhana, it's sukha, bodily comfort. 
In the third jhana, bodily comfort increases and equanimity becomes rock solid. The mind remains steady and undisturbed. The Buddha and his disciples frequently dwelled in the serene abiding of the jhanas, as mentioned in numerous suttas. When asked, the Buddha affirmed his abidance in these peaceful states, including emptiness and the formless realms, arupas. Through practice and maturation, one can enter and exit these states at will. For instance, one can determine to exit the third jhana after 15 minutes and subsequently move into the base of infinite space. It's akin to instructing the mind, mind guide me out of the state of nothingness in 15 minutes, and the mind effortlessly facilitates the experience, much like changing channels on a TV or radio with a remote control. That's how flexible and malleable the mind is in such states. The third jhana is characterized by supreme comfort in the body and strong equanimity, alongside other factors. Let me read it out. And the states in the third jhana, equanimity, pleasure, mindfulness, full awareness and unification of mind, contact, feeling, perception, volition and mind, zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Yes, the third jhana is not the end of the path, because we continually cultivate the wholesome and release the unwholesome, progressing all the time. Sometimes we may experience the third jhana, and within five minutes move on to the fourth jhana. It can happen in split moments. We skip from the second jhana to the fourth, catching only a fleeting glimpse of the jhanas. This happens to many, and there's no need to worry about why. We can reflect and revisit later. That's why I say becoming familiar with the process is key. Once skilled, we can intentionally re-experience any previous state. We can experience all permutations, experimenting freely. Therefore, if we have skipped past some jhanas without fully experiencing them, we can return to them. There will be times when we can revisit and experience them intimately. It's a matter of mastering these experiences. In the early stages, we may have only glimpsed them here and there. With more experience, we realize our initial experiences were somewhat basic and fleeting. We begin to appreciate the richness of jhana. Sariputta often did this. For Arya disciples and perfected ones, the experience is vastly different. They encounter everything in its purest form, without any tendencies cluttering the experience. As skill develops, experiences stabilize. Those Aryas can remain in any jhana in any sitting, delving into the finest nuances of experience. Again, bhikkhus, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. As we progress on the path, pleasure and pain become transient sensations, short-lived in their impact. We come to see that pleasure and pain are coarser experiences compared to the equanimity of the fourth jhana, a state neither painful nor pleasant. In the fourth jhana, all waves of pleasure, pain, joy, and bodily comfort settle. The mind finds ease in equanimity, with less interaction with the senses. It can feel as though the body has dissolved. When joy and happiness are relinquished, the mind feels unburdened, purified by the absence of these mental activities. The mind becomes clearer, devoid of distractions or disturbances. This is the purity of mindfulness in the fourth jhana. So the fourth jhana provides a very strong balance of the mind. We feel that our mind becomes fearless, strong, extremely attentive and clear. It achieves such exquisite balance that nothing in this world can make us emotional. Any horror, scream, fear, doom and gloom, or any disasters we can think of will not shake our state of mind. They appear insignificant, like children's toys. Our mind becomes so balanced, it becomes like a rock, and nothing can shake that foundation. That is the state of the fourth jhana. The fourth jhana is also characterized by strong equanimity, a feeling neither painful nor pleasant, and a mental unconcern due to tranquility. It is a state of exquisite calm and composure, and the mind remains unshaken. It feels like all winds and vibrations have come to a complete standstill. So it may feel like a state of calm after a storm, or something similar. It's a state of very balanced mind, 
complete stillness. Let me read the text. And the states in the fourth jhana, equanimity, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, mental unconcern due to tranquility, purity of mindfulness, and unification of mind. Contact, feeling, perception, volition and mind. Zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. The four arupas and cessation. The four jhanas that the Buddha mentioned are called sama samadhi, or the right unification of mind, something that is in perfect harmony with the universe and all the nature of reality. Sama samadhi means being fully in tune with this nature. It signifies no ripples, no scattering of mind, just unified. After the fourth jhana, the practice takes a turn. We are practicing mindfulness of loving kindness, and we know it does not lead us all the way to nibbana. The mindfulness of loving kindness is a vehicle toward nibbana as our destination. This vehicle of loving kindness eventually says, I'm sorry, I cannot take you all the way to nibbana. My destination is just the fourth jhana. That's where my journey ends. So I have to let you go, and you have to take another ride through the vehicle of mindfulness of compassion. So we move from the fourth jhana and find another way. That's how we need to bid farewell to loving kindness and embark on another journey with compassion. The Buddha said loving kindness leads us only to the fourth jhana. That is its limit. After that, we practice sending feelings of loving kindness in all directions and across the entire universe. It doesn't take long to practice these directions. Five minutes each for forward, right hand side, back, left hand side, up and down, totaling 30 minutes. Then, after 30 minutes, we radiate this feeling of loving kindness to the entire universe, unconditionally giving it to all beings inhabiting it. So, when we have radiated that feeling without any bounds, letting it go as far as it will reach, then if we continue practicing, eventually the stream of loving kindness will disappear, and it will automatically switch to the feeling of compassion. So I just used a metaphor, saying that now loving kindness will say goodbye. It does say goodbye, and it will give us access to the feeling of compassion. So we don't have to do anything, we just need to radiate the feeling, whatever we have in our mind, and let it flow in all directions. By the time we are radiating the feeling of loving kindness into the entire universe, the feeling of loving kindness would have gone up, as if we are radiating from our head. It will be very clear the feeling is not in our heart, it's just going upwards through our entire body, and we are radiating as if our whole body is luminous. It's like we are a candle. In this practice, all we need to do is let the feeling flow in all directions. We can read the suttas like the Suttanipata 1.8, Karaniya Metta Sutta, where the Buddha instructs how we should send these feelings. We are simply following the Buddha's instructions to send the feeling of loving kindness to each direction and then all six directions simultaneously. And when we have perfected that, then we automatically become attuned to the base of infinity of space. Let me read that again. Again because, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite space. Now here, completely surmounting the perception, grosser, of form. So perception of form is the concept. There are two important concepts here. One is perception, which is our interpretation or opinion of form. Form refers to our visual, auditory, gustatory, and other sensory representations. These perceptions create imagery in our mind. We do not pay attention to these perceptions of forms. Our mind is detached from these sensory perceptions and our reactions to them, not detached from the senses themselves, but we are not focused on these five sensory perceptions. Our attention is on the perception of the mind. What is the mind perceiving? The mind is perceiving that all forms have disappeared. We have let go of our attention to forms, and all that remains is this boundless space. So what is form? Form refers to our experience of the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air. These combinations give us visual, auditory, and other sensory perceptions. 
Once we let go of perceptions of form, we arrive at the perception of the formless. The very first base of the formless is the perception of the base of infinite space. This perception does not involve forms. It perceives what is not there. It turns away from forms, and what remains is the perception of infinite space. Thus, the Buddha's path is a gradual emptying of perceptions so that we gradually become free of all perceptions. I shall say, initially, we perceive form. We perceive light, the body, sound and smell, all presented to us through the four great elements that make up the body and the external world. Now, having let go of those perceptions of form by not paying attention to them, when they disappear from our perception and from our mind-body mechanism, all that remains is contact with the feeling of infinity of space. The feeling of infinity of space arises due to that contact. It's just a perception. What happens is that the mind makes contact with the base of infinity of space, and from that contact arises the feeling of the base of infinity of space. This feeling includes the perception of the base of infinity of space as a bonus, because we have turned away from form and identified that which is devoid of form, a formless experience. This is due to the contact between the mind and the base of infinity of space. This process is called the gradual emptying of the mind from impressions of those coarser bases, namely form and the five sense bases. It's a process of lightening the mind, freeing it from all those coarser perceptions by reducing attention. When we let go of those perceptions, we experience a very peaceful and cool sensation, the infinity of space. Compared to the four jhanas, it feels very peaceful, cool, composed, calm and spacious. We might feel like suspended in emptiness, the vastness of space. The quality of the mind is pristine and we directly experience the absence of ill will, freed from impurity. Our mind becomes very soft and composed, and in this state it feels cooler and more spacious. That's all I will say about this. We could describe it further, but I don't want to elaborate too much on this experience, as it could turn into mere stories, if described in excessively. I had a brief experience when I first encountered the base of infinity of space. It was quite vivid. I was in a hotel in Vienna, Austria, and suddenly, after 20-25 minutes of sitting while radiating meta to all six directions, all feelings of meta vanished. It felt as though I was not sitting but floating, as if the floor, roof and walls had disappeared, leaving me completely suspended in space. Beings can remain in this perception for a long time. They are perceiving this sublime base unlike us, who perceive light, form, sound, taste, pain and pleasure. The practice here is to let the perception of infinity of space be, not identifying with it, and instead focus on radiating the cool feeling of compassion to all beings in all directions. That's it. Whenever the mind remains fixated on any experience, we apply the six R's to release it. Independence from experiences is indeed a great relief on this path. So we just continue. These perceptions can be seen as distractions or milestones. At the very least, they mark progress on the path. We are not stuck in any of these experiences. We are always progressing. In all these experiences, what we are doing is letting go of the unwholesome and nurturing the wholesome. When the mind engages and becomes entangled with thoughts, perceptions, ideas, concepts, opinions, we let those processes be without engaging with them because anything not the object of our meditation is a distraction. We continually let go of these distractions and cultivate wholesome feelings, compassion, joy, equanimity. These are progressively more wholesome objects of attention. They arise naturally. All we do is create the causes and conditions for them to arise. This is how we continually progress on this path. This is called the 6R, or right effort. The approach is simple. As soon as the mind begins to engage or wander, we let that process be, step aside, and do not identify with it. So by applying the six R's, we free ourselves from getting stuck, become independent, and disentangle ourselves. That's the process. All we need to do is apply the six R's to our engagement in the process, and bring awareness to stay with the object of our meditation, which is the feeling of compassion and radiate that feeling to the entire universe in all directions. Eventually, the feeling of compassion, or the vehicle of compassion, fades away as it exhausts its capacity to lead us further. It bids farewell to the mind, saying, 
I'm sorry, but my journey ends here. I've brought you all the way to the base of infinity of space. My vehicle cannot take you to the higher bases or the state of Nibbana. You need to switch to the vehicle called Mudita, or the feeling of contentment and joy. So we find ourselves aware that the feeling of compassion is no longer present. All we did was radiate that feeling to all six directions simultaneously, after spending five minutes radiating it in each direction. Once we've completed this for about 30 minutes, we then radiate compassion to all six directions simultaneously. With continued practice and applying the six R's when our mind wanders, the feeling of compassion also transforms. Gradually, our mind begins to perceive the base of infinity of consciousness. We start to feel that our mind has entered another dimension. The feeling of compassion shifts to a feeling of contentment, satisfaction and pure happiness. This happiness isn't tied to anyone else's happiness. It's an inner happiness of contentment and ease. This state is called mudita, independent joy. With the arising of the state of mudita, suddenly our feeling of compassion changes and vanishes. As this experience strengthens, we begin to discern individual sensory fragments more clearly. Our awareness of the body's reactions to sensory contacts becomes more acute. We notice slight interruptions in our hearing and gaps in our vision. It's as if the mind has become more sensitive. Our perception and sensitivity at the mind's base have become refined, picking up on the perception of the base of infinity of consciousness. We begin to experience the quantized nature of reality. The solidity of our perception becomes shattered, or shall I say, we start to perceive the discrete and composite nature of all these experiences. This heightened awareness reveals that all sensory contacts, feelings, perceptions, and processes impose a burden on the mind. Through mindful observation, we recognize these perceptions as forms of agitation. Yes, there will be joy. We will experience the feeling of mudita, which brings joy and deep contentment. We will have no jealousy, no tendencies of the mind to envy others' success, and any traces of these impurities will gradually decompose and dissipate. The relationship between perceiving the base of infinity of consciousness and radiating the feeling of mudita can be tricky. We must be mindful of the mind's tendency to mistake the experience of the former as the goal, instead of continuing to radiate mudita. Staying with mudita, our attitudes toward jealousy, envy and harboring such feelings diminish. If we can remain in the base of infinity of consciousness for a substantial period, it will significantly reduce feelings of jealousy and envy. For those prone to jealousy and unable to tolerate others' success, this practice of residing in the base of infinity of consciousness or cultivating mudita joy is the remedy. These are impurities of the mind, and practicing the mindfulness of four Brahma-viharas gradually aligns us more harmoniously with the universe and all living beings. Initially, we become kind, loving and welcoming, wishing for their well-being. Gradually, depending on our progress, we move to the state of compassion, where we not only wish for their well-being, but also seek to alleviate their pain and suffering, refraining from any action with body, speech or mind that could cause harm or suffering. This path becomes much more peaceful, and we feel more in harmony with others. Then we progress to the feeling of mudita. Mudita is the antidote for jealousy and envy. Then the Buddha said, Again, bhikkhus, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of nothingness. Because we are practicing the six Rs, we engage in wholesome activity, cultivate the feeling of mudita, and let go of all distractions and perceptions that try to grab our attention and keep us in that base. Continuously practicing the six Rs will eventually lead our mind to completely let go of those perceptions and transition into the awareness of the base of nothingness. The feeling of mudita we radiate will change into the feeling of equanimity. It's a transformation, akin to a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. The feeling of mudita evolves into the feeling of equanimity. The mind becomes happier and more at ease to radiate the feeling of equanimity as it becomes free of coarser perceptions. Thus, equanimity becomes the focal point for the mind, and we radiate it to each of the six directions, and eventually to all directions. We don't need to force it, it naturally arises. All we need to do is allow it to flow in all directions, one by one, 
and simultaneously in all six directions. This is the perception of the base of nothingness, an experience of emptiness where only the mind and perception exist. It feels as though we have become completely free from the universe. All the galaxies, stars and lights that were previously perceived are now absent. It's like looking back in time, perhaps 14 billion years ago, and seeing how far we've come since then. Reflecting on this journey, we traverse through all those lights, noise, clusters of galaxies, stars, and other objects, using those experiences to propel us to this point. We didn't halt or get stuck in any of those states. We've made a long journey to reach this base of nothingness. It's like taking a moment to rest and contemplate how far we've come in this universe. We've gone through so much. It's akin to taking a sigh of relief and looking back on the past. This is how I remember my days, in 2018, experiencing this base, observing all those coarse perceptions that no longer exist. Now I'm free of those perceptions and experiencing exquisite calm and composure. My mind is devoid of any disturbances, and here I am, experiencing this state. We may feel relieved, resting in that equanimity, the feeling of peace, calmness and composure. It's just the mind and the experience, nothing else. It might seem like we could stay in this experience for eternity. The conventions of space-time and the universe disappear, leaving only the experience of the mind and the base, nothing else. It's profoundly peaceful, perhaps akin to a blank, clean blackboard with awareness resting upon it. We can remain in this state for a long time, half an hour, 45 minutes, without any trace of disturbance. It's incredibly peaceful, and whenever something arises in the mind, we practice the six R's. This strengthens our stability even further. The perception of the base of nothingness is characterized by a very stable mind, although different experiences may arise around that base. In my case, when I began experiencing it in 2018, initially it felt somewhat unstable, a bit inconsistent. The mind could easily tip into states of restlessness or sloth and torpor. It was as though I needed to constantly adjust my focus, sometimes sharpening my observation, other times blurring it and stepping back, akin to adjusting a camera lens, to maintain that calm and composed state of mind. As I progressed and became more familiar with it, these fluctuations lessened, and the exquisite calmness of the base of nothingness grew stronger. The base of nothingness is quite intriguing depending on what one seeks, whether it's activity, joy, or emptiness. In this state, the latter prevails, where the mind finds peace and ease in the absence of any activity, a state of pure tranquility. Some people may feel bored and not want to spend too much time in this state, but it's truly a beneficial state to be in. I believe every moment spent here is worthwhile. This provides a strong foundation for preparing to delve into cessation. If we can remain in this base of nothingness for a good period with a neutral attitude, the mind can enter cessation at any time. In my case, I spent a considerable amount of time here, weeks. Then I proceeded further, suddenly even the feeling of equanimity. I was radiating that feeling of equanimity, became exhausted. My energy completely drained. Even with all my effort, I couldn't generate the feeling of equanimity anymore. I reached a dead end. That was it. No more feeling of equanimity. That marks the end of the journey through the Brahma Viharas. At this stage, all four Brahma Viharas bid farewell. Okay, goodbye. You have graduated from our university. Now it's up to you to continue further, but unfortunately, we cannot take you there. We find ourselves in a state of subtle experiences that we have yet to comprehend. This base of nothingness provides a very solid ground for the mind to remain undisturbed by any conceptualizations or personal attachments. It truly serves as a training ground, or I should say, a base camp, to embark on the investigation of subtle mental phenomena. Now even the feeling of equanimity disappears. There's nothing left. All the energy, all the perceptions have been exhausted. There's no feeling, no loving kindness left, no joy and no rapture. All four Brahma Viharas have completely dissipated. Now there's nothing in the mind to radiate. After the Brahma Viharas, the Buddha teaches that the meditation path he taught us is Anapanasati, see Majima Nikaya, 62, Maharahulavada Sutta. I would argue that Anapanasati should not be simply called mindfulness of breathing. 
This practice is the complete path leading to cessation and the four ultimate fruits or Mahapalas. See Samyutta Nikaya 5408, the simile of the lamp. At this stage, we are not observing the breath because the breath itself is so subtle. It would just be another distraction. Anapanasati, at this stage, is mindfulness of what remains after abandoning all coarser perceptions. If we consider the framework of Satipatthana, Majjhima Nikaya 10, we have mindfulness of the body, which also encompasses mindfulness of breathing. Mindfulness of feeling involves being aware of the pleasures of jhanas, and mindfulness of mind is what is termed as being aware of the arupas, the base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, and the base of nothingness. These are the objects of observation in the third foundation. Mindfulness of mind objects, dhammas, the fourth foundation is still referred to as anapanasati. In using anapanasati, we practice mindfulness of phenomena, mind objects here. The mind is too subtle to observe the body, feeling, and mind bases. This marks the beginning of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. We are still practicing the four foundations of mindfulness, but primarily focusing on mindfulness of mind objects. Let me read it again. Again, Bhikkhus, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. He emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he contemplated the states that had passed, ceased, and changed, thus. So indeed, these states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood, there is an escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. So, in the mindfulness practice, in the base of neither perception nor non-perception, there are subtle interactions between the mind and mind objects. If we refer to the paragraph on the base of nothingness, the Buddha states that the states of contact, feeling, perception, formations, and mind consciousness, these are still present in the base of nothingness, but in the base of neither perception nor non-perception, those of contact, feeling, perception, formations and mind and other factors are not present. In this state, the observation focuses on the mind and mind objects. In essence, in this state, Anapanasati process involves observing both the mind itself and its objects. You may have heard of the double slit experiment. Scientists studying subatomic particles observed peculiar behaviors. When they did not observe the particles, the same particle appeared to pass through both slits simultaneously and generated an interference pattern on the screen. However, when they closely observed individual particles at each slit, the particles always passed through only one slit at a time, not both. Thus, the act of observation influenced the process, and the particles behaved like physical matter, fixed in terms of location and directionality. Similar to a double-slit experiment, at this stage any involvement of the mind, such as observation, can impede the flow of mind and its nature. The Buddha called this mental proliferation. We need to step out of the way. Although the mind and mind objects are generally seen as separate, in this process we find the mind is observing the mind object. It's like I am looking at myself and identifying with the process. As the Buddha said in the Dhammapada, mind is the forerunner of all mind objects, dhammas. Mind objects are produced by the mind. In this process, we allow the mind and mind object to remain without interfering. The unfolding game of how mind and mind objects arise becomes clear. Here, the finest concept, mind consciousness, ceases, leading to cessation. In Majjhima Nikaya 148 Chachaka Sutta, the Buddha discusses all sets of six sense contacts. In the sixth set of six, the Buddha states, dependent on mind and mind object, mind consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is mind contact. With mind contact as a condition, there is mind feeling. With mind feeling as a condition, there is mind craving in terms of underlying tendencies. If one delights in that and clings to it, then suffering is inevitable. The Buddha also said that if one does not delight in that, and does not cling to it, then the underlying tendency to remain in craving does not arise. Our objective is neither attachment nor detachment. We simply allow this process to unfold. Dispassion arises naturally. 
observing the mind and mind objects reveals that there is no separate mind and mind object. The mind creates the mind object, so in reality they are not two separate things. It is the mind that generates mind consciousness through the mind object. This is the ultimate insight into Buddha Dhamma. All links of dependent origination are rooted in the mind, which initiates all these phenomena. Our mindfulness involves observing how this process functions throughout. When the time is right, we let go of observation through dispassion to unlock cessation. When we realize that the mind and mind objects are essentially the same thing, suddenly mind consciousness becomes merely a concept. It is not an entity. It is just a projection because our attention was not sharp enough. Observing this process without any notion, just clear observation, renders mind consciousness unnecessary. It simply fades away. Without mind consciousness, there is no mind feeling. Without mind feeling, there is no mind perception or craving. We can see the interdependence of consciousness and nama rupa, feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention. Then all the processes known as the six sense contacts cease due to letting go of craving. By craving, we mean any engagement that interferes with the process. Cessation occurs because there is no hint of craving. Craving could not manifest because there is no feeling. There is no feeling because there is no contact, and there is no contact because there is no consciousness. Thus, all these fabrications unravel before us. It was merely a play of the mind, fabricating all that unfolds. This is a very vivid type of observation. I will go through some examples later in the chapter titled Practice Leading to Niroda. At that particular state near cessation, our observation becomes quite sharp. In the beginning, it's just a mind and mind object process, the creation of premature experiences like broken images or thoughts. We will see those very rudimentary flowerings of mind objects. The mind is bubbling with those mind objects, but they are somewhat fragmented and incomplete. It often reminds me of something very familiar, like déjà vu. It appears very dreamy, as if I could have seen it before. Then it's gone. We gradually return to observing our mind. When we try to see what is happening, we see it like glass starting to smash and just falling apart. We are out of that nursery of mind and mind object processes where the process goes through vivid, colorful types of experiences and we see concepts arising, but those are very crude. And it's like we might have seen some corners of the universe being like a nursery for all the stars and galaxy formations. We can see how those galaxies and stars are formed through dust particles, heat and gravity. The base of neither perception nor non-perception is like a nursery of the mind and mind objects. How things called thoughts, feelings and perceptions are becoming full-blown phenomena or mind objects. As we become more equipped with this understanding, this process unfolds much quicker and we can experience cessation faster than having to spend a lot of time on that base. Because we understand the mind mechanism, it is a realization that we are causing ourselves to be trapped in this chain of mind and mind object. In a way, we are prisoners of this mind and mind object process, potentially keeping us chained in it forever. This practice is an opportunity to break free of this chain. Yes, it sounds simple, but it is quite tricky in practice. There will be many hits and misses. Oh, I just missed this time. Maybe there is something I could try to nail it. And thoughts. The mind becomes a bit impatient at points, wanting to see the crossing over to cessation occur. It will have expectations, some planning, and all those things, trying to game it. And those are the very things that the mind has fabricated that we were not aware of. The Buddha's words for this are mano maya. It literally means spells of the mind. After that, the approach is to understand that this is the interplay of mind and mind object. We may be fooled into chasing the shadow that the mind creates. That's why the Buddha said to use the tool of attention wisely. These mind objects are just products of our attention, the fabrications of the mind. Having this conviction of the Buddha's words and theoretical understanding will calm the mind making it unagitated and accepting that, okay, all these activities that we do with the mind are only going to oscillate, only shake this mind to generate more and more mind objects. So the best thing to do at that time is to let the mind be, not be involved at all. Just take a step back and let the process unfold. The mind will not be supported by our fuel of attention. 
Because we let go of attention, the mind will not find support from mind object, and the bridge for mind consciousness will fall apart. And that's when cessation occurs. At that time, there will be a blank in our awareness, not knowing that the mind was falling into cessation until contact with mind objects arises again. It probably took some time, and then the entire universe arises in front of our awareness. Let me read again. Again, Bhikkhus, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the cessation of perception and feeling, and his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. How do we surmount this experience? This pertains to perception, the need to understand that base of neither perception nor non-perception, where we perceive that there is a nursery of formation of the mind and mind object into two entities is very rudimentary. Although it is a rather vague and fragile state, it is quite stubbornly persistent. It is just that we had no way of realizing that it is all fabrication. Somewhat, that process got the fuel of attention from the notion I, me, mine, from time immemorial till now. We were always trapped in that never-ending loop of mind and mind object, forming this chain of phenomena and not realizing that the process got spiced up due to our tiny engagement. If there is no mind consciousness, the consciousness for sight, sound and all other consciousnesses are also affected. They will also fall apart because the bridge of mind consciousness has fallen. This is clarified by Sariputta in Majjhima Nikaya 43, Mahavadala Sutta. It's the mind that partakes in experiences of all sense consciousnesses. That means we are cut off from the entire universe. The edge of the physical universe is a concept, an illusion. It is a fallacy of people who are obsessed by the notion of matter and space. This is the only way we step out of the universe, by knowing where the end of the universe lies. The dimension of time is another concept. There is no absolute time. All that is apparent is the experience of pleasure and pain, birth and death. The process has been running for trillions and trillions of eons. Trying to measure the beginning of time is as fallacious as trying to find the end of space. The Buddha said that all that matters is whether we have seen the process and exited the loop or not. With cessation, it's as if the fuse is now blown from the current or river of dependent origination. Thus, when we emerge from cessation, we are shaken to the core. It is a temporary phenomenon, but those who have walked the path will be permanently impacted, never to be patched back into the chained process of samsara again. That is what the awakening shown by the Buddha is all about. Now, it is common that there might also be some angst, some reaction to cessation, or fear of the unknown. Some people might have the notion, what is this experience? Will I cease to exist if my consciousness goes away? Will I regain my consciousness or senses after cessation? These things may worry some. As far as I know, cessation is just a temporary event in our awareness. Nothing is lost or gained. Even if we want it to last, it won't. The reality is completely otherwise. As long as we have not relinquished our will to live, those consciousnesses will patch up again. We are wired to be conscious. Only through practice can we remain in cessation for certain durations. The mind will remain in that cessation state for as long as the battery for its sustenance is charged. That is what we can do with a purified life with wholesome intention and determination and prepare all the causes and conditions in the sitting session. Cessation will last for a few seconds, or whatever time programmed by intention, and consciousness will sprout after the timer expires. What happens after that is, because there was just emptiness, there was nothing. I may compare it to the Big Bang, what was before that? It's just a state of no universe, and we are bringing forth the universe, so what comes first? First comes the emptiness, there was nothing and from the emptiness, all phenomena and the concept of matter arise. Dependent on the six sense bases and emptiness, contact will arise. That emptiness contact is touching a particular base or dimension. It is the dimension of Nibbana, and we have touched the Nibbana element. And when we emerge from that, we see contact with that emptiness arose, and that contact is void of anything. It is void of self. It is void of craving. It is also non-directed contact, because it's not shaking, it's just completely still. And it is what is called objectless contact. So that is the three contacts. And from that state of non-universe, because it made contact with the six sense bases, 
Now the universe arises. So what arises with contact is feeling. With feeling, perception arises, and from perception, conception arises. From conception, Nama Rupa arises, and from name and form, consciousness on the six bases arises. From the six bases, contact arises, and so on. These phenomena arise in parallel, not one after another. The loop starts and the engine of dependent origination begins to run. What was before that? I think we can call this the singularity, or a state of exception that none of the software codes in the universe can handle. From the contract with singularity, all diversity arises, the universe arises. So the state of Nibbana is that state of singularity, where it's void of all conditions. It's just contactless and independent. I like to call this the only unmade. Everything else in this universe is made. And that is like a key to break free from the universe. This is possible only with the right practice, with non-engagement, non-entanglement, and complete letting go. We facilitate the process by gradually cutting off all the bonds, ligaments, and tendons with this universe. Eventually, the process happens when the mind finds a tiny ford or aperture to contact with the element of Nibbana, emptiness, undirectedness, and desirelessness. Seeing that process, seeing it come back in front of our mind, our eyes, and seeing the universe and suffering come into view, is awakening to the link of dependent origination. The Buddha called it liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom. So that is what is called seeing with wisdom. And what is that wisdom? What Venerable Sariputta saw was the genesis of the process behind suffering. This is how the universe arises, and what he saw was the inherent arising of suffering there. Before the arising of suffering, he already saw the cessation of suffering, because by letting go and staying on the path, he was able to enter the cessation of perception and feeling. The recipe for the end of suffering. He didn't see it, but he entered the state which can only be known after coming back. But then he came back, and he saw the arising of suffering, and because he knew and used the right path, he also saw the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Because he had made contact with the unconditioned element that was free from the process of suffering, he also saw what the state of cessation of suffering, the third noble truth, was. He realized the four noble truths completely, and that realization is seeing with wisdom. Sariputta became an arahant after that. We may not be as gifted as him to destroy all ten fetters that chain us in the conditioned realm. But partial success is what happens to most of us, in gradual steps, because we are not as purified. We have not undergone all the purifications to the extent Venerable Sariputta did. The people who make fast progress in breaking all fetters are those who have gone through many experiences of the world, matured and have developed utter dispassion towards them. He emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he recalled the states that had passed, ceased and changed thus. So indeed these states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood. There is no escape beyond. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is not. Bhikkhus, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he has attained mastery and perfection in noble virtue, attained mastery and perfection in noble concentration, attained mastery and perfection in noble wisdom, attained mastery and perfection in noble deliverance. It is of Sariputta indeed that rightly speaking this should be said. Bhikkhus, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he is the son of the Blessed One, born of his breast, born of his mouth, born of the Dhamma, created by the Dhamma, an heir in the Dhamma, not an heir in material things. It is of Sariputta indeed that rightly speaking this should be said. Bhikkhus, the matchless wheel of the Dhamma set rolling by the Tathagata, is kept rolling rightly by Sariputta. That is what the Blessed One said. The Bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Okay, I have come to the end of the Sutta. So it provides a complete map of this path, and no other Sutta gives as much detail as the Anupada Sutta, regarding all these factors and the minute experiences of this path. However, some teachers argue that this Anupada Sutta was later inserted into the Pali Kanon, Sujato and Brahmali, 2014.
They claim it's not in the list of those early suttas because it's absent in the Chinese agamas. They argue that its use of flowery language and the Buddha's excessive praise of Sariputta are not natural. Some teachers of absorption jhana go as far as discrediting Majjhima Nikaya 111 because it does not support their approach of one-pointed focus and hindrance suppression, Brasington 2015. But it resonates well with many other Pali suttas, Majjhima Nikaya 10, 19, 113, 118, 138, just to name a few. Many meditators in the tradition of Tuayam have experienced it down to the last detail, and I have not experienced any state differently. Thus, this sutta is indeed a gift with such clarity and exposition. I think I have covered it quite thoroughly. I hope it has been of value to you. I may have missed some specific experiences, and I wouldn't want to add too much from my own experiences. I spent a good amount of time, maybe eight or nine months, observing neither perception nor non-perception, which was quite an interesting experience. While I was in this state for such a long time, the experience of cessation occurred unexpectedly at first. I wasn't anticipating all these occurrences, but they happened to my surprise. We may hear that we need to sit for six or eight hours to experience cessation, but no, it can occur even if we sit for half an hour, 45 minutes. We just need to have the right attitude, the right approach, and no expectations. Be like an impersonal observer, devoid of any personality. Be like a rock, be like the wind, be like the four great elements. Let go of everything, don't hold on to any personality, and cessation can occur any time. Cessation can occur whenever the mind is in a well-balanced state while experiencing jhanas. There's no other outcome than cessation. It's like a fruit that, when ripe, has no other destiny than to fall to the earth. Cessation is inevitable if our mind is on the right path. All we need to do is practice and exert right effort. It's the path of letting go. It's the path of freedom. This path contradicts worldly conventions that demand exertion and achievement. All the teachings of the Buddha can be summed up in one word, letting go. If we continue letting go, that's the key. Cessation is right there. Okay, I hope this has been useful to you, and I would like to share all the merit of this Dhamma work with all beings suffering. May they be freed from suffering and attain ultimate cessation of suffering in this very life. Thank you. Chapter 17. Practice Leading to Niroda Potapada, from the moment when a monk has gained this controlled perception, he proceeds from stage to stage till he reaches the limit of perception. When he has reached the limit of perception, it occurs to him. Mental activity is worse for me, lack of mental activity is better. If I were to think and imagine, these perceptions that I have attained would cease, and coarser perceptions would arise in me. Suppose I were not to think or imagine. So he neither thinks nor imagines. And then, in him, just these perceptions arise, but other coarser perceptions do not arise. He attains cessation, and that, Potapada, is the way in which the cessation of perception is brought about by successive steps. Diga Nikaya 9, Potthapada Sutta Among all the works in this book, this one holds a special place for me. After experiencing cessation in 2018, I conducted a series of Q&A sessions with Delson Armstrong to share my experiences and gain his deep insights. I learned about Delson's extraordinary experiences in 2020 and I was thrilled to discover how much further the practice of TWIM can take us. Hearing about Delson's deeper experiences was amazing. I have posted all our calls on the YouTube channel, Realization of the Unconditioned. These calls received many comments and reactions from Dhamma listeners. In one of the calls, I was asked to explain in detail the mechanics behind cessation and the practice leading to this experience. This chapter is about the preliminaries, attitudes, and methods for experiencing the state of the cessation of perception and feeling, as I have seen and understood it. In Pali, it's called Sana Vedahita Niroda, literally translated. It is also commonly translated as Niroda Sampati, where Niroda means cessation, and Sampati means fruition or maturation. This state occurs at the very end of the path taught by the Buddha. The Buddha has elaborated on all the states of his path, describing how one progresses from the first jhana to the second, third, fourth jhana, and beyond. After the fourth jhana, one progresses through the bases of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, 
and neither perception nor non-perception. Finally, one experiences what is called the cessation of perception and feeling. To break it down, perception and feeling are called mental formations, or sankaras. There are bodily sankaras, which mainly refer to the forces or activities that keep our bodily faculties and processes active. The suttas associate this with the process of in-breathing and out-breathing. On the other hand, mental formations include perception and feeling, while verbal formations include thinking and examining processes. The experience of the cessation of perception and feeling is described in several suttas, such as Majjhima Nikaya 44, Majjhima Nikaya 111, and Digha Nikaya 9. The Buddha explains that his path involves the gradual cessation of all formations, more precisely the tranquilization or calming of all formations. This is achieved by practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. When one sits in a meditative posture, being mindful and silent, hindrances do arise. However, they are not fed with attention, and any tension in the body and mind is stilled through practice. I have described the experiences through the practice known as mindfulness of loving-kindness and the 6R method, which allows all experiences to unravel, leading to all states, including cessation. By practicing the 6R steps, one remains steady on the path. Its function is to step out of the way to allow nature to unfold and not get caught up in any experience, be it a sense of attachment or aversion. Initially, the coarse experiences of sense gratifications and hindrances are not attended to. Since they fall away due to non-reaction, one can experience the unworldly happiness of jhanas, specifically the first jhana. In the first jhana, as described by the Buddha, there is a state of tranquility, happiness, rapture, pity, joy, a bright mind, and comfortable abiding. However, in the first jhana, there are still subtle verbal formations that remain active and have not completely subsided. It is in the second jhana that these verbal formations fully subside. With the twin practice, one lets go of the verbalizing aspect of the wish for loving kindness and just radiates the warm, loving feeling. This eases tension and tightness in the mind and body that we could not previously observe in the first jhana. At the level of the fourth jhana, the bodily formations cease and subside. The perception aspect of the mind becomes subtler and subtler with each jhana experience. Ultimately, in the state of nirodha, or cessation of perception and feeling, the mental formations also come to a complete end. This gradual process of letting go of tension and tightness allows us to experience utmost relief from all phenomena, nirodha, which is the goal of the practice. The complete path leading to the cessation of perception and feeling is elaborated in great detail in the Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta number 111, where Sariputta serves as an example. In this sutta, the Buddha describes the various jhana and arupa states that Sariputta goes through starting from the first jhana and progressing all the way to the cessation of perception and feeling. When one enters the cessation of perception and feeling, all awareness of the world and consciousness comes to a complete stop briefly. It is as if the mind enters a state of suspension where there is no perception, no feeling, and no consciousness. This can be seen as the ultimate voidness or cessation of all bodily and mental activities, or arriving at the root point from which all phenomena arise. The purpose of this chapter is to delve into the process of how experiencing the cessation of perception and feeling comes about in stages and to explore its significance in our lives and our pursuit of awakening. While this state may be unfamiliar to many people, I will do my best to explain the steps involved in progressing to Nirodha based on my own understanding and experiences. My intention is to provide general guidance and assistance to those who are striving to experience this state themselves. The work in previous chapters should also help with understanding the complete path and the place of cessation. And obviously, the value of cessation cannot be overstated. This is the most sublime and important state of the Noble Eightfold Path. Anyone who is striving to experience Nibbana cannot attain it without experiencing the cessation of perception and feeling. It is not something that one can experience easily without understanding the mind, phenomena and the process. It takes time, effort, and a graduated approach. It's not something we can rush to attain, and this is not something we can just experience by completely relaxing and not engaging in any activity. 
there are two aspects that come into play that propel one toward the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. The element of exertion and the element of relaxation. I find it relevant to quote some excerpts from the suttas to support this fact. This is in the Samyutta Nikaya, the very first sutta in the first book of the Nikaya, called Devata Samyutta. In the very first sutta of this book, there is an encounter between the Buddha and a Devata, a heavenly being. The Devata asks the Buddha, How did you cross the flood? What did you do? How did you manage to cross a flood so hard to cross? The Buddha responds, saying, Shall look, my friend, here is what I did. When I tried to strive, I was swept away by the flood. When I tried to stand still, I was drowned. But by not striving and also not staying still, I crossed the flood. Now, this is a very subtle point, I would say, a very refined state. We cannot overpower ourselves by striving hard, and we cannot remain passive and hope that everything will come to us. So we need to balance these two aspects of practice, progressing a little by doing very little striving, but also not doing much striving to allow for some resting in that state. This balance is achieved through observations and insights. This is how the Buddha says he crossed the flood. Obviously, this is not referring to a literal flood, but rather to the world of the six senses. This world of the six senses is so deeply ingrained in our experience that it holds us tightly. We cannot escape it as long as we identify with these senses, feelings, and perceptions. Yet there is an experience beyond these sense perceptions. To completely free oneself from the world of the six senses or from samsara, one must progress through multiple stages of freedom. There is a gradual but very specific process that needs to be followed to be free from these six senses, which the Buddha describes as the flood. This flood can also be termed existence or behavioral tendencies, bhava. Bhava is like a thread or link that conditions consciousness to gravitate towards particular experiences, leading us to subsequent existences, rebirth, suffering, and death. Bhava is analogous to the diversity of seeds that shape our experiences and drop us into different realms. So that is a very perplexing situation that even the greatest seers could not avoid. And that is something that the Buddha had been able to transcend and arrive at what we call the unconditioned state. So what is the unconditioned? First, what we need to understand is what is meant by conditioned and what is the unconditioned. The ultimate source of conditioning, or the formula, or the DNA that the Buddha discovered, is our reactions to phenomena, which follow a rule to keep us in the conditioned realm. The process of conditioning is what the Buddha calls patika samupada, or dependent origination. This is not a very precise translation. It should be called dependent simultaneous arising. It states that the things that arise do not occur subsequently or serially. Based on a condition, multiple things can arise at the same time. Samupada means arising together or arising at the same time. For example, if a feeling arises simultaneously with the feeling, craving arises, clinging arises, and being arises. All these things follow immediately. There is no gap, not even a millisecond, microsecond, nanosecond, or picosecond. This is a very counterintuitive state that one cannot understand just by reading a text. In texts, there has to be an order of words. They have to be ordered in a way that one can read. But in practice, it is a completely different experience. The purpose of this chapter is to help understand this state of Nirodha, why it is so profound and important, and what we can do to facilitate the mind to arrive at this state. I have already mentioned how this state can be experienced through the practice of twim, using mindfulness of loving-kindness. If you haven't done this practice, I recommend reading the instructions and steps of the path in Part 2 of this book. They explain how to experience all the jhanas and formless states through the Samatha Vipassana approach that the Buddha taught. I am making an effort here to cover practices and steps leading to the state of Niroda and to share some of my direct understandings and insights with anyone who finds it beneficial. Before I proceed further, I would like to provide a reliable sutta reference that directly addresses what the Buddha himself said about reaching the state of cessation. After conducting some research, I found a good reference in the Potapada Sutta in the Diga Nikaya. This sutta primarily discusses consciousness. During the time of the Buddha, consciousness was often regarded as a mystical state beyond human comprehension, with some people speculating that a supreme being injected consciousness into humans, giving them life. 
According to these speculations, when the Supreme Being removed consciousness, the human would be dead, as all consciousness would cease to exist under the control of the Supreme Being. The same question about the mystery of consciousness was posed to the Buddha. However, the Buddha did not entertain such speculations and mysticism in his teachings. He emphasized direct experience and the gradual steps of attaining and experiencing various states. According to the Buddha, there is nothing inherently special about consciousness. In response to the question about the successive stages of cessation of consciousness, the Buddha enlightens and shares his own direct experience and understanding with Pothapada, explaining his path and approach. And what the Buddha explains is that there is a fully aware practice that involves learning from perceptions, known as sakasanyi, or the ability to steer perceptions. This practice gradually allows one to release coarser perceptions and experience more subtle ones. The Buddha describes his path, starting with the practice of generosity, which leads to virtuous conduct. Through virtuous conduct, one's mind becomes calm and collected, enabling entry into the subtle states of jhana. As one develops the ability to enter jhana, they gradually let go of coarser perceptions, leading to the experience of more subtle ones. This is how the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path guides us through different jhanas by stilling mental formations. In the first jhana, verbal formations are the coarsest and subside in the second jhana. By continuing to let go and tranquilize mental activities, one progresses further. One experiences states of increasingly refined perceptions and gradually progresses towards what is known as the peak of perceptions. It's like climbing a mountain and reaching the summit where there is nothing else to climb. This peak of perceptions means experiencing neither perception nor non-perception. The way out is the abandonment of all perceptions. At this point, one realizes that even the subtlest activities of the mind can be a barrier. Engaging in any form of perception would only give rise to coarser perceptions, but no finer perceptions would be experienced. Essentially, this state represents a point where there is nothing. In this state, one understands that any mental activities can only lead downhill. There is no way to move upward. What one needs to do is let go of all mental activities. All intentions and planning must cease. The Buddha says that when one reaches the limit of perception, it occurs to us that mental activity is worse, while the lack of mental activity is better. If we were to think and imagine, the acquired subtler perceptions would cease, and coarser perceptions would arise so one chooses not to think or imagine. By doing so, only those subtle perceptions remain, while other coarser perceptions do not arise. One experiences cessation. Essentially, we let go of all perceptions, allow all mental activities to settle by themselves, and bring the mind to such a standstill that suddenly everything, including perception, completely ceases. This is the state of cessation of perception and feeling, where there is a blank, total disappearance. The mind is devoid of feeling, perception, and awareness. It simply stops due to lack of support. This is a point of origination or root, yoni, that the Buddha discovered, similar to backtracking from the ocean and trying to reach the source of all the waters that flow into the ocean. One can backtrack all the way, following the streams, rivers, glaciers, and mountains, until reaching the top, only to find nothing. It's like tracing the root or the origin of all activities and arriving at emptiness, where there is nothing. This emptiness signifies the cessation of all formations. The state of cessation of perception and feeling is the cessation of mental formations. As we discussed earlier, the verbal and bodily formations have already been let go of in the second and fourth jhanas, respectively. This is what the Buddha has to say about how one can experience cessation, although there aren't a lot of details. Therefore, one needs to understand what the Buddha means when he says that mental activity is worse for me, lack of mental activity is better. He is referring to a highly refined state where even neither perception nor non-perception eventually becomes coarse. In this state, the mind is almost 99.999% blank, completely empty. Occasionally, there may arise some random thoughts or a vague type of perception, like a dreamy or fleeting awareness it can appear as a flicker. This is an extremely subtle state, and individuals may have various experiences along the path. In my own experiences, when I used to experience this state of neither perception nor non-perception in the early days, 
I used to see random colors and vivid shapes. They felt familiar, as if I had seen them before, but they would quickly vanish. Once we begin identifying certain images or thoughts arising, we are already out of that state. At that point, we can return to the practice of relaxation and the 6R method, gradually leading us back to that mental state where we may again experience some loss of awareness. The mind becomes very quiet and these flashes may occur. However, it's important to note that this state only occurs for a small percentage of the time. We may sit for two hours and nothing happens, as if we are just observing the mind for any occasional arising and ceasing. The practice that leads us to this state goes beyond the scope of Brahma-Vihara, such as loving-kindness, compassion, joy and equanimity. It involves leaving behind all four Brahma-Viharas and practicing mindfulness of the rising and ceasing of phenomena, Anapanasati. I want to clarify that this practice is not limited to mindfulness of breathing. It encompasses the arising and ceasing of many things. Anapanasati, which is mindfulness of these arising and ceasing states, leads us towards the experience of neither perception nor non-perception. We continue to observe the mind for any subtle arising of these states, letting go of even that which eventually leads us to the cessation of perception and feeling. Moving forward, this is a very refined state where one is letting go of the world and all its activities, a complete surrender of control. The formations or sankharas, which I would refer to as activities, serve as the seed for all karma or actions. Now let's discuss how this process of cessation comes about. We have the Buddha's words about mental activities, and perception here is key. What we can say is that perception already involves a sense of self. If there were only feeling without perception, there would be no sense of self or mind. It is only when perception arises that personalization occurs. Therefore, the cessation of perception and feeling is about letting go of any personal identification or attachment to phenomena that only grow in shape and size with any act. In other words, according to the Buddha, the exact term for this is what we call atamyata, or non-identification. Whatever arises and ceases, there is no me, no mine, and nothing within. Any time we start to identify or label them as me or mine, identification or self-reflection occurs. This is the genesis of suffering. The five aggregates, which are affected by craving and clinging, are called identity. This is explained in the Kulavadala Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya 44. It is a discourse between Visaka and his former wife, Bhikkhuni Dhammadina, about the notion of identity, and she explains that it is the notion of acquisition of the five aggregates that constitutes identity or the idea of a self. Many people question what it means to say five aggregates affected by clinging, as it may not make immediate sense. The translation can indeed be vague. A more appropriate understanding is that it refers to the accumulation of these five aggregates. When we acquire or accumulate the body, feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness, and identify them as part of our acquisition, they become identity or a feta called Sakaya Dithi. This clinging or accumulation of the aggregates is what leads to suffering. It is important to note that these aggregates are not substantial or solid entities, but rather phenomena or events, as explained in the links of dependent origination. They are transient and constantly arising and ceasing. Trying to own or acquire them is a persistent delusion. I would say that these are just events that provide a clearer understanding as they arise in our mind due to our projection. Even the four elements and nama rupa, mind-body, can be seen as forms of awareness rather than solid entities. Everything happens in the mind. The concept of matter and the external world is just our projection. This may seem contradictory to physics, but there are aspects of the quantum realm that scientists have yet to fully explore, where they cannot find substantial material forms even in atoms and molecules. Everything that appears is composed of projections, feelings, and perceptions, also called consciousness. There is nothing else. Both spirituality and physics suggest that the material world including form, may simply be a collection of phenomena characterized by energies or perceptions, lacking solidity. When something strikes our body or we hit a wall, table or chair, we perceive it as if there is a solid object. However, what we are saying here is that it's the contact, perception and the subsequent process of dependent origination 
that create all these experiences. We experience the world and material forms because we are entangled in the process of dependent origination from the very outset. Therefore, if one can let go and reach the cessation of perception and feeling, these experiences also subside. This is a dimension free of contacts, as the cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness is where both mentality and materiality cease. Perception and feeling, which are mental formations, are the ultimate imprint of the world that we leave behind when we experience the cessation of perception and feeling. With that experience, the world ceases, sensory experiences cease, and consciousness stops. Essentially, all dependent phenomena like birth and suffering also come to an end. Now what is this state of cessation of perception and feeling? It is not yet the state of Nibbana, but rather a temporary or fleeting glimpse of what one can expect Nibbana to be like in terms of all sense impingements. What is special about such a state? Well, there are various sutta references where meditators who have experienced the cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness were unaware of anything, even if there were worldly debacles surrounding them. For example, there are accounts of fires burning entire villages, yet those who were in the state of cessation remained completely safe. I'm not suggesting that the cessation of perception and feeling will protect us from worldly disasters. It's just that there are records of individuals in this state being unaffected by such calamities. Even the Buddha himself had an experience of staying in this cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, as described in the Digha Nikaya 16 Mahaparinibbana Sutta. He remained unaffected by all sorts of external disturbances. Everything was happening around, with many animals being struck by lightning, but the Buddha remained completely safe and unaware of the world. This state is what the Buddha experienced. While some refer to it as the cessation of perception and feeling, others identify it as the Arahat's fruition experience, a state of experiencing Nibbana and the cessation of craving while still living in the world. There are subtle differences between the cessation of perception and feeling and the cessation of craving, the state of Nibbana. However, for our understanding here, the cessation of perception and feeling signifies a complete detachment from the world for the duration of this experience as if one is dead. But cessation is different in that one comes back to the world with sense faculties completely invigorated. This is what Majjhima Nikaya 43, Mahavadala Sutta says. Friend, in the case of one who is dead, who has completed his time, his bodily formations have ceased and subsided, his verbal formations have ceased and subsided, his mental formations have ceased and subsided, his vitality is exhausted, his heat has been dissipated, and his faculties are fully broken up. In the case of a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling, his bodily formations have ceased and subsided, his verbal formations have ceased and subsided, his mental formations have ceased and subsided, but his vitality is not exhausted, his heat has not been dissipated, and his faculties become exceptionally clear. This is the difference between one who is dead, who has completed his time, and a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling. And how does one experience Niroda, the end of the Noble Eightfold Path? It is through a good attitude and dedicated practice. We should not take this lightly because it is the doorway to Nibbana. Experiencing the cessation of perception and feeling by way of stilling all formations is highly significant. The Buddha explains in the Anguttara Nikaya Book of Nines, in this very life, Sutta number 51, what he had to say about it. Again, friend, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the cessation of perception and feeling, and having seen with wisdom, his taints are utterly destroyed. To this extent, friend, the Blessed One has spoken of Nibbana in this very life in a non-provisional sense. So what is meant by provisional and non-provisional? Non-provisional means absolute certainty. Those who have attained the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, and seen the Four Noble Truths upon emerging, are the ones who have definitely experienced Nibbana in this very life. There are four degrees of such experience, Sotapanna, Sakadagami, Anagami, and Arahat, also called Mahapalas. This certainty is attributed only to those who have experienced the cessation of perception and feeling. They have understood what stilling all formations means. That's what non-provisional means. On the other hand, 
all the jhanas, first, second, third, fourth, and arupas, formless states, are termed provisional by the Buddha. This means that attaining nibbana is not guaranteed by experiencing those jhanas and arupas. However, if we experience the cessation of perception and feeling through relaxation of all reactions, it means that we are guaranteed to experience nibbana, one of the four mahapalas, great fruits, in this life. There is no other way. It's like hitting the jackpot. This is the value of experiencing cessation, which means we have crossed over. We are safe. Now we have crossed the flood or the ocean. That's it. We are no longer subjected to all these debacles and sufferings, at most after a few worldly existences, like worldly people are. It means we have entered the stream that culminates in the deathless, as the Buddha says. We have attained stream entry, sotapanna at least. This is a very profound experience. There is nothing else in this world that can give us as much relief as the experience of the cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness. This is how valuable it is and one should value it in that sense. But I have seen some references where teachers consider cessation unbeneficial. For example, in a book called Focused and Fearless by Shaila Catherine, she mentions that we can experience all the jhanas, but she does not actually recommend experiencing cessation of perception and feeling. Catherine, 2008. She strongly advises anyone to stay away from it. This is a misguided approach by some teachers, they can be so misguided that they think cessation of perception and feeling is not worth pursuing, and they completely miss the point of what the Buddha Dhamma is all about. It is quite sad that such teachers do not acknowledge the importance of this state, which is the culmination of the Noble Eightfold Path. By using expressions like calling it a state of suspended animation or a dead end, deeming it useless, they disregard the teachings of the Buddha and give it a negative connotation. Obviously, anyone who has experienced cessation would strongly disagree. To put it mildly, this is complete nonsense. Why would anyone not want to experience the cessation of perception and feeling if one has learned the teachings of the Buddha? I do understand why these people are averse to it. They simply don't understand the suttas, the nature of formations, and the process of nibbana. They fail to grasp the significance of stilling all formations, relinquishing all acquisitions destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, and the state of Nibbāna. That is how the Buddha described the process of Nibbāna, and the stage of cessation is the key to it. It serves as the doorway to Nibbāna. Yet many Buddhist teachers show complete disregard for this process. I strongly object to such teachers who try to dissuade people from experiencing cessation. Now, the important thing to note is that this state is not easily experienced. It doesn't occur easily or quickly, and one can remain in the lower states, such as neither perception or nothingness, for years without experiencing cessation. I have seen and heard this in many places. So this may sound a bit counterintuitive as to why one cannot enter this cessation despite experiencing the earlier states. The key to experiencing cessation is there can be a very subtle attachment, like a thin thread that still lingers, keeping us from leaping into cessation. This attachment is a very fine clinging to the experiences of the world and mind. It's like standing at the shore, hesitating to take a deep dive. We may lack the courage or be hesitant in some way. Now, how can one experience this cessation? It's like observing young people or children sitting on the fence or by the pool, hesitating to dive into the water. They may just dip their feet in, lacking the courage to take a deep dive into the cold or warm water. It can be as small as that, a hesitation or fear of uncertainty. The same can apply to experiencing cessation. We can remain in the state of neither perception nor non-perception for years without progressing if we hold on to experiences. It may feel like we're just a stone's throw away from cessation, yet one is unable to experience it. Some people may imagine that if perception, feeling and consciousness cease, there will be nothing left, that the whole sense of self will vanish. Such fear or apprehension can hinder progress towards the cessation of perception and feeling. On the other hand, some people might be too eager, having spent a long time in the state of neither perception nor non-perception, anticipating the experience of cessation to occur. They may feel it approaching, but it quickly flashes and disappears, and they find themselves back in the perturbed awareness of the six senses. The Buddha said it's like chasing a mirage. 
This is what happens to many who dwell in the state of neither perception nor non-perception and continue to remain perturbed by experiences. So why is it so tricky? Why is it so elusive? Now the key to entering cessation is allowing the mind to do as it pleases by stepping out completely. During the state of neither perception nor non-perception, we are acutely aware of all the mental phenomena that arise and cease. Our mindfulness is very sharp at that time. However, any attempt to grasp or look forward to what will happen is the very thing that will prevent us from progressing further. Although it is a small step, there is something that will counteract our efforts, just like trying to defy gravity without enough force. Anticipations, tendencies and notions will drag us down, preventing us from breaking free from the gravitational pull and venturing beyond the orbit of the Earth. Let's say cessation is like going out of the orbit of this Earth. Earth represents our world of the six senses, and we are trying to break free from its orbit. However, we haven't let go of all the elements we are carrying, which burden and push us back towards the Earth. It's because we haven't let go enough and still hold notions and anticipations. This can be very subtle. In many retreats that people attend, such as 10-day retreats, they may go through this process every year. They may find themselves in neither perception nor non-perception, but they are still not progressing. They may start questioning themselves, wondering what is wrong with them. It is these anticipations and similar factors that actually prevent them from experiencing cessation. Now, how do we deal with that? What should be our attitude and approach to experiencing cessation? It's something we cannot plan or achieve just by flicking a switch. It arises through practice and preparation without intentionally trying to experience it. A few people I've spoken to or read about have shared that they experience cessation at times when they least expected it. We might sit down, rub our hands together, and set a time frame of three, four, or five hours, expecting to experience it. It's not going to happen like that. Just setting a timer and passing time won't lead to cessation. The process of cessation occurs when all the awakening factors are in complete balance. One has already experienced neither perception nor non-perception and has established a track record of calming the mind and balancing the factors of joy, tranquility, equanimity and energy. As the Buddha says in the Samyutta Nikaya, we need to observe the state of our mind, whether it is restless, lethargic or overly excited and determine which awakening factors need to be balanced. He has identified three factors for different states. Tranquility, collectedness, samadhi, and equanimity for a mind that is restless, worried, or anxious. These three factors serve as soothing elements that bring balance to the mind. On the other hand, there are three uplifting factors. Energy, joy, and investigation of phenomena, dhyama. These factors provide a boost to the mind. When combined with mindfulness, these seven factors work together to propel us towards the state of cessation of perception and feeling, like reaching a global optimum state. Balancing these seven factors requires observation and small adjustments at any stage. It can be tricky and requires constant development. It is recommended to sit more often, focusing on the quality of sitting rather than the number of hours. We need to observe how at ease the mind is. We may experience different states depending on the time of day. In the morning, we might feel restless and overly energetic, while in the evening, we may feel lethargic and lacking energy. It's possible that sitting in the morning leads to restlessness, while sitting in the evening is affected by sloth and doubt. To overcome these challenges, one can actively work with the environment to propel the mind towards a balanced state. Naturally, the mind tends to lean towards certain states at different times of the day. Our effort should be to choose a time when we are neither overly energetic nor too lethargic. Personally, I have found midday to be the perfect time to observe the mind and prepare for experiencing deep states. In this way, we facilitate the practice to naturally enter a balanced state where the awakening factors come into balance without much effort. Mindfulness remains at the center, observing the presence of joy, energy, alertness, comfort in both body and mind and a sense of equanimity. It feels incredibly comfortable. And this is the best time to take a deep dive and progress towards cessation. The way it comes about is that we have no control over anything at all. The mind will do what it likes to do. It will naturally head in a certain direction, relaxing itself. 
even if there are moments of restlessness during meditation, be ready to experience their settling without trying to control any of those factors. Treat it as if there is no controller, as if we are not in the driver's seat. Someone else is driving our mind. Just adopt an easy attitude, similar to how people accept boarding a plane. Some may have fears, but generally they trust the experienced pilot to handle the flight. There is nothing they can do about it. If the plane crashes, so be it. In that sense, what can we do to stop it? So this attitude should always be there. We are not in the driver's seat, we are letting the mind do whatever it likes. Just let the mind do whatever it likes. This isn't me. Nothing that happens is me. If the mind wants to go into cessation, let it be. I don't care. This is the attitude we need to develop when we sit in meditation to experience this cessation. Just go with the flow and see what happens. There's nothing we can do about it. It's not about us or ours. There's nothing in this world that truly belongs to me. So why should we try to influence or control this flow in any way? Nothing we do will lead to anything. Just let it be. This attitude brings true relaxation. Be carefree. Don't worry or take things too seriously. Just let it be and be in that moment. At the same time, don't become too lax. We don't want to just relax and expect things to suddenly cease. It won't work like that. We have to take baby steps and observe the mind. Give it a little bit of energy. It doesn't need much, but the energy factor has to be there. We need to be alert and observant, but without any attitude of trying to control or influence what is happening. Let go of all notions and expectations. There's nothing exciting or special that's going to happen. It's like watching a movie. No matter what the story is, whether it's a horror movie or an emotional one, we treat them all the same way. It's just a movie. Whatever happens, we are fully aware of the reality that none of it is a part of us. So why worry or get involved in that movie? In the same way, whatever events come to our awareness, they are not us. It has nothing to do with us. It's just like watching a movie that is happening in another dimension. We are not in that world. It's as if we are in a parallel universe. Whatever is happening in the mind should be treated like a parallel universe. It has nothing to do with us. Just let it be. This is the attitude we develop, and it will bring about a strong sense of equanimity and what the Buddha called non-identification. We are not identifying with any of these arising and ceasing phenomena. They are not us. We have grown tired of them, lost all fascination. This is what non-identification is all about. All these five aggregates arise and cease, but there is no me in any of them. So why should they be taken personally? Just treat anything that arises as if we are a spectator, observing it come and go. So that's the thing we need to focus on. We need to observe what is happening without any sense of excitement, joy or laxity. Just be present without a sense of self. Whatever is unfolding, there is nothing familiar or unfamiliar about it. We have never seen or heard it before. Our attitude towards it should simply be to watch and let it be. This is the attitude we need to develop. I'll give an example. The Buddha also mentioned in some suttas that among the Lichavis, there were skilled archers who could shoot an arrow through a small keyhole hundreds of meters away. Venerable Ananda acknowledged their expertise in archery. Then the Buddha asked Ananda, What do you think, Ananda, someone who can shoot an arrow through a keyhole or someone who can split a hair into seven pieces from afar is more skilled? Ananda agreed that the latter is far more difficult to achieve. Then the Buddha said, those who attain cessation, or those who are practicing the Buddha's path to the finest details, are even more refined than those skilled individuals who can split a hair into seven pieces from a distance of, say, tens of meters. What I'm trying to convey is that when approaching cessation, we can observe our mind gradually moving towards something, like a tiny aperture appearing. Any attempt to see or move the mind around it will absolutely miss passing through the aperture and the opportunity will be lost. At that moment, we should refrain from trying to steer or disrupt the flow of the mind, which should remain in perfect equilibrium and just relinquish any control. Maintaining that equilibrium and allowing the mind to remain in that extremely subtle state is crucial. Any form of excitement, anxiety or anticipation can steer the mind away from its perfectly settled state, disturbing the calmness that has been achieved. When the mind settles and all disturbances have subsided, 
sudden anticipation can cause a disruption, undoing all the progress that has been made. This is not a one-time occurrence. We will encounter such experiences many times as we continue our practice. With more practice, we become more familiar with the movements of the mind. We realize that by conserving energy, calming the mind and cultivating a sense of joy, we can remain unattached and unconcerned. We observe that everything falls into place naturally, and we feel that we are heading in the right direction. At times, the mind becomes extremely bright and luminous. It becomes an intensely vivid experience. However, such experiences can also disrupt progress towards the state of cessation, as there is still some sense of striving to attain it. Just when we feel that it's approaching, that it's almost within reach, it may flash and disappear. It's akin to boiling milk. When I was young, my mother would always tell me not to let my mind wander even for a few seconds while boiling milk, lest it evaporate entirely. Now I understand she was right, in a profound way. When boiling milk, certain physics take over, it begins to boil. If we let the heat continue even for a moment longer than necessary, the milk evaporates, leaving only burnt remnants in the pan. However, if we observe carefully and stop the heat at the precise moment, the milk sustains a boiling point. We can adjust the heat so that it maintains that delicate state, neither burnt nor simply liquid. This parallels what happens when approaching the state of cessation. We need to make subtle adjustments to allow the mind to settle naturally into that state. Experiencing cessation is similar, the sense of me disappears. If we know how to make those precise adjustments, we can guide the mind to experience it effortlessly, without a sense of effort or striving. The first experience of cessation often occurs unexpectedly. For example, while walking on the road, we may stumble upon a stone that we hadn't noticed before. This stumble metaphorically represents stumbling into cessation. However, as mentioned earlier, with more time spent in the state of neither perception, we may experience subtle dreamlike states or a loss of perception. We may not be fully aware of what is happening, but our mindfulness is still present, observing something. This state becomes more familiar and comfortable with prolonged practice. We become skilled and confident with this state, continuing to practice neither perception. Eventually, we develop a fine balance in observing the mind. However, the mind is very sneaky and can slip away many times. There are moments when we think, Today is a good day for me. I think I'm going to experience cessation. Yet, it doesn't happen, leading to disappointment. The next day we try again, hoping for a different outcome, but once again, cessation does not occur. We try every day, analyzing what we may have done wrong or what we could have done differently. However, the more we try, the more elusive cessation becomes. It's a paradoxical situation. Trying alone does not yield results. It's not about trying, but about preparing and doing. It's about setting the right conditions that will lead us to cessation. So don't try to prepare. Just do the work and see how it goes. I know it can be tricky, but I would suggest making some preparations and then giving it a try. It's like throwing pebbles into a pond and observing what happens. Just give it a shot, let it be, and observe the results. It's similar to the concept of knocking a mango off a tree with a branch lying on the ground. We don't anticipate retrieving the branch, we simply focus on dislodging the mango. If the mango falls, great. If we lose the branch or the object used to knock it down, it doesn't matter. We develop a natural tendency to let things go. With that attitude, the experience of cessation can become a reality and yield results fairly quickly. Yeah, I know these words may not provide complete assurance, but they highlight the paradoxes and illusions of the mind. The more we want something, the more it seems to elude us. The Buddha has said in a few places that whatever we conceive, it turns out to be the opposite. The act of conceiving or imagining is precisely what we need to let go of in order to experience what is known as the conceptless state. It's counterintuitive, but that's how it works. And it's not just an intellectual understanding. It requires taking certain actions. It's like cooking something and tasting it. No matter how much people describe the taste, it's always different from actually experiencing it. The same applies to what we need to experience in the mind. Sometimes words fall short and cannot adequately describe or capture the experience. However, we can still have a plan or strategy to sit in meditation in a way that makes it easier 
or more conducive to experiencing cessation. That's what I'm trying to convey in this conversation. This is how we gradually come to understand the paradox and break through it. As the Buddha says in the Pothapada Sutta, the experience of jhanas involves a coarser perception that gradually ceases with each higher jhana stage. As we progress to higher jhanas, perception becomes finer and finer until only the subtlest perception remains. This process of refinement is akin to removing all dependencies of the mind, with the ultimate goal being a state of assetlessness or non-identification. Cessation refers to the state of not identifying with anything that arises and ceases, allowing the experience to occur naturally. I would like to mention a helpful practice called determination practice. As we become comfortable with experiencing the jhanas, this practice helps stabilize and train the mind to stay in a specific state. While we understand that we cannot make the jhanas last for a specific duration, determination practice involves lightly instructing the mind to remain in a particular jhana for a set period of time. For example, we can instruct the mind to sustain the first jhana for 30 minutes. It's important to approach this practice with a light attitude, simply giving the instruction to the mind. By doing so, the mind aligns with our determination and remains in the chosen jhana for as long as we have determined. If we want to remain in a particular jhana for a specific duration, whether it's 15 seconds, 15 minutes, or half an hour, we can set an intention before starting our meditation session. For example, we might say, it's 9 gaud a.m. in the morning, and I will emerge from the second jhana exactly at the 35-minute mark. Then we begin our practice. The mind will naturally align itself and bring about the experience of the second jhana. We can observe how the mind signals us as we approach the 35-minute mark. We will notice it nearing almost 35 minutes, and there might be a subtle shift or sensation in the mind indicating that the time is up. We can develop a determination practice for all the jhanas, including the first, second, third, and fourth jhana, as well as the arupa states of infinite space, infinite consciousness, base of nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. We can instruct our mind to sustain any of these states for a specific amount of time. All we need to do is tell our mind, this is the time I have, and I will emerge from this state after this duration. Show me whatever you can. Then we leave the rest to the mind. It will manage the timer and guide us through these states. All we need to do is practice TWIM, 6R, and step aside when the mind grasps onto anything. After practicing this determination for some time, the mind will naturally become comfortable and act as an extremely faithful servant, understanding and following the instructions given to it. It's not us commanding, but rather the mind being instructed. Give clear instructions to the mind that you are requesting this experience and kindly ask it to fulfill this request. It's similar to a scenario in a restaurant where there is a menu and the food is being ordered. There is no customer, just clear instructions being given and the mind will prepare and deliver that experience at the specified time. This determination practice is extremely helpful in preparing us to experience cessation as well. While many teachers recommend practicing determination, after attaining the stages of Sotapanna or Sakadagami, I don't see any harm in practicing determination if we have a good balance of mind and are adept at sitting and practicing. This practice of determination can actually propel us towards cessation more quickly. There have been cases where individuals have spent many years and attended numerous 10-day retreats without experiencing cessation. This is often due to lingering notions, anticipation, eagerness, or inquiries that keep them in the state of neither perception nor non-perception, hindering progression towards cessation. Practicing determination can be helpful in overcoming these obstacles and using intention wisely to set the course. So, if we are skilled in practicing this determination in all the jhanas, we can also experiment by saying, Okay, mind, I want to see what happens after this state of neither perception. I'll leave it up to you. Show me whatever you can. I will continue to let go. Allow the mind to program itself and show us what it has in store. This approach acknowledges that we are not in the driver's seat. We are not controlling the mind. We are simply allowing it to perform its functions. We are like someone clicking a button to run a command. Whatever happens is like a black box. We don't need to know the details. The mind will self-regulate and do its best to bring about the requested experience. So, there isn't much more we can do about it. 
and this process will unfold naturally. This is how I see this unfolding, and it can be a deeply rewarding experience to witness directly. It might happen that we stumble upon cessation for the first time, and that's it. The mind completely lets go of everything and stops engaging with all formations. Now, the mind is in a state of complete stillness and remains in that state for however long it can or has been programmed to. We have no control over the duration. It stays in the cessation state for whatever period it can manage. If we are at the first attainment of Sotapanna, which occurs when someone glimpses Nibbana through experiencing Niroda, and upon returning, we will observe exactly how the mind operates. The pattern or DNA of the mind unravels itself. With ignorance as a condition, formations arise. With formations as a condition, consciousness arises. With consciousness as a condition, name and form arise. With name and form as a condition, the six sense bases arise, and so on. According to what is stated in the texts, these phenomena appear within awareness. At the first stage of awakening as a Sotapanna, these may manifest just as some vibrations or bundles of energy in the mind. The mind has made contact with the Nibbana element, the realm of the unconditioned. We have seen it like a flash of lightning and realized it is empty and completely free of any tendencies. There are three types of contact. Emptiness contact, undirected contact, and desirelessness contact. This contact with the Nibbana element will occur, and when we emerge from it, we will witness the arising of the links of dependent origination for the first time. It is a vivid experience, like something shaky or vibrating. It feels very significant, as if something major has happened in our life. It's almost unbelievable. This will be our first encounter with the stream of Dhamma. The cessation of the finest formations, perception and feeling, leads us to what is called stream entry. At this stage, we are still novices in the sport, just tasting the initial flavor of success. We haven't had enough time to even observe it. We merely touched it and moved away. There was nothing we could describe because as soon as we tried to see it, it was gone. The contact had occurred, but we weren't trained enough to stay in the awakened state. We touched it and moved away because our feelings and perceptions prevented us from seeing it clearly. This is how the experience occurs for the first time. The notion of identification arises and prevents us from clearly seeing the links of dependent origination. Similar to practicing jhanas or the formless realms, the experience of cessation is a state we can enter and return from through training. Through practice, we establish a track record and become familiar with how to experience it. We have developed our mind to achieve balance in all situations, chosen the right time and taken the necessary steps to tranquilize the activities of our mind and body. All the awakening factors have been balanced, leading us to a state where we are not aware of anything. The mind goes blank as the faculty by which it experiences the world has stopped. As we continue this practice, it also becomes integrated into our daily life. We don't consider cessation to be a big deal because as we test it, it fades away. The mind simply enters this state, and we don't know how long it lasts. It could be a few seconds or longer. All we know is that we come out of it, and the world arises along with our awareness from an empty state. There was nothing, no perception, no consciousness. All six senses were completely absent, and now they gradually return. It's like watching a movie that emerges from a blank screen. The images gradually form from complete emptiness, and after a certain time, the full picture emerges. Emerging from cessation will not be an abrupt appearance out of nowhere, it will be a gradual process. We will hear tiny, tiny sounds, and those sounds will gradually increase to normal volume or level. After we emerge from cessation, the senses will return to exactly where they were before. The emergence occurs in very fine, gradual steps. This is how the experience of coming out of cessation feels initially. It's a perfecting of the art of sitting without any expectations. As I mentioned earlier, it marks a great achievement in human existence as the ocean of suffering has been let go and will never arise again. Experiencing cessation in this way also means we have glimpsed Nibbana and are heading towards it in a definitive sense. That's it. It's a definitive state. We will attain Nibbana in this very life. It is the most sublime state of practice on the Buddha's path, the culmination of the Noble Eightfold Path. This can be attained by anyone. It doesn't require rigorous training or great effort. 
we can experience cessation in as little as 10, 15 minutes or half an hour. However, initially, it may take longer to develop enough dispassion to experience this. As time goes on, we can experience cessation within minutes or few tens of minutes. It's all about following the right path and mastering the art of sitting in practice, following the Noble Eightfold Path. Chapter 18. Where is Nibbana? There is, meditators, that realm wherein there is neither earth, nor water, nor fire, nor air, neither the realm of infinity of space, nor that of infinity of consciousness, nor that of nothingness, nor that of neither perception nor non-perception, wherein is neither this world, nor a world beyond, nor moon, nor sun. There, meditators, I declare, is no coming, no going, no stopping, no passing away, and no arising. It is not established, it continues not, it has no object. This indeed is the end of suffering. Udana 8.1 Parinibbana This chapter is based on a work I did based on a YouTube Dhamma talk in November 2023. I thought it would be a good idea to create some notes around the experience of the third noble truth, which is the cessation of all suffering. I have covered a lot on the analysis of suffering, the process, and the mechanisms around how suffering comes about. I have already done an extensive analysis of the links of dependent origination, which is central to the notion of suffering, the Buddha's awakening, and his unique discovery. Before the Buddha, people couldn't even contemplate that suffering could be made extinct through practice. Most believed that suffering was an inherent part of our existence. However, the Buddha proved it is optional and revealed the conditional nature of reality and a happiness that is free of all conditions. Today we accept pain, anguish, jealousy, and many other tendencies as human nature, believing there is nothing we can do about it. Conventional wisdom considers accepting this as insight. The Buddha's discovery challenged this notion. If we accept that suffering is all there is in life, then what is happiness? Is it just a fleeting experience that we can never truly possess? Are we doomed to be immersed in suffering, catching only brief glimpses of happiness, while suffering constantly looms over us? The Buddha's quest was to find a happiness not subject to any conditions in the universe. I have covered the Buddha's quest in Chapter 11. I gave a Dhamma talk for friends in Asia who are very active in practicing and teaching the Dhamma. I had the opportunity to present my thoughts and experiences around the Buddha's noble quest, as detailed in the Majjhima Nikaya 26 Arya Pariyasana Sutta. In this chapter, instead of focusing on analyses of phenomena, suffering, and other familiar topics, I am dedicating it to some basic questions. What is Nibbana? What is this all about? We have been given a general understanding of Nibbana as an experience beyond description and imagination. It's true that the experience of Nibbana is beyond the realm of logic and reasoning. I understand that trying to explain Nibbana with words does not fully capture the subtleties of the Dhamma. However, there is a burning question among millions who know that Nibbana is a great achievement and a worthwhile objective for humans. There is a lack of understanding and first-hand experience of what it truly is. If I can fill a bit of this void with my explanation and understanding, I will consider this attempt successful. So I will try to explain what is Nibbana, where is Nibbana. The template for this work focuses on four subtopics of the Nibbana element. We can consider Nibbana as a dimension or a realm, also called an ayatana, or base. It is also called an element or datu, and can be as simple as the end of suffering. The everyday understanding of the third noble truth, or the cessation of suffering. First, I'll explore the search for Nibbana, the drive and the factors that lead humans to seek the path to experiencing Nibbana. Second, I'll discuss the end of suffering. What do we mean by the end of suffering? How can we gain a deeper, experiential understanding of what this end of suffering is all about? Third, I'll cover the actual practice, the path the Buddha has given us, detailing the milestones we progressively see ourselves reaching as we traverse this path, finally arriving at that state. I will add my personal experiences, understanding, and analysis to provide perspective on what this path truly is. This will be aimed at those with some experiential understanding as well as those who are completely new to this path. My explanations may be received differently depending on the reader's level of experiential understanding. Some may resonate well with those on the same plateau or in a similar field as I am. 
while others might find it completely alien or hard to accept. I'll try to cover both perspectives, hoping it will be useful in both ways. Finally, I will explain the experience and essence of this state. I would like to relate the experience of Nibbana to just one word, relief. I equate the state of Nibbana with the greatest relief we have ever had. Let's not expand this experience in terms of happiness, pleasure, joy, or pain. Let's focus on one particular experience, and that experience is relief. This word sums up all my experiences and practice, and I would like to confine my explanation of Nibbana to this word, relief. So without any further introduction, I will delve into this topic. What is the search for Nibbana? First of all, this is an extraordinary search. There is a sutta where the Buddha said that people will be driven to find the end of suffering when they experience a lot of suffering. They will either go crazy due to the overwhelming amount of suffering and engage in activities to suppress or evade it temporarily, or they will take a step back and reflect, what is this suffering? These contemplative individuals understand that the quest to alleviate suffering through pleasure and temporary gratification is a futile and never-ending pursuit that will not lead to long-term happiness. Those who take the second path realize there is another way beyond seeking pleasure and gratification. They follow some form of spiritualism, engage in meditation, and similar activities to calm the mind. This approach was prevalent during the Buddha's time and is even more prevalent today. It involves calming the mind, following the path of tranquility to eliminate agitation and distractions. People achieve this through soothing music, creating a tranquil setting away from the crowd and engaging in meditative experiences where they suppress hindrances and mental proliferation by focusing their attention on a particular object and diverting their mind away from distractions, believing they can eliminate suffering. In this context, I want to highlight the Buddha's novel contribution to the world, which can be seen as follows. If the Buddha had to justify his contribution, it wouldn't be about suppressing mental activities at all. Some Buddhist teachers believe that suppression of hindrances, thoughts and concepts is what the Buddha taught. But his contribution to the humanity in ending suffering is the complete letting go and pacification of all these mental activities, including not engaging with hindrances or any other mental states. Even the term pacification or tranquilization can be confusing to some. What I want to clarify is that his approach of pacification isn't an active or first-person activity. The exact word used by the Buddha is pasambhaya, which means pacification. By its very nature, pacification signifies that it is not an active process, and there are no first-person activities involved. Pacification involves removing the I, or the first-person attitude, allowing the process to unfold naturally, and letting it calm itself. It's akin to releasing gas from a car, where instead of trying to increase tranquility actively, we bring tranquility by letting go, relaxing, and stepping away. This is what Pasambhaya means. The unique contribution of the Buddha is called Sabe Sankara Samatho, or the pacification or soothing of all formations. He showed the Samatha, stillness, and Vipassana, clear observation path for the freedom of the mind. While they may seem like separate practices, they actually come together as a unified process. It's not about practicing samatha and vipassana separately at different times. The Buddha's practice involves both samatha and vipassana working together. I once used an example in a workshop in Nepal, comparing it to a roof with two sides supporting each other. The combination of samatha and vipassana can penetrate subtler truths, not by working independently, but by working synergistically. The term synergy is useful here. It's like one plus one equals more than two or we can say 1 plus 1 equals 3. This means it's more than just the sum of the two. When we combine samatha and vipassana in such a way that they support each other, it pierces the matter and goes beyond the usual expectation of 1 plus 1 equals 2. This is how I describe the Buddha's unique and original discovery that unlocked the state of Nibbana. Nibbana is not something millions or billions of light years away. It's right in front of us. The state of Nibbana is tucked beneath each of our experiences. This dimension is somehow not visible to us because we are always looking at the wrong thing. It's as if we're looking at the universe through glasses that filter out the state of Nibbana. Instead of seeing Nibbana as it is, we see a filtered, colored version that is entirely different. If we could just tweak that filter a bit, 
Nibbana would be right in front of us, like looking through clear glass. Essentially, we're seeing through something that obscures this experience. If we know what is blocking this vision, Nibbana is right in front of us. Like any discovery or advancement in science or the material universe, such as nuclear energy, the recipe for Nibbana remains obscured until a Buddha unravels it. Nuclear energy has been with us since time immemorial. Every atom and molecule have the potential to generate an immense amount of power, yet we were burning firewood and coal, probably burning trillions of molecules and atoms to generate just one joule of energy. However, nuclear energy has existed from the beginning of this universe. Even more potent is the fusion of electrons and protons. By fusing two hydrogen atoms to form helium, limitless energy can be generated. Some people may believe that unlocking this energy will bring ultimate happiness. Scientists are good at exploring deep natural phenomena to unlock material outcomes that we humans desire in terms of seeing, hearing, and experiencing through senses. All the inventions and discoveries provide us with artifacts that please our senses. However, the Buddha's discovery is that we don't need all these sensory experiences to find ultimate happiness. This is what I'm trying to cover in this discussion. Finding the original words of the Buddha is not easy today. Over the 2600 years since his time, there has been a proliferation of ideas and concepts about what the Buddha taught. Even within the Buddhist community, including Mahayana, Theravada, and others, it is challenging to find the words spoken by the historical Buddha. They have expanded his teachings so much that it is difficult to discern exactly what he said. I searched for many years until someone mentioned the Nikayas to me. These words caught my attention. I thought, let me find out what's in those books, like the Majima Nikaya. I was blown away because those texts talk about direct experiences without any philosophies. In the suttas, we never find philosophies. They are pure, like hardwood. They explain what the mind and experience are all about. Every word of the Buddha is focused on direct experiences. I listened to the majority of the suttas, and one thing that struck me was that the Buddha talks about the four jhanas. He also discusses the arupas, dependent origination, the five aggregates, and the seven factors of awakening. These terms make sense because they are mentioned repeatedly. The Buddha's discovery can actually be summed up in very few words. Conditioned experiences, the arising and cessation of the five aggregates, and how suffering can be completely let go. If we can understand how phenomena arise dependently, we can also understand that they can cease, or be prevented from arising, to be more accurate. This sums up all the teachings of the Buddha. Suffering is a phenomenon that can be completely prevented. That's how I delved into the teachings of the Buddha and understood them in a direct experiential way. It's about quenching our thirst, which the Buddha unraveled as the recipe for quenching. Thirst, or craving in general, is what we're all experiencing in this world. We encounter many philosophies, ideas, and concepts, but they will never quench our thirst. Quenching the thirst is to personally directly experience the state of quenching, nibbana. In Pali, it's called tanha, which means thirst. I used to be very philosophical many years ago. I listened to eclectic music and searched for latest discoveries of other corners of the universe, looking for life on other planets and speculating about parallel universes and multiverses. I was immersed in that dimension of the never-ending loop of concepts, ideas, and seeing people refuting each other's ideas and claims. Human experiences are often about proving that one is better than others. But in the Dhamma, it's about letting go of all that comparison, measurement, and conceit. The Buddha's discovery is that there is an end to all these concepts. When we let go of all the concepts, we find the greatest peace, the end of suffering. Letting go of concepts is the greatest relief. I will read quite a few of the suttas around the topic of Nibbana. I have shared my confused state of many years back, around 2014-2015, and how I started to understand the suttas after a while. I was looking for ways to directly experience what is being spoken of in the suttas. Now, many years later, when I look back ten years, I feel much less desperate. I've moved beyond the notions of suffering and feel safer to know that there is a way out of all suffering. The world appears completely different when one truly sees the depth of the Dhamma. People who don't have first-hand experience of meditation may not agree. 
They might say, what are we doing with meditation? I'm not seeing any new benefit from it. But if we meditate correctly, by letting go of all conceit and personalization, it's not about what we gain, it's more about what we abandon. We abandon insecurity, fear, unease and anguish. That is what the Buddha's practice is all about. It's not about amassing experiences, it's about letting go of all experiences, leading to emptiness, independence and freedom. The Buddha says this universe is going one way, and he is going the opposite way. Whatever people in this universe think is happiness, in his teachings leads to suffering. And whatever they say is suffering, that is happiness. This is the exact opposite, because the universe considers gaining as happiness. But in the Buddha's path, losing is happiness. This is how I would describe how different we are from the worldly pursuit. It may seem strange, but hopefully, those who have experienced it, agree with what I am saying. There may be people who ask questions like, what is beyond all these worldly pleasures and happiness? Can we ever achieve freedom that is not subject to life and death experiences? There is an experience. We cannot measure or describe the state of Nibbana using conditioned phenomena and experiences. We can only experience that state. I would use one word for that. Relief. I would describe all experiences as either relief or non-relief. The state of Nibbana is relief and everything else falls into the other bucket. All these experiences, whether they are of jhanas, arupas or worldly joy and happiness, like holidays or nice cars, can be categorized as either relief or non-relief. What I mean by relief and non-relief is that the state of Nibbana is the ultimate relief from being conditioned. It is not conditioned by any experiences, not confined to any particular time and space. It is devoid of and completely free from all the notions we are accustomed to. I often give an example of a toad and a turtle in a pond. There was a turtle and a toad in a pond. One day the turtle somehow went to the forest. When the turtle came back, the toad asked, Where did you go? I didn't see you all day. The turtle said, I went to the forest. It's a completely different place, nothing like what we see here. The toad replied, what you're saying is completely nonsense. There is no such thing as a forest. What you're saying makes no sense at all. The state of Nibbana can be like that for worldly people. The experience of relief is incomprehensible and cannot be described through the senses. The state of Nibbana is beyond the senses. It's just a different experience. I could go on like this for a long time, but let me read some of the profound words from the Buddha to bring some context. I will pick some suttas from the Udana. Sutanipata. The Udana contains some of the most profound experiences that the Buddha found joy in describing. With them, we can get a glimpse or a deeper understanding of what made the Buddha utter them with joy when talking about the state of Nibbana. Although it is hard to describe, it is an experience that he wanted to convey to inspire us to practice. Actually, the Buddha did want to convey that the state of Nibbana is an extraordinary experience that inspires joy even when one attempts to describe it. This one, truly a masterpiece, here in Udana 8.1, the Buddha says, There is, meditators, that realm wherein there is neither earth, nor water, nor fire, nor air, neither the realm of infinity of space, nor that of infinity of consciousness, nor that of nothingness, nor that of neither perception, nor non-perception, wherein is neither this world, nor a world beyond, nor moon, nor sun. There, meditators, I declare is no coming, no going, no stopping, no passing away, and no arising. It is not established, it continues not, it has no object. This indeed is the end of suffering. We can write millions of words about the experience captured in these few verses. So what is this state of Nibbana? The Buddha describes it as a realm, base, dimension, or ayatana in Pali. Nibbana is a dimension. Here, dimension does not necessarily mean it has the qualities of length, breadth, and height, which are the three dimensions we are accustomed to. It can also refer to an experiential dimension. The Buddha is saying that there is an experience where there are no four great elements. This is the state of being liberated from all kinds of materiality. Materiality becomes a reality only when there is a mental counterpart, which we call Nama Rupa. Nama Rupa and consciousness when they come together, result in the emergence of the world. The world and observer arise with Nama Rupa and consciousness. When we break down Nama Rupa, 
Rupa represents the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air. Nama encompasses feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. Nama Rupa signifies a description of experiences that register in our minds in terms of those four properties, solidity, cohesion, heat, and vibration. These are how the four great elements manifest in our experiences, and the mind interprets them in terms of these properties. When these phenomena come into contact with feeling, perception, intention, and attention, the Nama aspects, things manifest and turn into experiences. We experience these four great elements through the faculties of feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. When there is contact, for example, when our sense bases come into contact with these four great elements, then dependent on that contact, feeling arises. With feeling as a condition, what arises is perception. When there is perception, we start to tag those experiences. Feeling gives rise to perception, indicating that this is something nameable. In fact, perception is called sana in Pali, which means sangya or name in English. So perception is a process of giving a name. Perception gives us an understanding, such as, okay, this experience has the property of heat. It feels hot. This understanding comes from the feeling. With feeling, perception associates that experience with previous experiences of heat. Otherwise, heat might be completely unknown, because the mind has not experienced it before. Once the mind registers this particular phenomenon as heat, perception has performed its function. Immediately following perception, there arises the inquiry, what is this? This inquiry is known as vinana, or consciousness. When there's a feeling and perception, consciousness comes into the picture immediately. Feeling and perception support consciousness, and consciousness solidifies the experience. At this point, we have an identification of me versus the experience. After identification, we have intention. Intention drives activities motivating us to pursue or avoid the identified experience. It's like recognizing that something is hot and feeling the need to address it immediately. This intention can manifest in various activities involving the body, speech, and mind. Intention plays a key role in generating what is called sankara. All these phenomena are interconnected, like a single fabric. Intention, followed by attention, drives further engagement with these phenomena, Attention fuels the subsequent prolonging of this engagement. It's like tilting the balance, either towards pursuing the object or staying away from it. This balance tends to flip from one side to the other in the human mind, and this tendency is what we call craving. The mind is always in a state of fluctuation, either leaning toward pleasure or avoiding pain. It can never achieve perfect equilibrium unless there is mental development. Without this development, we fall into the trap of constantly juggling between these two aspects of our experiences, whether they are pleasurable or painful. This constant fluctuation creates an urge and desire to engage more or to distance ourselves from these experiences, fueling the cycle of what is known as bhava, or the seed for the continuation of samsara. We prolong our experiences by consistently falling into these two buckets, either pursuing or avoiding. This is the state of mind that people find themselves in when they haven't learned how to recognize and remain unaffected by feelings and perceptions. Now let's discuss the state where there are no four great elements. The four great elements represent a dimension of materiality, something external to our mind and body. On the other side, there exists another dimension, the state of mind characterized by the perception of the base of infinity of space and so on. The mind processes these four great elements as perceptions of form. They give rise to appearances in terms of shape, size, temperature, and other attributes. This is what we refer to as rupa, which literally means appearance. On the flip side, we have experiences in terms of forms, which can be classified into form and formless realms. The state of nibbana transcends both realms. The formless realms include perceptions related to the base of infinity of space infinity of consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. These are all bases of perception, inherently tied to the mind and its objects, where there is no physical aspect and experiences occur purely in the realm of the mind and its objects. Nibbana doesn't fit into the categories of this world or the other world. It can't be classified as part of Earth or any other exoplanet. 
We might liken the other world to a place where life exists. Like a living planet around the nearest neighbor of the sun, Alpha Centauri, but Nibbana transcends all such categorizations. It's neither this world nor the other world in terms of experiences. It's not this world, and it's not even the jhanas or arupas. It doesn't fall into any of those categories. It's neither sun nor moon, meaning it's not physical. All these experiences come and go, arise and cease. Nibbana does not exhibit coming and going like worldly experiences do. Arising and ceasing, we all know that phenomena arise and cease, including jhanas and arupas. But for a mind at total peace, these are just vibrations, a jolt, an aberration, some disturbance. Let's say there is a very still lake. The state of Nibbana is like that, a still lake with no ripples. The ripples are all phenomena. When we talk about feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention, these are all ripples that oscillate the serene state of the mind that is in perfect balance. Nibbana is devoid of all these ripples. Nibbana has three properties. It is unestablished, unmoving and supportless. In Pali, these are apatititam, apavatam, anaramanam. Patititam means it is established, and the prefix a means negative, i.e. it is unestablished, it doesn't need to land anywhere. Apavatam means it's not moving, it's not shaking, it stays still. Anaramanam means that it doesn't need any support, it is not dependent. These three distinct properties of Nibbana all point to the same thing. The mind is completely still, devoid of all oscillation. When we arrive at the state where all layers have been completely removed, it becomes completely empty and devoid of all artifacts. This state embodies all three properties. It is unestablished, it doesn't shake, and it is supportless. I understand that describing such a profound experience is challenging, and even words and grammar in various forms of literature are insufficient to fully convey it. I have no way of fully explaining what this experience is all about, and I must admit that I'm not claiming to know all the aspects of the state of Nibbana. My descriptions are based on what I've seen and experienced. I can estimate what it must be like, but I cannot fully convey the complete experience in words. It is quite tricky, and I acknowledge that it is challenging to articulate. All I can say is that it is an incredibly valuable experience, and any form of explanation to the world is a bonus. There are likely many other meditators who have glimpsed the state of Nibbana and have described it in different terms and described different experiences. However, I thought that since I am undertaking this as a personal project, I can perhaps tick some of those boxes for anyone who might find them helpful and inspire them to search for such an experience. If I can raise some questions or spark curiosity in others to explore this path further, I will be extremely delighted and satisfied. However, I would like to emphasize that the state of Nibbana should not be viewed in the same way as worldly acquisitions or worldly happiness achieved through accumulating experiences. Instead, we should consider it from a completely different perspective, as if we are changing the lens through which we view the world. Let's flip the coin and consider Nibbana from the perspective of happiness. It is the ultimate happiness, where we are free from fear, pain, death, and other worldly suffering. We are liberated from the perpetual fluctuation between pleasure and pain, which disturbs the balance of the mind. We are no longer subject to the destiny of suffering that feeling entails so we will never be subject to being affected by feeling. Being freed from this, I believe, is the most sublime happiness. That's what I would like to convey here. And it is also found in a sutta where Sariputta uses this expression to describe Nibbana. Another great sutta about the experience of Nibbana is in the Udana 1.10, the Bahia Sutta. It describes exactly what the Buddha says about the experience of Bahia a wanderer who attained the state of Nibbana within a few minutes of meeting the Buddha. So what is this state? In the Sutta, it says that if one simply lets go of any movement, any shaking of experiences, and allows them to drop when they arise by getting out of their way, just that is the end of suffering, Nibbana. What the Buddha says is simply this. In seeing, there is just seeing. In hearing, just hearing. And in tasting, just tasting. When the notion of you is not there, you are neither here nor there, nor in between. That is simply the end of suffering. This means that all the sensations and experiences of the universe have been there since time immemorial. Don't instigate them. 
just drop any involvement. When they enter conscious awareness, they begin to create ripples. Being conscious means supporting phenomena. All we need to do is step aside and allow these phenomena to flow. When we are not there to interfere, they become still. There is nothing there. It becomes like a vast expanse of water. The state of Nibbana is just like that. A brief explanation of the state of Nibbana by the Buddha. It's just a process. There's no need for involvement, interference or engagement. Just let the phenomena flow. And because of non-association and non-involvement, these phenomena will settle and disappear for good. They will never arise again when the experience ripens. That's the state that the Buddha describes. And Bahia understood it. He dropped all the notions and saw that thunderbolt, that glimpse of Nibbana. His mind was very ripe, and all fetters and bonds were ready to be broken. We can compare it to a fuse. When there's a current passing through a fuse, and for Bahia, the fuse was blown, never to be patched up again. Then he had an accident and died. The Buddha said to the bhikkhus, Look, he's one of your companions in the holy life. The Buddha delighted in seeing this state, saying, Where neither water nor yet earth, nor fire nor air gain a foothold, there gleam no stars, no sun sheds light, there shines no moon, yet there no darkness reigns, when a sage, a Brahmin, has come to know this. For himself, through his own wisdom, then he is freed from form and formless, freed from pleasure and from pain. I talked about form and formless realms. The four great elements and sense experiences are related to the form realm, whereas the formless realm is where there is just the mind and its objects. In the form realm, there is no sensuality. It's just the experience of form without active engagement with sensuality. The form realm transcends this universe. When the contraction and dissolution of this universe occur, beings spontaneously appear in the Abhasara Brahma realm, a form, Rupa realm. They are not subject to the contraction and dissolution of the universe. We don't need to worry about what happens after a big crunch when the universe contracts, fearing that everyone will perish. Beings who have not let go of craving will appear in that form realm when the universe contracts. During one cycle of contraction of the universe, there is no life here. When the universe starts to expand again, beings will reappear. This is in the Diga Nikaya 27, Agana Sutta, on knowledge of the beginning. The Buddha says that beings will remain trapped in this cycle indefinitely until they find a way out of samsara. They are like prisoners of this universe. Even if this universe dissolves, they will migrate to another prison, which is the form realm, and then return to this universe once again. In some sense, beings are like debtors who have not paid their debt, always subject to being transferred from one place to another, from the universe to the form realm, and from the form realm to the formless realm, and so on. They are constantly being transferred because they have not settled their account with the universe for good. The formless Arupa realm is another side, another dimension where beings have suppressed all experiences of feeling and perception of the four great elements. Due to this suppression and separation from physical experiences, they have entered the realm of the mind where they may remain for many eons. This universe, the Rupa, and Arupa realms are abundant with beings, always full of visitors. We are the visitors, but we don't hold a card to choose which realm to visit and exit. Our destiny is chosen by our deeds and experiences. What propels us from one realm to another? It's the current of dependent origination. Dependent origination sweeps all beings from one realm to another because we didn't see through these conditioned experiences and got carried away. We didn't see how the process works, creating a never-ending loop that sustains samsara. So I hope this provides some words of security and assurance that not being subject to the destiny of becoming prisoners of our destiny is real happiness, as that is the ultimate freedom. Our greatest security and safety lie not in those form realms, formless realms, or in the sensual universe. All these experiences, all these dimensions are conditioned, and because of this conditioning, we are always subject to pleasure, pain, suffering, and other phenomena that impinge on our experiences. Because of the inherent nature of these phenomena, we cannot avoid suffering. Pleasure and pain, although pleasure is seen as a form of happiness, are essentially the same. 
The Buddha said that pleasure is just a temporary evasion of reality. It's like a veil, and pleasure and pain are two sides of the same coin, as Bhante Vimalaramsi used to say. All there is are just fleeting phenomena. What we can say with absolute certainty is that any pleasure is conditioned by contact. One tweak of contact, and we go from pleasurable feeling to painful, and from painful to pleasurable instantly. We can test this ourselves by trying different things with our body, and we can bring about different experiences. If we cross a certain limit, we go from pleasure to pain, and from pain to pleasure. Actually, if we look back, pleasure and pain are just vibrations conditioned by contact. Now what is this experience of freedom then? There is no form, no formless, no world, no sun, no moon. What is that experience? It's the experience of being freed from all kinds of sense impingement, or as I said, being devoid of feeling, so we will never be subject to pleasure and pain. This is the greatest happiness. The one word that describes it is the state where we are never contacted through sense bases by sense objects. Imagine never being cut by a blade, never being chopped by a sword, never being burned in a fire, never freezing in cold temperatures, or being stranded in the Arctic, or falling off a cliff. Look at that relief. We are never subject to these kinds of destinies, so we never have to worry about being dismissed from a job. Falling from a cliff, being swept away by a flood, being crushed by an earthquake, or dealing with any disasters. We never need to worry about what food we need to eat, because all our needs are gone. There's no hunger, no discomfort. We don't need to find any of these things. All these needs will go away. If there is no need, why worry about driving a car, going on holiday, or finding all these things? In the state of Nibbana, all needs and prerequisites vanish. That's it, no more conditioning. That is the greatest happiness. We should understand the state of Nibbana in this way. Nibbana is free from all forms and formlessness and is not subject to space and time. We are not subject to the time domain, the space domain, or any fabrications. None of these fabrications can find footing in the state of the unconditioned. They are all conditioned experiences. Time is a conditioned experience. Space is a conditioned experience. The form realm is a conditioned experience and the formless realm is a conditioned experience. When all those conditioned experiences go away, all conditions, needs, requirements, and prerequisites are already gone. We are never subject to any conditioned experiences, as they only find support when there is an asset. But Nibbana is assetless, an experience-less experience. The Buddha talked about this in one Dhammapada verse, explaining what this experience is. In verse 3 of Sutta number 348, Buddha addresses a person named Ugasena, who was an acrobat performing daring acts on a bamboo pole. The Buddha said to him, Now you are in a very precarious position. If you just let go of any concerns about what has passed and refrain from pursuing what is yet to come, don't dwell on the past or focus on the future, and even let go of considerations about what lies in between. Then, if you remain in the present we can think of it as a dimensionless state. The Buddha is saying there is a state not confined to any specific space or time. When we've let go of everything, all that remains is this dimensionless experience, and that dimensionless experience is the ultimate happiness. When we momentarily realize and release everything, we unlock the exit from this universe to the realm of the unconditioned. So what this sutta is saying is that there is a state where the mind is released in every way. The mind is released from the present, the past, the future, from before and after, from the middle, up and down, from everywhere. It's released from all directions. All the layers have been removed, leaving it completely empty and in a perfectly still state, which is the state referred to as Nibbana. In this state, the mind never returns to birth and decay. This means that birth and decay are outcomes and fabrications of those layers, layers of perception, contact, consciousness, and so on. These phenomena arise when we engage with them. If we do not engage, they do not arise. It's similar to concepts in physics, particularly in particle physics, regarding the role of the observer. For example, there is a particle, and that particle remains a particle if an observer is present. However, when no observer is there, that particle can appear as a wave. The particle can manifest anywhere until observed. These things occur based on observation. 
What I'm saying is that if we become an observer, phenomena become a reality. Without an observer, there is no manifestation of a wave-like phenomenon or particle. To clarify, I may want to discuss the double-slit experiment, where particles appear both like waves and particles, depending on whether there is an observer. If I let go of the role of the observer, I should not witness any of these phenomena. There should be no appearance of interference patterns in the double-slit experiment if the concept of an observer is let go. This is akin to what the Buddha is teaching. When we let go of the notion of an observer, all the things we perceive as arising will simply disappear, as they are just potential. In the state of Nibbana, there is no observation, no particle, and no wave. All of them have ceased because we didn't engage in observation. Interestingly, on the Buddha's path, we begin the process with observation, the four satipatthana, where we observe the mind, body, and mind objects, as well as the dependence of the body and feelings and mind with its objects. We embark on this path through observation. However, when the time is right, we let go of observation, including the first-person perspective. I believe this provides a good sense of what the path to Nibbana entails. It may appear quite intricate for an untrained mind and not something we can fully comprehend by accumulating preconceived notions, concepts, or ideas. Instead, we should think of Nibbana in terms of abandoning and disassociation. This is why Buddha describes Nibbana using negatives. If we were to describe Nibbana in positive terms, it would be what it's all about in the world, wouldn't it? Accumulating happiness and properties. However, this is not what Nibbana is about. Nibbana is about giving up, relinquishing, and being free. That's why the state of Nibbana is described in negatives. This doesn't mean that when we abandon or disassociate, the process of not being associated is a state of annihilation, destruction, or loss. Not being bound, not needing any support, and being dimensionless is a profound happiness. A good testament to this is when we let go of the coarser happiness of the senses and even the first jhana, we arrive at the higher happiness of the second jhana. If we were to cling to the first jhana, we would never have the chance to reach the second jhana. This path involves distancing ourselves from accumulation by progressively abandoning and letting go of experiences. Thus, we experience even higher happiness. We successively let go of all coarser happiness and arrive at even more refined, exquisite and stable happiness. This includes tranquility, joy, happiness, calmness and equanimity, all of which become more and more steady. Nibbana represents the perfect steady state of mind, a state characterized by the complete stillness of the mind. Now let's delve into the third topic, the path. I touched upon the jhana experience earlier. What is jhana? Ten years ago I had only heard the word jhana, and it truly fascinated me. Even the word jhana itself had a special resonance. When I first encountered it, it was a profound moment. The first discourse I read or listened to about jhana was in Majjhima Nikaya 4. In this discourse, the Buddha describes the four jhanas and his own path. He talks about how he let go of all worldly activities, went to the forest, and secluded himself, seeking happiness and peace of mind. Tired of worldly engagements, he wanted to distance himself from the world and ventured into the deepest forests in search of inner peace. The Buddha's discussion of these four jhanas intrigued me greatly, and I felt a strong connection to the experience. It truly resonated with me like a deja vu. The Buddha describes how he became enlightened using jhanas skillfully. He was very descriptive and open about it. He didn't hide or keep the method to himself. He openly shared it with the world, explaining that this is how he experienced Nibbana using the path of jhanas. He provided a step-by-step -step guide, starting with reaching the first jhana. By letting go of sense pleasures and unwholesome states, one progresses to the second, third, and fourth jhanas. These jhanas are associated with a state of fearlessness and freedom from anxiety and dread. Nibbana is synonymous with the state of no fear. The Buddha describes jhanas as temporary liberations from sensory experiences and the five hindrances. These jhanas arise when the mind is sufficiently pure and involve the cessation of hindrances and the arising of specific jhana factors. Some meditation teachers describe jhanas as states of supreme bliss, viewing them as a supreme and completely otherworldly experience to be treasured. However, the Buddha's description of jhana is that it is a superhuman state, beyond the state of being human, 
but it is a temporary, arising and ceasing phenomenon. Jhana arises when other phenomena have ceased. What has ceased is our reaction and craving towards the deviations of our mind, the flip-flopping towards coarser pleasures. By letting them be and not interfering with the process of all phenomena, we remain fairly balanced and the flip-flopping reduces to a vibration. Now we are not so much into pleasure and pain, we have just remained a little bit calmer. That is a dimension outside the sensual world. It's not complete happiness, but jhana is still a coarser type of dimension on the path to nibbana because we have not completely let go of phenomena, never to arise again, as those underlying tendencies have not been uprooted. Our mind is still not 100% immaculately pure. Because those underlying tendencies are still latent in our experiences, we fall into the first jhana, which is the coarsest type of otherworldly happiness. We have just leapt from the world of senses to the first otherworldly platform. But our purification of the mind propelled us only enough to land there. Then we shed more of those underlying tendencies and some reactions to pleasures and pains. With each jhana, our underlying tendency to feelings subsides. Our attitude towards pleasure and pain becomes less in the second jhana. We do not get excited about pleasure and pain. The happiness from jhana is a bit more stable. In the third jhana, we let go of rapturous joy, piti, completely. We are left with what is called sukha. Sukha is free of rapture and excited joy, but there is still some subtle flip-flopping of the mind. In other words, in the third jhana, we let go of that excitement and remain with the happiness and comfort of the body. The third jhana is also described by the Buddha as the pleasure of the body. In the fourth jhana, we let go of both pleasure and pain, so our attention is not pulled by them. We see that this path ultimately leads to nibbana, which is a state of not being subject to the sway of pleasure and pain at all. In the first jhana, we still experience pleasure and joy while having let go of pain. In the second and third jhanas, our attachment to feelings diminishes further. In the fourth jhana, we have relinquished both pleasure and pain, but we are still affected by them. In the state of Nibbana, however, we are completely free from their influence. This is how we can understand the jhanas as a preparation for freedom from feeling. We cannot eliminate feeling by suppressing it entirely or by becoming overly attached to it. There are two types of attitudes towards jhana experiences. Those who experience jhana and wish to enhance it further by immersing themselves in it develop a tendency to be reborn in that realm. If one lacks understanding of the Buddha's teachings and becomes attached to these jhanas, striving to master them, they may be reborn in that realm without comprehending the freedom of nibbana. It is important to note that lifespans of beings in these jhanas are extremely long yet limited in duration. A hundred mahakapas for the first jhana, two hundred for the second, and so forth. These experiences are more refined and sublime, with corresponding subtler sankharas. The mind attains an elevated state because it has been kept free from hindrances. One can attain these states by suppressing the mind or by letting go of unwholesome states, such as refraining from harming living beings. The five precepts. By maintaining these precepts, one can more easily attain the happiness of the jhanas. However, jhanas are like plateaus for meditators. If they do not progress beyond these plateaus, they may remain in these experiences for many mahakapas after their current life, followed by a precipitous descent. The higher one ascends in the jhanas, the greater the potential fall. Even in these exclusive realms, the potential for lower rebirths persists if one does not understand how to be liberated from all conditioned experiences, including the jhanas. Therefore, understanding these underlying tendencies is crucial. If one identifies strongly with the jhanas and views them as personal possessions, one is likely to remain in that plateau of jhana for an extended period. The Buddha's teachings describe jhana as arising and ceasing, simply a conditioned phenomenon. In the suttas, the Buddha advises not to take delight in these jhanas or to identify with them personally. Simply experience the jhanas, let go of them, and continue on the path. We need not become attached to jhanas like we might to external gratifications, sense pleasures. Even though we have let go of the pleasure and joy of sense experiences, we should not become attached to or overly excited about the jhanas. Instead, experience them without personal identification, allowing them to arise and cease naturally. If a jhana arises, 
let it be. If it ceases, let it be. Just observe without becoming overly attached. The more we identify with the jhanas, the more we will chase after them, potentially leading to restlessness or the need to suppress hindrances through other means. Our attitude towards jhanas should be similar to our approach to all distractions, just knowing them for what they are, temporary, dependently originated phenomena. They arise because we have let go of our attachment to sense pleasures. If we remain attached to sense pleasures, the jhanas will not comply with our desires. Through my own experimentation with the nature of jhanas, I have come to the realization, what's the point of being attached to jhanas? They are simply one of the five aggregates, devoid of any substantial essence to identify with. Isn't it? It's just a feeling. Yeah, this feeling isn't me. It's just one of those arising and ceasing, one of those five aggregates. We should treat those jhanas and experiences as one of those aggregates. That's what the Buddha always insisted upon. The Buddha isn't saying that jhana isn't useful. Jhana is useful. Don't identify with it, and don't expend too much effort trying to master jhana. We don't need to master jhanas. That's not the objective. We just need to use them. It's like needing to cross a river. We just need a boat. Whether it's a steamer, a gondola, or a luxury boat doesn't matter. We simply need to cross the river by any means, and that's what counts. It doesn't matter how we cross the river, be it by a royal carriage or anything else, it's inconsequential. The benefit of not being attached to jhana, backing off and letting jhana be, being relaxed, is that the more at ease we are with jhana and just let it be, the more exquisite the experience of jhana becomes. The more effort we put into gaining jhana, the less stable and flakier it becomes. Well, that's a bit counterintuitive, that's not how many people generally describe or experience jhanas. But this is what the Buddha's approach to jhana is all about. Don't worry if the experience of jhana isn't solid. If it's coming and going, that's good. We're being mindful. Just check the boxes that we've been more mindful rather than being obsessed with jhana. So being observant of going in and out of jhana is even better in terms of our practice. Just back off a little bit and that will nicely lead to the next jhana. Each jhana has experiences tied to it, and the more we let go, the finer the perception we arrive at. Jhanas come as a spectrum of perceptions. I mean, all those four jhanas and arupas are in front of us all the time. They aren't waiting to come and present themselves to us. It's just our mind switches from one perception to another. By sufficiently backing off by some amount, a particular jhana becomes manifest. So all the jhanas are in front of us. It's just our perception that's ready to pick them up or not, whether our perception is sharper or blurrier at a given time. That's how we switch from one jhana to another. It's like seeing seven or nine different strands of colors when using a prism. By adjusting its position, we can extract certain colors. It's similar. When the supporting conditions are right, those jhanas will manifest in front of us. They appear to pop out of nowhere. That's what the Buddha implies. Those jhanas as finer perceptions beyond sense perceptions, like switching a lens to see from red to amber and so on. That's how we navigate the full spectrum of jhana. These are like the colors of the light spectrum, with red representing the lowest frequency and blue indicating the highest frequency. We can consider the first jhana as the lowest frequency jhana, and the highest frequency jhanas are the fourth jhana and arupas, which act as another filter on top of the fourth jhana. That's one way to look at the Buddha's approach to jhanas. He used other similes, such as shadows. One disappears for another to arise, but essentially that's what he said about jhanas. Let me contextualize this with a practical example we see today. These experiences occur because as our perception and mindfulness become sharper, allowing us to discern finer perceptions like colors and higher frequencies. It's akin to adjusting an old-fashioned radio tuner changing frequencies from magic FM to heart FM by turning the knob. Similarly, jhanas are like radio channels. If we can adjust our perceptions, we can access different jhana states. See Diga Nikaya 9, Potapada Sutta. So that's what the Buddha is saying. These are all there, different spectrums of experiences, once we've had enough of them and become disenchanted. It's like when kids play in a sandbox. They're very fond of it at first but then they get fed up and stop caring about it. It's the same with these jhanas. They're just feelings. We do some practice, that feeling arises, we tinker with that feeling and it ceases. 
These jhanas teach a valuable lesson. Our subtle identification with these experiences brings them about. Our identification makes these experiences grow. However, if we don't identify with these experiences, they will cease. This state of cessation, niroda, occurs any time we don't identify with any of those jhanas. Therefore, it doesn't matter if we are in the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, or fourth jhana. If we haven't identified with any of those jhanas, then deep insight into reality is right there. It's just next to each jhana. Flip the jhana to the other side and look at the empty and hollow nature of that jhana. Insight is right there. The keynote, though, is insight does not arise with just any mind, like those invaded by normal worldly sense perceptions. While we may not gain these insights initially, we have to keep letting go and leapfrog from the coarser happiness of lower jhanas to the higher ones. That's how we make progress with insight. Once we become experienced meditators, and if we experience them repeatedly, these insights will arise frequently. They will unravel the deceptive nature of jhanas as well. They are deceptive simply because they are conditioned. The only experience that is non-deceptive, not conditioned, and available to us all the time is the state of nibbana. Therefore, we don't need to worry about losing nibbana like other things in the universe. What if I lose Nibbana? Will I ever gain it back? All those concerns are just concepts and they will go away forever. That's one of the things I wanted to emphasize here. I'm trying to provide some perspective on Nibbana, although I'm not sure how helpful it will be to you. What I'm saying is, don't make a big deal out of Jhana. Jhanas, although important, are just experiences. If we're in the early stages, I suggest going through all the jhanas, experiencing them and playing with them to understand how they arise and cease. Observing their conditioned nature with an easy and relaxed attitude is essential. The real deep insight doesn't lie in the jhana experience itself. What we need to see is the dimension of how they arise and cease. That is insight into conditioned experiences. Don't get caught up in the bliss of jhana or how long we can stay in that bliss. If we approach it with the attitude of trying to maintain jhana for as long as possible, it will delay our progress toward the state of nibbana, the unconditioned. In normal daily life, we find it challenging to explain the happiness of jhana. However, each jhana has distinct characteristics that become clear through practice. Thus, understanding them may not be as difficult as understanding the state of nibbana. Speaking of the state of nibbana, whenever we have a good sitting, whether a long or short meditation session, it doesn't matter. If we approach our sitting with an easy attitude and a fresh open-minded perspective, simply sitting down and observing whatever happens without any sense of identification, we can make good progress in a short time. I mentioned that from any jhana, we can experience cessation. It feels like a very smooth and subtle experience. In the Udana, it actually refers to the state of Nibbana, described as ghee or butter melting on its own without leaving any residue. If we've ever burned a lamp made of pure, well-refined ghee or butter, it doesn't leave any artifacts or burnt carbon residue. It's just pure ghee burning, and nothing is left behind. So it's a very exquisite and fine state where the relief is unprecedented. It feels like butter melting, like ghee in a lamp, just disappearing, being beyond all sensations. This very fine, exquisite experience is what the state of Nibbana is described as in those examples. In the Udana, there is a sutta about a monk named Dabba Malaputta who was an arahant. When he was ready to pass away, he asked the Buddha, Bhante, I would like to pass on to the final passing away. With your permission, I would like to relinquish this experience. The Buddha simply said, Okay, do as you see fit. Using his great psychic abilities, the monk entered samadhi and levitated through space. He experienced a state where the four great elements of his body, even the ashes, disappeared. It's like when matter and antimatter collide. Nothing remains. Somehow, he manipulated the four great elements. They collided like matter and antimatter. It's possible that he generated antimatter and not even ashes remained from the fire. He extinguished without even needing his body to be cremated. That's the exquisite state described as a fire extinguishing without residue, like a lamp of pure ghee that leaves no fumes. The state of Nibbana is like that, just the most sublime fading away. I hope that describes the path sufficiently. 
I explained the states of jhanas, and the arupas are not much different. The arupas are what the Buddha considers a peaceful abiding. So while jhanas are pleasant abiding, characterized by the pleasure of the body, joy and happiness, the arupas, such as infinite space and infinite consciousness, lead to a deeper calm and peace of mind. The balance of the mind is profound in the state of arupas. One thing I find quite useful, especially in practicing the four Brahmaviharas, is after radiating metta to the six directions in the realm of infinite space. We radiate metta one direction at a time, then to all six directions simultaneously, letting whatever arises in our mind continue. For instance, after sharing and radiating the feeling of metta, we may suddenly feel a shift. A warm feeling transforms into a cool, calm sensation. This cool or calm type of metta changes naturally into compassion. Progressively, compassion also changes similarly. We radiate compassion, and without doing anything, it morphs into mudita, a feeling of sympathetic joy. We just continue radiating to all six directions and let whatever arises unfold naturally. We do not make them happen, they simply arise. The process of letting go occurred such that our perception picked up that spectrum, enabling us to feel that particular frequency or color spectrum, or whatever we might call it, because our mind became ready to perceive it. Sometimes, when we are in the realm of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness and so on, we require more tranquility and equanimity and less joy. Therefore, what will happen is that our mind will sense that even feelings of compassion, joy and equanimity tend to create tension in the mind, and we will feel that our mind is not at ease. Simply add a little tranquility when we are radiating compassion or experiencing mudita, joy, or equanimity. We need to soften them by adding a bit of tranquility. I believe tranquility is the best among the seven factors. The Buddha mentions this in the Metta Sahagata Sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya 4554, where we integrate these seven awakening factors with each of the Brahma Viharas. In my personal experience, I noticed that my mind was somewhat rigid, so I used tranquility with equanimity. I radiated equanimity to all six directions, and if I felt discomfort and tension in my mind, I combined equanimity with tranquility, which made it much easier. We can maintain our meditation object for much longer periods while radiating equanimity. If we feel that our meditation is not progressing smoothly, simply incorporate the factor of calmness, the factor of peacefulness, because these are states of mind where we should experience peace and calm. Just as a reference, I'm not sure how your mind works, but if you feel it tightening, adjust your equanimity or your experience of the Brahma Viharas by including one or more of the seven awakening factors. I think it's best to use tranquility or samadhi. It varies, but tranquility tends to yield much quicker and better results. All we need to discern is whether our mind is at ease. Once our mind reaches sublime ease, cessation can occur at any time. Therefore, I suggest progressing through the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, by practicing metta, karuna, and so on. Progress with them as we move forward. If at any stage we find our mind struggling or becoming agitated, simply introduce tranquility. Tranquility with the first jhana. Tranquility with the second jhana even with metta in the first, second, third, and fourth. When radiating metta, a touch of tranquility can smooth out any unease, making our path even smoother. This has been my experience, and I hope it will apply to you as well. This is all I have to say in terms of the path. And I've already mentioned that we shouldn't make a big deal out of any jhana. Just let them be, step back, allow them to be. This is how we make significant progress. We will know we've made progress when our ease and comfort become much more exquisite, making our practice more effortless. The acid test of our practice is that the more effortless it becomes, the more successful it is. Therefore, don't exert any effort. Our practice should flow effortlessly. We shouldn't exert any effort at all. Ideally, it should flow smoothly, like a pebble sinking and moving towards Nibbana. If we find ourselves exerting effort, it indicates that something is not quite right. So this means we need to step back, let go, and maintain some distance. Just add more of that calmness factor. These insights come from trial and error, from the story of my life. It's been all about these things. 
These experiences have taught me valuable lessons, and I'm just trying to capture them here. If you find them useful, keep them as tips in your basket. And I think that's how I would like to sum up. The state of Nibbana is ultimate emptiness. There is nothing there. We experience it by letting go of everything. So I would like to add a final thought. I briefly discussed the insatiable drive behind all our pursuits. We were not content with living in a small house. We sought a larger one. Simple foods like bread and sandwiches didn't satisfy us. We craved exquisite dinners at fancy hotels. Our usual seaside resorts no longer sufficed. We yearned for exotic destinations like the Maldives and the Caribbean. Riding buses and trains became insufficient. We aspired to charter planes or use private jets. These examples illustrate that our desires have no bounds. They become increasingly refined. The sharper our senses become, the more discerning we are about our desires and the more effort we expend on worldly pursuits. We can only attain such sensory experiences by exerting more effort, by earning more. This perpetual drive inevitably leads us to surpass the boundaries of our moral life. It becomes unavoidable that in our pursuit of luxuries to meet heightened needs, our quest becomes even more challenging. We resort to various tactics to fulfill all our desires. That's why I mentioned that desire resides in the mind. It's a fleeting craving that amplifies until we're driven to chase these dreams and do whatever it takes to satisfy our mind's urges. However, if our mind settles and we let go of that craving, suddenly all these desires, ambitions and luxuries lose their urgency. We no longer need these refined sensory experiences. We're content with whatever is offered or available to us. Therefore, achieving a balanced mind and maintaining relaxation and calmness toward the arising of phenomena renders all these pursuits meaningless. If we're content with any facilities available to us, whether we stay in a five-star hotel or a bed and breakfast, we have fulfilled our needs, and that's what matters. Whether we drink from a gold cup or a porcelain cup, it's all the same. We've quenched our thirst, and that's what counts. That's how we recognize a quenched state of mind. When the mind is satisfied, everything settles, and we find greater happiness in the present moment. When we ultimately experience Nibbana, we have severed all ties with the universe. Everything attainable in this universe becomes insignificant because we no longer require the universe. We have completely freed ourselves from it. Perhaps someday scientists will master fusion reactors for clean energy and cars will run solely on fusion power. Maybe then these achievements will drive human pursuits. What I'm saying is, if we see the freedom apart from the universe, we do not lament in letting go of it. When we have experienced and arrived at the state of the unconditioned, all these things simply do not matter. Whether there is a genius on Earth who can explore the entire galaxy, develop nuclear fusion reactors, or create quantum computers, why would we need quantum computers? What would we use them for? Our needs have vanished. In the state of Nibbana, all needs, ambitions, cravings, desires, and consciousness have completely disappeared. There is no need at all, and we are content all the time. There is no desire, no craving, no consciousness, and no formations. All these conditioned phenomena have subsided completely. That's how we know the experience personally. The Buddha said, there is the ultimate free lunch, and that free lunch is the state of Nibbana. It's a free lunch. We don't need to pay a single penny to experience it. There is no ticket to buy to enter the state of Nibbana. This is the ultimate free lunch available to us all the time. This opportunity comes once in a lifetime. If we can find and appreciate this opportunity, we should take it. Should we seize this opportunity or ignore it and pursue other opportunities that will never quench our thirst? This is the choice we have, and all I'm saying is that as human beings, we have arrived at this sublime path where we can experience this. All we need to do is follow the path, go straight, and let go of any attachments. Don't identify with anything at all, and Nibbana is right there in front of us. All we need to do is change our perspective, let things unfold, and Nibbana arises before us. So we shouldn't take life so seriously. When we realize this fact, the importance of life and clinging to life diminishes. I believe it's been a long discussion, and I would like to conclude the exploration here, leaving some for future. All I want to say is that for all beings in the universe who are suffering and unable to find a way out, may they find happiness.
May all humans and all beings ultimately find a way to let go of suffering and take delight in this Dhamma that the Buddha has expounded. Thank you very much and have a nice day. This is the end of the book Beyond the Edge of the Universe by Indu Shakya.